Oh, it's going to be a completely different film, Mahler. It'll be so much better. More violence and sex. How can it be longer? It's already Gosh. unnecessarily long, all of it. It'll be slower. Uh, oh, I, I believe it is. I believe it is going to be more Anthony Hopkins. I think that's yes. one of the things he said is going to be in the... I, I, well, one of the things that he decided is not going to be in the quote-unquote theatrical cut. I, I don't know why he would decide that, but yeah. Is it, well, uh, it's... it's... It's not because I, I hate myself. I, I actually delved into the official novelization when I was reviewing part one to see if there were any characters in there. <laughs> oh, that didn't make there's a the, novelization. Um, there is a novelization of Revenant. <laughs> oh, one, yeah. God, God. Um, and like, it's, it's really, really bad, obviously. But what? there are actually sort of are characters in it. And this was sort of the really funny thing. It's like, why did you, why did you apparently write this in conjunction with a person? And then you thought, well, I'm going to leave out all of the actual character stuff that this person's doing. And I'm just going to make Rebel Moon Part 1 the version we got. <laughs> um, like, you met, like, so in Part 1, there's that bit where it's like Space Twink Alpha, and he's just randomly a really nice guy, and he saves nice little farm wench. And, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't understand why you're doing this. Why are you nice and nobody else is? But in the book, like, the entire prologue is his backstory. And it turns out he's a child soldier and he had to kill his dad and he lost his own family. So he's trying to redeem himself by saving a girl. And it's like, that's basic character stuff. Why didn't that make it into your movie, Zach? At least then we'd have understood where roughly the guy was coming from. But that's, you could delete the character, the, you could delete Cora, the main character of the fucking movies, and just have him be the main character with that backstory and the plot could basically go the same way. Yes. Basically, yes. Wow. <laughs> Wow! Great, she's so great. There though. Is, there's a little bit more of Anthony Robotkins in it as well, but there's not like not a huge amount. He just pops up every now and then. But they they yeah. use bits of it in part two, um, but they don't use any of the actually what seems to be like the most interesting stuff. I only skimmed it because I don't hate myself that much. But well, you there can't is just stuff put in there. That on screen and like not expect me to laugh. The scar giver. <laughs> so embarrassing. It's Ugh. like this is the title screen of the film, and it's got the bad guy sitting in some goo, just like <laughs> laying there in the goo yeah. with Skargiver popping up on the screen. It's funny. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh. I wish I wouldn't. I just know. find it funny that the title cards are incompetent. That feels like something that you can't screw up, but he did. Well, rings of power. No. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, true. true. <clears throat> uh, I was going to say Mola's muted again. Oh no way! No. This happened, the... Mola. This happened the last time I was on. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you do Windows upgrades? Yes. Because they like to fuck around with OBS every time. Is and I'm that? sorry I did it. I always feel bad to do any fucking update of anything. Oh, ever. you gotta you gotta explain yourself here. <laughs> explain you gotta, yourself. You gotta re-explain your observations about that, the title that. card. There we go. Um, oh, right, The this is a beautiful title card. For one of the reasons you heard Fringy say, I forget what you said, I'm sorry, but the, 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 the this goes back to, what was that, like, meme video that was made in Gary's Mod of uh, the, it was like War of the Worlds, but with T-posing people who came in and killed everything? My memory of that is so faded at this point, but, Mel, do you know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, someone no. in chat will know what I'm talking about. It was, like, a really famous, funny fan film. Um, but I, I can't not think about that whenever I see T-posing, and that's what he's doing over <laughs> the title. It's fucking hilarious. And then, of course, the Christ imagery is what I was uh, mentioning that Zach likes to get up to. Weird to hand that over to Admiral Noble, but I realized saying Admiral Noble is like, what the fuck does that even mean, Moeller? And I'm like, I know. <laughs> none of you give a shit. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> none of you know. It's fine. Oh, and of course... Um, uh, Rags is not here. He is unable to make this episode. Huge shame, of course, because uh, he, you, why would you want to miss a movie like this? This is a legendary film, but that uh, I'm sure he will get it watched at some point. I wonder if he will, actually. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say to him, it's <laughs> optional. You do not need to see this film, but he might just want to, want to know what he missed out on. You know, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. In any case, yes. There you go. You are caught up. Welcome to... The sequel to the uh, much-loved episode of EFAB where we talked about 
Rebel Moon Part 1, The Child of why, Fire. Why are you not saying Rebel Moon? Why are you mispronouncing it? <sighs> I, I, I'm going to bounce between it all the time. It's fun. We, we like to call it Rebel Moon because it's... Rebel? <laughs> that <laughs> is kind of funny. Movie. I like it. It's What's wrong with it? Like it. I rebel. <laughs> Another good meme. And stuff, but yeah, it actually sounds closer to the German pronunciation. That's kind of funny. Uh, we return for the sequel that uh, I think a lot of people said like the second one will be better because the first one obviously was the introduction when we didn't yeah, get any cool. introductions. Famously, and introductions are necessarily worse than the conclusions. Yeah, famously, the first film failed to do a whole bunch of things in a very straightforward manner. It's like, I think they distracted enough people with just being a new world, new sci-fi world, and enough stuff that some people, like, still had hope. But this film has effectively dashed any single, uh, any hope at all that anyone had that we were in for something that could have some value in any way, shape, or form. You may think it's over-exaggerative or, or insane, chat, but this film, we've all agreed upon, it's, it's, it's worse than the first one. I don't know how he did it. Yes. I don't know how he did it. It's worse than the first one, and when the first one was very much in competition with Army of the Dead for the worst film that he's made, <laughs> um, this might be it. <laughs> this one might be it, yeah. I'd say the special factor for this one is the, the we've joked about it before, but I seriously would submit this film for a, re, like a really strong do not do this in university of film. You know, like this is our 101. Mm -hmm. We're going to watch this film, and you guys are going to point out everything that's wrong with it. Uh, it has got some of the most amateur mistakes for making movies that we've seen in a long time. You mean you shouldn't well, yeah, reserve a... all of your characterization for a single team building scene when it's just a bunch of flashbacks? Is that I... not what you're meant to do? That sequence might be like the worst, the single worst accomplishment of like his filmmaking career <laughs> is, is that sequence where they all have a trauma dump with slow motion flashbacks like all in a row. To the exposition to round table. Stories and their motivations. Just and it's the, all essentially the same story. Yeah, <laughs> it's all very similar. The, yes. the individual components of some of the stories, like I'll, I won't spoil anything, but wow, they're they're like <laughs> awful. Well, most crazy, and they're all awful in like the same way. If you watch the first one intently, like like you know, we we all paid much much attention to it because it was a very strong film. Then you'd be like, so is the second one really going to be like the equivalent of the Empire is going to come down on one tiny village? And you're like, yes. That is uh, <laughs> yeah. that is this film. They're going to do it in the most incompetent way possible. Yeah, there's so I many can't. things it's... that people will not know. Gonna, they're eventually going to decide that the reason why they did this in the first place. <laughs> nah, that's okay. We don't need the grade. Oh, the, the motivations be <laughs> switching oh constantly. It doesn't give a fuck. It's just like oh, whatever, so whatever matches stupid. the time. Stupid. Well, only no chat is stuck on uh, on stream. By the way. It is? Everything is falling apart. Wow, what have you guys done? Yeah, chat. Chat is crazy, chat. Chat is crazy. Chad, come right. on. We, we, we gotta not be frozen. We gotta, we gotta get moving, chat. <laughs> come on. Chad, it's it's moving, going chat. in slow-mo, chat. You just don't understand, okay? It's slow-mo. Super slow-mo. Yeah. Slow the best kind. Oh, yeah. uh, so right. how, how about that grain, though? How about that grain? God dang. I don't ever want to that must see be some, again. That must be some good grain. Oh, yeah. Like, hot yeah. grade grain. Yeah, but the grain is made better with slow motion. Like, it, it, it has <laughs> more nutrients because it was filmed in slow motion. Yes. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking with cutting back to slow motion, cutting down wheat over and over and over again. It just kept happening. It was like, why is, what am I watching? This is not real. <laughs> when they went there for the third time, I, I, I hit the pause when I was like, <laughs> is this real? Like, did I fall asleep and rewind? No, it just, know, it's just kept happening. Memeing? Like, if he was sitting in a, a theater with a bunch of people watching it, would he, like, fold his arms and, and grin as he looked at all of them watching all of these characters in slow motion cutting down wheat for the fifth time? <laughs> I just wonder, like, what his editor said to him. is Like, are you... Are you are you fucking with me right now? Do you actually want us to go <laughs> to go back and show them like you know gathering grain for like the fifth minute in a row? Like, like Zach, uh, I don't know how interested kind of people are going to be about, in this. I, th I think it's funny to think about just the uh, just editors for these big movies, and they just have to do the work. They watch it. It's like, man, this is fucking trash. What the fuck am I working on? <laughs> and they still have to they still have to release it. Well, yeah, I mean. 
ultimately they're getting paid, so they're just like, well, if it doesn't work out, oh, yeah. it doesn't work out. But it is kind of funny because you know, um, the guy who plays Noble, uh, who was in Deadpool one. I'm not sure. Ed Scrain. Yeah, he um, he really just he put everything into this. You know, he was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this part properly. Damn it. <laughs> This may be complete or, cringe, uh, but fuck it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's happening. He does this really strange thing with his mouth, and I noticed it in the first film. It's it's after he says the line, tell me when I can expect my harvest, and he does this really weird kind of half-open mouth gape where he's kind of sucking his cheeks in, and I've never seen that actor do that before, so he's obviously doing it like deliberately for this role, and I have no idea who told him to do that. I assume when he was... You know, preparing for this role, that he he was amused very much by the script and was like, I, I I'm a I'm an evil Nazi and I'm gonna I'm gonna play this like that. I guess here I go. And then and then did so here I go because uh, I I've oh. seen him in other stuff. I know what he could do. So <laughs> so watching him like be this character is just funny. Um, Walk around yeah. like he's on the catwalk with his duck lips. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, well, it's just sad that there's actual actors in this movie somehow. Oh yeah, there's a couple. Um, and mm -hmm. having having access to Anthony Hopkins is just in the fucking you know, the the recording booth. You can get him to say and do anything in there, mm -hmm. of course, with the limits. But it is just like, what did you have him do? You have him read what I think is very, very, very funny exposition. Which, by the way, that oh. could be where we start, I suppose. Um, oh yeah, he just starts the. <laughs> well, yeah, he just starts an exposition dump again. He it's, just it's all previously the odd. Movie. But um, yeah. it's previously on, but they also lie to us in the previously on, which I liked. Well, uh, uh, yes, I think I, I think I know what you mean when you say that. Yeah, I because uh, I, I was on FNT yesterday, and um, we were talking what? about Why? Rebel Moon, and um, you were, and I, I, I decided to read out, and I probably will do it here because it's just so funny. Um, anybody who who decided, you know what, I missed the first one, but I'm going to watch the second one with a friend of mine or whatever. I'm just going to get into it, and apparently they. They give you what you need at the beginning, so they catch you up and be like, oh, great. Um, he says, he, not in as many words, I've, I've shortened it a little bit, but like, you'll get the point I'm making pretty quickly with this. Uh, he says, circling the gas giant Mara was the peaceful moon of Velt until Admiral Noble demanded more than the people could give, so Guna and Korra searched for warriors like Tarak from Niwodi, Nemesis from the Mines of Dagus, and the col in the Colosseum of Pollux they reached the wayward General Titus, and on the planet Sharan, Darian Bloodaxe and his lieutenant Milius on the floating docks of Gondival, Korra <laughs> triumphed over Noble, and the threat was defeated. Or so they believed. Oh, um, this was so funny. Noble. <laughs> like, as you're listening to him say this, you wonder if he has any idea what he's being told to Yeah, read. he's like, I guess I'll read that. All these places what and names. Look at this really? nonsense. Yeah, it's literally funny. Like, you could, what you could the just, fuck are you, you saying? Could, <laughs> what? You could just interchange all these names and places and it would still not make any sense. It wouldn't change anything. There's that, um, the South Park episode where they have to take that copy of the Two Towers back and it turns out that it's a porno. And it's a point, <laughs> yeah. like, but the parents have like, a copy of the Lord of the Rings, but they're obviously just like spoofing fantasy style dialogue. So the intro to that is basically like in the far off mountains of Gangleblau, uh, the the Dark Lord <laughs> Finglefin is like it's, it's the same kind of thing, but they're taking the piss, and Zack Snyder is taking himself seriously, which is quite tragic. They also can't decide how to pronounce different names because, um, Mauler, I don't know if you did it there deliberately, but Gunner's name. Or uh, Guna, Guna. <laughs> it, yeah, they 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 swap between the pronunciations depending on which actor is is reading it, um, and also the planet where they got Tarak, um, Charlie Hunnam in the first film pronounced it as Neuwadi, and um, Anthony Hopkins pronounces it as New Newwadi, I think it is. So evidently, he didn't have anyone there with him in the booth to tell him how to actually pronounce it. You know, for a fucking oh, fact, right. when Zach heard him pronounce it, he was like, "Is that yeah." No? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's, that's <fine. laughs> I thought it was a different planet or something. The fact that we had the first movie and he decided it would be really interesting to have everyone come from like a different planet, but the when you have it all collect up and realize like, wow, you that is kind of summarizing the first movie to the point where you don't even need to see it. I was uh Yeah. The summary didn't even include the the mercenary man at all. And it's like, yeah, I guess it wouldn't need to, right? Because it's just whatever. He was there, now he's not. <laughs> like, what a waste. <laughs> Oh yeah, also, the act uh, is so good. Like, I like how the the summary says that that Cora helped because they were t trying to take the grain, even though she was about to just dip 
and the other yep. reason she stayed and started fighting is because of those super evil soldiers that, are, that were comically evil were about to diddle that one girl and she's like, ah, bastards, okay, time to assemble a team. Like, what? Okay. I guess. The first movie also, is a trip. There's no denying it. It's fucking wacky. We, we do also have to stress how, like, there is no world in which they come out of this and live. No. The, the, the oh, idea yeah. that you could... <laughs> I'm going to go, not. I'm going to find six random people that I wasn't even planning on finding, <laughs> and that will, will beat the entire mother world. So, no, no, you're going to not... You shouldn't really be able to beat one ship because it just bomb you from orbit, but, like, even if you beat one ship, they're coming back. There's a reason, in, you know, uh, Empire Strikes Back picks up and the Rebels have already run away from Yavin. You don't piss off an Empire and stay in your farm. You do have to, you know, run away for a bit, but apparently they think this is fine because it's time to do a Seven Samurai thing. Um, so this is this is absolutely how interstellar organizations work. Well, in it's, retrospect, if anything, it's as well though in the uh, exposition dump is that Anthony Hopkins like recaps the last film as though it was apparent that the good guys had like won completely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, like it, it's to set up this false belief that is destroyed in like I want to say three or four minutes. Of like, yeah, we won. No, you didn't. All right, <laughs> now oh, this okay. movie begins. It's really weird. It Guess is. I'll like, have to they, train all the villagers. Because, um, there's no reason. Like they provide exposition in this movie to explain why the uh, the bad guys won't be coming to Rebel Moon that was not present in the first film, where a, just a normal person would be like, oh well, they're coming to that planet. Yeah, they they're going back there. They're gonna mm -hmm. go with a big ship and a big army. Well, what they, they tried to explain it in part one. So part one, when it ends, they say no that they're they, the Imperium. Even though we've just portrayed them as being you know, evil, ruthless, cold-hearted, genocidal maniacs, they're also cowards. And so whenever they lose an admiral, they all run away. That's yeah. how we reset the position <laughs> in this one. Then then this one begins, and it turns out they don't do that after all. But well, yeah, some of them do, but also they don't do that. Like, no, no they, um, you know they might not though. I think it's like, even worse than that though, platoon, because they. So they, they kind of establish that when the Admiral dies, it is standard procedure, it's protocol for the ship to just turn around and go home, even if they're yeah. in the middle of a mission. Yep. And yeah. the justification that we get in the film, which turns out to be mistaken, but the justification that, that we get is that they're going back to Velt because they actually don't have enough food on the ship to get them back to the mother world. Oh, is that... Uh... That That's... was what I got from it. Well, that, is, that, is, that is pretty much I, I thought it was like he was on a personal vendetta to get the Scar Giver. That well, was his. They had, to restore, they had to restore honor to the Imperium, and he was, mm -hmm. uh, once they figured that out. But A, if any intel gave you that if you kill an admiral, they'll leave, people would just kill admirals. That's what we Number call two, an exploit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Number two is uh, let's not forget that there was a planet filled with squid people and uh, full of resources that they nuked. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> One of my That's favorite moments true, yeah. in the previous film. It was brilliant. Oh, yeah. Like, I didn't get the green thing at all from this. I thought, because like, the, the final scene of, of part one is him doing that weird sort of psychic mind meld thing with Belisarius somehow. And then and he commands him to go and pick up Cora. Uh, and if yeah. he can't do yeah. that, then he dies. So that's the reason they go back. I think their plan at the beginning of this was to go back, because like the admiral is clearly quite unwell, having just yeah. you know been shot and then fallen off a cliff. Um, <laughs> but they, apparently not. No, I did. I didn't get that they needed the grain. And of course, at the end of this movie, it turns out they don't need the grain either, which is just well, we'll get there. But that's that's a whole yeah. load of fuckery. But well, you're right because they could have just given up on the grain. But then they made the grain important again in the second film. They yeah. could so, I mean, which is your point. Yeah. Really, really, no, really they could have let again. the grain go. So that was probably your point. But like they they absolutely could have let that go at that point. But they decided to show the harvesting, the eighteen hundreds harvesting with sickles and thatching they're tying the wheat or whatever in slow motion. Uh and then they used it as a shield. It is they used um, it as a shield. It is funny because uh, the the there's so much like indecisiveness in the writing, being of course that we're we're shown very good reason. You see, the admiral is not dead. That's why they haven't left. But according to Titus, he's just like, yeah, they might they might just stay anyway. So <laughs> yeah, he's like, like, okay, okay. <laughs> well, says, like, oh, they're meant to leave when an admiral dies. He says, well, you know, maybe not though. Maybe they really yeah. want that grade. <laughs> that's, that's just it. It's like, that was oh, that. That was pretty much why of. I. That was pretty much why I had that read of the scene is because the the good guys don't know that Noble is still alive and they don't know that he's looking for Cora because uh, they don't know that he was basically asked by Belisarius like you got to get Cora and bring her back to me. So um, Titus concludes basically that the reason why they're coming back in five days, which they get told by Private Aris, uh, is because oh they must really need that grain. So then they use the grain 
I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but like their whole plan relies on the the uh, King's Gaze not wanting to just blow up all the grain. Well, well yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a bit of a jump, but I think it's fair to address it quickly because of the fact that it's like, this is over because surely they'll just shoot them from orbit. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, yes. but no, because... <clears throat> Because great, it's <laughs> it's, it's uh... <laughs> that is true, by the way, and it's also that that is only true right up until the point when they decide it's not true again. And yeah. They yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's so dumb. There's one other thing as well that from part one that I figured might be worth bringing up here, which is like, yeah, they, they don't know that uh, Admiral Peaky Nazi, whatever the hell his name is, is still alive. <laughs> um, that's true. However, Cora does know because the line comes up in that that awful meeting scene in, in part one that she is the most wanted criminal in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Quite how nobody recognized her until that point, I don't know. But she is the most wanted criminal in the galaxy. So if she's really, really keen on protecting this farm planet, why is she going back there? Like, why would she not be like she should surely be aware that the only thing putting them in danger really is her? Well, not the grain. this is even more curious because she says the war's over. So is everyone here to just chill out now? <laughs> Like, we yes. did it, guys. And it's still, well, like, even if I she's correct, way. by the way, even if they've gone back to restock an admiral, it's like, surely they'll be, they'll be coming back? Like, restock. <laughs> it's, it's really weird. We'll go to like, the admiral you know, store, yeah. get another admiral. <laughs> there was such like, an absurd thing she actually, actually says. Like, oh, and we won't even have to fight because we won. So, no, you, you've... Uh, the, the, word, the best case scenario is that you've killed an Admiral and you've pissed them off and they're regrouping and they are coming back. That's your best case yep. scenario. That's yeah, you've bought you you yourselves a few days. Is you're coming back immediately. So I don't... Like, and she's supposed to have been a general in the Mother World Army who knows how they operate. Like, how the hell is she so naive? It is funny film? that she says it with such confidence and then when they challenge it, she yeah. immediately turns to Tyus like, wait, what? Isn't that how it works? <laughs> like, well, I guess I I don't understand why they wrote it like that. Like, why would you write it to where they believe for three or four minutes? Yeah, we yeah. won. And then it's like, no, you didn't. All right, now the movie begins. Why the fuck would you write it like that? Especially when we already know as the audience, like, no, he's alive. That's what you showed us in the first scene of your movie. Where you, well, oh, yeah, yeah no shock to us. Yeah. Well, and then also it's just like, this movie exists. The fact that it exists means that it's <laughs> not over, obviously. It is actually... Yeah. Why even pretend? I actually think that is worth, like, highlighting. It's so weird how this film treats Admiral Noble's return as something of a, of a like, dramatic moment with the last, the way the last movie ends. Do you think that was something that they did afterward? Like, that this movie was supposed to reveal he's alive, not the previous one? Maybe. Originally, and then they were like, oh shit, we should probably make a hook. He's still alive. Well, part, <laughs> part of the guys, is, we'll is, find out in the dark. I really cannot tell whether or not both of these were written at the same time or if they wrote the script for the first one and then they wrote the script for this one. Like, um, it, it feels like it has a lot of the problems of, like, you committed stuff to paper and then to film that later on you, you accidentally fucked up that's really weird to have done if you didn't write it all together at the same time. But it must have been written at the same time. Yeah, so I had a look and I found an interview, I, I can't remember what website it was on, with Zack Snyder, and apparently his original uh, script was one single three-hour approximately script, um, and yeah. he was told by Netflix um, that won't work because for yeah. some reason two-hour-long movies do better, um, and he was like, well, no, I can't, I can't, you know, trim an hour off this film because then we'll lose all the character. I'm not fucking joking, that's what he said. <laughs> lose all the um, that's pretty funny. So what? he he then kind of counter offered and said, "How about I extend it instead, and I give you two movies? Because currently we're we're talking what four hours of Rebel Moon, and it's going to become six hours of Rebel Moon once we get the extended version, and then it'll become eighteen hours once he gets his extended uh, double trilogy. No. <laughs> once I he gets his stop. Rebel Moon universe. Hey, Balisarius has not yet been defeated, and I wish to see how that story may or may not unfold. That will be over the course of four more films. Yeah, exciting. Oh, yes. Fuck off. Really exciting prospect. Oh, I'm sure know. Netflix is thrilled. Oh uh, yeah, something that's worth noting as well in that very first film is that, uh, like, uh, fucking Noble says, "Yeah, uh, the Scar Giver, the Scar Giver is on Velt." Like <laughs> he says that. And and like then we get that scene where um uh Cassius, the guy that's with him on the ship, calls uh the soldier guy, Aris, the, the young guy who stayed behind on like a machine that now correct do we see the machine that they used to call him in the first mm -hmm. film ever? It, do we? I don't think we I I don't think we see feels, it in the first film. Feels new film. to me. Feels new to me. Yeah, yeah it's, it feels like it's a, a reveal. Thing. Yeah. But yeah, like he Cassius calls this kid who has defected at this point to help the village. Uh, and then he says, all right, is everything going smoothly? 
uh, Eris is like, yeah. And then yeah, Cassius said, yeah, we'll, we'll be there in five days. Why did why did he tell him this? I don't know. I don't know how how they managed to keep this a secret this whole time. Because well, he's just random. He's just a private. He was the lowest ranking soldier in this team. Mm -hmm. It's worse than you think. Because the first thought is like, man, it'd be really awkward if Cassius like, hey, can I talk to Bob? I haven't seen Bob for a while. Can you put him on the phone? It's that's worse where, than that's, that. He's, that's he's where already been told. He's Which already he been told. So that he does. She's there. He does do what you just said, Friggy, but he doesn't do that until uh, Noble is like, yeah, you should probably find out like what's going on there. And he's like, I haven't seen. No, uh, the the <laughs> sergeant or whatever his name is, um, and uh, yeah, so he evidently didn't have the idea no, it, to do that. Worse, and he didn't. No. It's yeah. worse no. than that. He was told in the first scene of the film by Noble that Cora was on Velt. He no, like unless he believes that Noble is lying or mistaken. Why the fuck would he call and give them information about when they're going to get there? When at this point he already knows that the most wanted fugitive in the galaxy That's is true, there. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. true. I missed that. That's insane. <laughs> Holy like, shit. This is essential guys... information that the protagonist used to prepare for a battle that if they had just sat on their asses for the next four days, they would have absolutely, definitively, categorically lost. Yeah. Is, is the movie not already, like, destroyed? <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. Everybody's supposed to be retarded in the show. That's uh, probably the explanation. Uh, mm, I mean, the, the only the defense... Rebel Moon makes you retarded. <laughs> the, yes. only, the only partial defense I can think of is that, like... Because my, my kind of criticism of that scene initially, because I missed what Fringy just said, was that Noble can't know that Cora is on Velt. It's a pretty good guess, but he can't know that. No, but he says it. That's yeah, yeah, he says, he says it. it. <laughs> exactly, he says it. So, so he makes an he makes a guess. Turns out to be correct, and then Cassius decides to phone ahead and warn them. That's what I like the idea yeah. that you say he can't know that, and Zack Snyder would be like, "Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> in the director's cut, you'll find out." With yeah, a different line. the answer's all in there. With blood mm -hmm. and more slow mo. Well, I was going to say, mercifully, we are uh, we've talked about the first like five minutes of film. Not a lot of slow mo yet, so that's nice. You know, yeah, oh, but it's, it's about to come. It's mainly people talking, forth. but he didn't. He, he managed to stop himself from slow mowing that, so not bad. Yeah. Oh, the the part that you've got on screen right now, I find so funny because it's just like showcasing the brilliant dialogue where like the the six guys get taken to the town hall. And it's like, oh, where is everybody? And then one of the guys is like, oh yeah, they're, they're ashamed to ask for help. And then uh, Milius, the cringe rebel lady, the one who screamed in the last movie, is like. You know, it's not it's not cringe to ask for help. And that's the that's the <laughs> conversation. That's about yeah. it. Like there's no subtext, there's no everybody says exactly connected. what they mean. Yeah, it's such a um, Yeah, because the quote is uh, to swallow your pride and ask for help, that is bravery in itself. And it's just like, shut the fuck up. What, who even <laughs> asked you? Nobody. That's who <laughs> it's a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> also the um the villagers, the two guys that are there, uh, they suggest that the villagers are embarrassed because they were like unable to protect their, themselves and they had to get these mercenaries in to help them, which I just think is so ridiculous because like yeah. that's like you know I would not be embarrassed if I couldn't beat Conor McGregor in a cage fight. <laughs> yeah, like I I you know if I had to ask someone to help me, that's not embarrassing. There's there's no way I'm going to win unless I ask someone for help. So it's it's just funny that like. He, he writes this down and it's like the characters immediately explain the motivations for why they didn't show up and why they shouldn't be upset that they showed up. It's like, the, you, there's nothing here. You just explain what you've done, like in the yeah. plainest term possible. Uh -huh. I, and also, uh, you just reminded me, the, the introduction of those two guys was like really weird. It, one of them was just like, the old guy's like, I'm Hagel, this is dead. It's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> 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 Also, this is a, t a tiny question, but it really made me laugh. Um, they had no means of communicating with Cora, right? The villagers, they don't have radios. They're like, you know, technophobic peasants, basically. They're like Amish Norse peasants. Yeah. yeah. So how did they know that they were coming? Has that food just been there for like a week? Or they saw them on their horses, their space horses, and cooked it up real fast. Mm. Yeah. Maybe? Yes. There's I a slight timeline we... like, confusion there anyway, which is that so they, we sort of pick up when when we arrive back on Velt, we are continuing directly from the scene in, in part one where they're riding in. So they part one finishes, they're riding toward village, part two picks up, they are riding into village. Yeah. But when you're over on space battleship Yamato, whatever it's called, <laughs> and then loads of time seems to have passed in that situation because during this time they've been experimenting on um Admiral What's it? Uh, and they, he's been healed during this time. Except that they don't know if he has until he wakes up and starts strangling people. But like <laughs> more time seems to have passed on one side of space than it has on the other. 
Yeah, that's a good I point. mean, a defense of that potentially, I, I haven't really thought if this lines up, is that the um, the King's Gaze stayed where it was above the planet that where the end of film one happened. And we know that it takes five days to get from that planet to get back to Velt, which means that theoretically, given that like Cora and everyone else have taken five days to get back home, they all, all of the stuff going on with like the psychic force, Skype call and all the rest of it and healing Noble could have happened in those five days, maybe. Did you forget Which the name that... of the planet Gondaval? Like, what, what kind of Gondaval? That's are it. You? Jeez, <laughs> not a real. Can't believe we invited people I'm... who don't even know their Rebel Moon law. We're called uh, Mooners. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> Rebel <laughs> Mooners. <laughs> I'm mooning everyone on the street. Yeah, was it? Because uh, I was just wondering because it, it is in this moment. It's like the 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 people of the village are too embarrassed to see the, the heroes that will defend them because they feel bad that they had to ask for help when they were against, like, <laughs> a fleet of space marine people. It, it, is, it is pretty awkward. It's like, yeah, they, they were so bashful that they couldn't even face you after asking for help, but in five days, they're going to be ready to face down a massive fucking army at their oh, doorstep yeah. with mm -hmm. tanks so and stupid. spaceships. Also, like, it's, it's a really tiny thing, but I, I distinctly remember the problem they had in part one with giving over the grain is that if they gave over the grain, they would starve because they don't have enough to eat. And yet they put a lot, they, they put a lot of feasts on for people who will starve imminently. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I, I, I thought you were going to point, I thought you were going to take it in a, a different direction because, uh, like, I thought you were going to talk about how they managed to get the grain in, like, three days when they said that it would take longer than that. Oh, yeah. Half they a say cycle. Half, they say half a cycle. I don't know what the fuck that means. I don't know what half a cycle probably, is. I would guess a month. a month. A month? But yeah, like, half a month. They yeah. probably, at, Wait. At, at, like, I it was. It, they said half a cycle around the planet that it orbits, which would I would read yeah, that as six are, months, they, right? Well, they're a moon though, and the moon orbits. Uh, yeah, oh, of course. Like, it's, yeah, we yeah, have it's, no point of reference. We don't know. Yeah, it's a different moon. Yeah, but basically, to to clarify, so Titus gives a big old speech. He assembles the villagers now that they know that they have to get ready to fight. And he, he asks the old guy, Hagen, how long does it take to bring in the crop? And he says, like, half a cycle around Mara, which, yeah, I don't know how long that is, but then he's like, no, you have to do it in three days. And they're all shocked. And it's like, ah, oh, fuck, here we go again, where a character <laughs> says it will take this long, and then they arbitrarily say, nah, you gotta do it faster. It's like, do you think he's lying? Did he made up the number? Yeah. Why well, do you think there's a reason there's a, a, a physics nerd or anything like that, but there's, like, because we don't know exactly how long it takes for that moon to orbit that planet half a cycle could be six hours and titus doesn't know that either so like half a cycle and three days are not really comparable metrics because we don't know how long the cycle is that's like that's not the biggest example of this i think the, the general problem well one of the many general problems with this is that nobody knows how any of the space stuff works yeah. they don't know how long it takes to travel between places for like part one they can apparently portal through space using giant vaginas and then this <laughs> one they don't do that this one they sort of crawl through space at a, a snail's pace um, but they, they haven't really bothered to figure out their space mechanics, I don't think. No, you have no idea. It, there's no mental map of this world. And then when they show that they have three days to, to harvest the grain, everybody's all happy about it. They're all, oh, yeah, like, we're, hey. It's not it's rushing or anything. Build. It's all, well, eh, yeah, team that, building. That is building exercise. <laughs> this, is, this applies to first fill, as it applies now. It's like, why don't you spend the five days Getting out of here. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, just fucking yeah. leave. Just leave. Instead, the plan hey, is... Hey, Mahler, get the, get... Hmm? that village of thatched roofs is so important to them. They couldn't, like, rebuild that in two months somewhere well, it sounded like on, the on another planet. The villagers didn't even or... want to stay. Yeah. They was, they, they're like, let's get out of here. They're like, we're good. We yeah, can let's... leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know how to build these buildings other places. We can do it. Don't worry. Yep. But, there is a town, also, I mean... a, a single horse ride away, there is a town with massive walls. Because that's where it's like the knockoff version of Bree, which they go to in part yeah. one. Oh, yeah, um, that also exists. Over there, already got pla it's already got defenses. At least it's got walls, which you think wouldn't work because you can just orbitally bombard. But take the grain there, because the grain is the the big sort of safety mechanism you have. Well, yeah, that's yeah. that's the the nature of the plan. Is they're gonna spend three out of the four days that they have to prepare getting the grain and then stacking it in the village so that they won't get orbitally bombed when like at this point, why would you? I don't know, like. Because, I mean, it, it, you have to, like, get past, first of all, the premise that a massive galaxy-spanning empire would be really desperate for the grain output of a village of, like, 300 people, which is insane and ridiculous. That would to, feed like, about a tenth of their ship I, I for yeah, 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 maybe a yeah. week. A couple weeks, maybe. My favorite yeah. Snyder it's, fan it's, counter to that notion is that, oh, so you think enormous spacefaring fleets have no logistical issues for supplies? 
That's so that's a that's a great thing called response. rations. <laughs> There's a thing called rations that they no, usually that, kind no, of carry that's around. Really with. That's a really good response. Did you know that they might need it? Oh well, when you put it like that, yeah, I guess they might need you it. You don't don't expect, expect, sorry, <laughs> you something you don't expect to have to explain. You're like, do you guys understand if they did get every last piece, let's say ten times the grain that's even available in this place, just not much, not much at all. It ain't really? much. <laughs> it's, it's a small, it's a small rural, drop of the bucket, like village of five hundred people. They don't even have like big industrial equipment to mass produce grain. They barely have enough to feed themselves, and they're like a village of 300 people. That's what they said last time. You know, that, they, that whatever they were being told that they would need to give to these guys, it meant that they wouldn't have enough to eat, and it's like, well, shit, yeah, how long is that going to last you? And you're going to commit an entire battleship and, like, thousands of soldiers to getting, like, what, a week's worth of food? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. According to the um, official wiki for Rebel Moon, um... The crew of the um, of the Dreadnought is about five thousand people, <laughs> which means that yeah, they're they're literally trying to feed five thousand people. Which maybe they picked five thousand because of the, because of the religious symbolism, the whole feeding the five thousand with two loaves of bread. Maybe there's something in there, oh. but it doesn't. <laughs> you know, we got more like random religious symbolism thrown in, but it's just it, doesn't, funny. it doesn't work. The afternoon in which they come down and speak to them in the first film all the materials already gone like any they could get from there like the, the the amount of people who need to eat and would have gone through all of the bread that could have been made or whatever from from whatever they have in that village it's just it's just too funny like it could never <laughs> fucking work and and this this you know mother world whatever the fuck they would have planets probably entirely dedicated to creating food they could just I mean, they would have to it would be yeah. weird if they didn't that would just be strange. Why would you need to rely on the output of a tiny village and commit a massive battleship well, to get the output? You know what? Maybe board. if they wouldn't just nuke every planet they come across, they might have some That's more true, food. Yeah. Uh, they uh, kill more of their own soldiers than anyone else does I, in this I, film. I feel like we could jump on this because it's just so fucking funny. But the idea that they get their food from random tiny settlements on moons. Yeah. They also power their spaceships with coal. I was going to bring up the coal. I, I can't believe I, I, yeah. so I thought I was dreaming when I saw that. <laughs> See, I was already like phased out when I got this part. I was just sitting here watching like, okay, why does this thing I... have a face? Well, there's the, the, the <laughs> two big distractions, oh. right? And so I couldn't decide which of them was, was more fucked up than the other. The fact that the spaceship is apparently piloted by a giant head or the fact that it runs on actual coal. Coal. <laughs> no, yeah. of these things yeah. is ever explained. I think, uh, I think I was more distracted when they were in the the coal engine room, by the fact that Cora was killing non-combatants, that was the really yeah, that well, was the thing that was more just hey, just so we're killing clear, medics is epic and cool. Okay? Just so we're clear with <laughs> chat, right? She enters the like core engine of the giant interstellar spaceship, and it's not entirely dissimilar from like the the bowels of the Titanic. It is fucking hilarious. Yeah, it's a coal engine room with some guys shoveling coal into some. They are shoveling furnaces. coal into <laughs> furnaces. And then Corey like... comes down and starts shooting them and kicking them into the engines. <laughs> like... <laughs> I just what I want now is the on the it's when they're like which way to a uh, velt or whatever some guy just like goes out on the <laughs> and just uses a telescope and just like <laughs> just, <laughs> well, oh sure. yeah now you've reminded me of the fact that they aim their massive gun on the ship with a fucking wheel that yes. they spin oh, around my God it's, it's so like slow. Slow. Zach and thinks he's so clever get there and some, some guy says we've got a lock on the village it's a village it's not fucking moving you don't need to lock onto the <laughs> lock on the village. <laughs> Oh, man. It won't get away this time. <laughs> it's um, it was incredible to have spent so much time prepping the grain, right? When from my POV as an audience member, I was just like, you don't need to prep the grain. You could just you could just pretend you have grain if it the grain. You know what I mean? It's like you just have bags. Just fill the bags with anything: dirt, soil, uh, sand. It doesn't matter. Um, but they spent all the time doing it, and then their systems up above seem to be so sophisticated that they can, like, analyze the, uh, down to the grain of what those things are in those bags, what everything is in the buildings, right. all the people, um, and so then you get the, 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 the glorious light of, like, they've, uh, they've put grain around all of their buildings. Very clever. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> very, very clever. It's, it is very funny clever. that they have, like, all of this high-end tech, yet so much of their shit is also analog for no reason whatsoever. For no reason at all. <laughs> it's so weird. Such a weird mixture. Just have to it's imagine how many little gears and pulley systems you need to move this stupid big gun with this really small wheel they have on the bridge. 
with a wheel. Like, the yeah. fuck? Why isn't it a and computer? It doesn't even, it's not even hard to do. He just goes like, do, 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 do. Yeah, he just it just takes it, very long for the thing to turn. He's like, do, 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 do. <laughs> Um, you figure that it, it's 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 really 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 good world building all right mm -hmm. okay. what an interesting universe he's created here i feel like we kind of slightly glossed over something that platoon mentioned is that there's a giant head in the well yes, in the engine room there. we should roll back yeah, so earlier. Uh, we're too far ahead okay we haven't even gotten to slow motion. Okay. yeah because no. you uh, skipped over a really 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 good conversation between Cora and gunner where they, where they're like Oh uh, yeah, you know, I'm afraid of death. That's, you know, that's pretty normal. You know what I was more afraid of? Losing you. And then they have sex. Yeah. <laughs> I um... forgot there was like a romance I mean, there. whatever like, works. What, what's happening? Romance, so, okay. yes. I was very invested in these two. Um, oh yeah, so much chemistry. Mr. No, Guna. These two are uh... fucking insane. Yeah? Especially <laughs> Cora. Like, like, they have sex, and then she's like, uh, actually, I shot a little child to death. <laughs> And then his oh, reaction yeah, is like, okay, give me another kiss. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> why, did you, why did you tell me about the child murder after we had sex? It's like, well... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, you that's maybe that's something I would want to know if, you know, before doing the deed. It's just insane. She just goes, oh, oh. Which is also, man, this is all coming, flooding back in. So, she isn't against the... Empire, whatever they're called, Imperials, because she doesn't really believe in the beliefs anymore. It's because she got, uh, she got like a, a double cross. Is what the word I was looking for. She's double crossed by the guy. Oh yeah, she she's a piece of like shit. She's an absolute piece of shit. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's it was never, piece of shit. It, it, it is never it's explained. Like, um... It's never explained for, in any case. It's like, oh yeah, they they double crossed me, and then I saw how bad everything actually was. Blah blah. It's just, it's just like, no, he he just put the blame on me, and then I killed all the soldiers and ran away. And the only reason because I I still I'm still alive is because the fucking little princess said I forgive you before I shot her. <laughs> and, then, and then inexplicably nobody shot me as I turned my back and ran away. Yeah. I was trying to condense like Corey's entire backstory down. I mean, her story is insane. It, make, it makes no sense. Like, so yeah. like, Belisarius kills her entire planet and all of her family when she's a kid. And she tries to shoot him and only fails because the gun doesn't work. And so mm. because he's murdered her entire family, she becomes his loyal daughter who then goes and loyally fights for the Empire and becomes a true believer in the Empire that murdered her own family. And then mm -hmm. Belisarius says, hey, how about you murder the innocent princess? And she's like, fuck yeah. yeah and then she does it. Jam. And, and then he says, oh my goodness, you killed the princess. You are, you are a traitor. Like, I'm going to double cross you. I'm going to blame you for it. Now you're the assassin. And then in an assassination scene, incidentally, where they have an actual orchestra playing all the way through. <laughs> yeah, we, we so the scene is so funny because as soon as the, the, the guy is like, murderer, all the other ones like, yeah, murderer, because they, it seems like they're all in it. So you they know, have no, like, like, they have no CSI investigation. They're like, how did she stab uh, the king and the queen multiple times with different knives and then get up and shoot the princess. <laughs> like, <laughs> what a gnarly suicide. I've never seen yeah. that before. Well, also, like, given the way that that given the way that that scene plays out, the only reason why she is able to escape is because she is the only person in the room with a gun. And given the well, Balasar yeah. has planned the entire thing, he he. Uh, I, I my read of that. I don't know if I'm being too generous to Zack Snyder here. You is are. that his whole plan? Oh yeah, I probably am. <laughs> um, his whole plan from the get go, from when he basically took Cora in and had her like trained up to, um, and and then like had her be assigned as the princess's bodyguard. Her his whole plan was for her to take the fall when he eventually decides. Okay, it's time to yeah. you know kill the eliminate the royal family, which means that Balisarius planned the whole thing planned to betray Cora and use her as a scapegoat, but didn't account for the fact that she was going to have a gun in that room and he wasn't. When, <laughs> when that was like part of the plan, oh, and, like almost. That was part mean, of the plan, it's yes. It's worth noting as well that she actually, when she escapes, that's not her gun. She grabs another gun. So she gets access to two guns in the scene <laughs> that enable her. <laughs> well, and, 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 I, like both of these unaccounted for. What Rad has just uh, highlighted too, it really needs to not go understated. Her whole history was being like personally you know, founded and brought up by Balisarius just for the the goal of she'll be the one to shoot the doors. Like, he could have had anyone do that in that scene. Mm -hmm. Yes. Makes no difference. Like, why did you do this? I feel like, like what was the point? One, like, 
They could have stabbed her. They didn't need to use a gun. Cora didn't need to be there. I feel like you have to actually walk through the scene in slow motion, like the scene. <laughs> oh no! To emphasize just how funny it is. Like they get on this ship and then they walk down a hallway and go into a room where some people, like, there's a string quartet where they all have like black burlap sacks on their heads and they're playing the score this... music. And like, then a bunch of guys in the room are wearing fucking togas and they pull out <laughs> daggers to assassinate. They're all wearing them. black. They're all wearing black, and and Cora's looking sad. And then the king finally goes. Is something going on here? Oh, dude. <laughs> so, I don't know. Did the black bags over the musicians' heads <laughs> give it away? And like later on, when they execute uh, Titus's crew, they put the b black bags on. So that must be some sort of thing that they do uh, that they already knew about. So get the assassination bad. orchestra. We need them. Yeah, they're with the sax and everything. <laughs> yes, Burgers, and they pull out daggers. They could have like, used a better rhythm session. He uh, realizes session. something is amiss, and then he says, like, he's asking Balisarius questions, and he won't answer them, and he goes, answer me, man! <laughs> you know what that reminded me of? Um, Robin Hood Men in Tights, because it's Carrie Elwes, the same actor, yeah, yeah. and I can speak with an English accent. <laughs> His deliveries in movies is very funny sometimes, and this was no exception. But, yes, we must talk about the bag people. Um, this... You're playing the score music. This is directly ripped seat. from uh, uh, Red Wedding for sure, and yes. simultaneously combined for some reason with the death of Julius Caesar. <laughs> I don't exactly know <laughs> what Zack is up to, but um, he misunderstood entirely. And it's so funny to watch someone be like, yeah, Game of Thrones is really awesome, I'm going to do my own version, and then it's this. Uh, these guys play music, and, and I, I don't know, you need to hear it yourselves, honestly, but I can't show you it like that. They change the way they play the music based on the tone of the scene. Action. They raise yeah. the tempo. They are the yeah. soundtrack. They are the OST. So it's, yeah, it, it's so funny. really like the cringe. <laughs> they will like so... <laughs> alter it based on the emotional moment that is at hand. The, the four of them together in sync, depending on what people are doing. It is the funniest thing ever. I love it, kind of. It's it, this would be in um, like a parody movie, absolutely. Like if you yes. were parodying uh, the Red Wedding, this is what you would do one to one. You wouldn't need to change a thing. <laughs> um, so uh, another point that um, I think that they just didn't explain, which maybe will be in the extended cut, is why did Balisarius do this? Because his the explanation that Cora gives is that the king was becoming too like peaceful, and the implication yeah, there is that Balisarius wanted to like continue you know, raping and pillaging and colonizing and expanding and all the rest of it. Um, but we have no idea what the state of the Imperium actually is because this, these films do not build worlds. It, it's all just implied beneath the surface. There's um, a slight little bit of it. So the, the, the ceremony they're at is for the commemoration, it's the commemoration service for the last of the big dreadnoughts that they plan to build. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so the, the implication is supposed to be that, you know, they've got this huge military industrial complex, but the king has been inspired by... The, the compassion of his own daughter to say, hey, maybe oh. burning, raping, and pillaging other planets is not such a good thing, so I'm going to go against the military-industrial complex. And Belisarius, being a general, doesn't like that idea, so he, he wants to carry on burning, raping, and pillaging, and so he commits the assassination. Except that like, this is a relatively recent decision on the part of the king, because all the flashbacks in part one have him saying really cringe things like, my daughter will restore a compassion that I feel I have lost because this is just how we do dialogue in Rebel Moon. Um, so, like, he's only recently decided to do the whole I'm climbing down for militarism thing, and yet Belisarius seems to have been planning the assassination on these grounds for a long time. So I don't think the timeline quite adds up, but that's what they're vaguely going for. Mm -hmm. well, I maybe, think you're probably right, yeah. Maybe it's explained in the, uh, in the next one, or the extended one. You've got you to consider these things. There's a lot of extra context to come. Um, you have to mm -hmm. show the cringe screaming. Um, you have to show all the cringe screaming on screen. To do it. <laughs> there's there's loads. There's so much to get through. My my favorite. I mentioned this on FNT, but Carrie Elwes is doing a no no no. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the this is the great history of uh, of our main character that they were baiting throughout. The first movie, it's uh, it's this As super awkward bad though. scene. So does it does that mean the 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 guy who did the assassination is now the king? Bellis he's the regent. Yes, Belisarius well, yeah, or whatever he's his name was. He's all in charge now. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I think they showed him in the first one in like a big white room or something. I don't know. Yeah. I, I didn't rewatch it. Yeah, it was the end of part one. Is when they have the mind meld thing with um. Oh Yad yeah. Bob. And then so he, he sort of teleports his consciousness to half basically. Right. And right. Then they yeah. have a, a conversation there. But that, so this is the, so he's declared himself regent, and like uh, I mean, there's so much we'd have to go back over part one to sort of fully break it all apart. But like none of the actual world building in this makes any sense in in any way because like one of the premises of, of part one is that the royal family has ruled in effectively this uninterrupted bliss for a thousand generations, and yet at the same time it's got this incredibly brutal cutthroat political class which is prepared to assassinate people. So you, you can't really have both of these things at the same time. If people like Belisarius exist, and you you do not have a thousand generations of uninterrupted rule, um, no. that that just isn't how any of this works. <clears throat> Well, I mean, it. Uh, th what they're missing there is we would need to know that, uh, like, everything is going well in, like, on on the mother world. Like, they're they're living the high life at the expense of everyone else, um, and that by sort of turning from the war, like, uh, raping and pillaging and all the rest of it, um, it's actually it's harming the Imperium. But the pro like, may maybe like the, the parallel that I want to draw is between this and Warhammer Forty Thousand because there are so many similarities. Um, and in the case of Warhammer, there's there's a whole fuckload of like other factions that are constantly like ready to fuck over humanity, which is why the Imperium in Warhammer Forty Thousand has to remain a highly militaristic fac uh, faction, um, because if it decides to you know dial back and stop and become more peaceful, they're just going to die like immediately. But we don't even have any implication that there is any kind of other faction in the Rebel Moon setting that is anything close. Mm. To the power level that the Imperium has, so we don't know what them dialing back their military, militaristic tendencies, what the consequences for that are. Mm -hmm. We have no well, idea. Also, yeah, it, it seems also like no sense of change, right? Because th th this is one of the interesting things. Like, is that normally when you do this, you, you do want to have a contrast between the before times and the present day times. You, you want to have some sense of like a fall from grace on the part of the Empire, for example. If, however, as, as Rebel Moon Part One does, you establish that the the Mother World is already evil and militaristic and it, it rapes kills and pillages and it you know takes child soldiers and all the rest of this and this is under the royal family who we're supposed to lament when they die what's the <laughs> difference like what yeah. is actually worse about belisarius than under the king nothing it's just it's a really muddled way of doing it if you then try to say well okay it's it's bad that we have a regent instead of a monarch but the mother world is basically the same oh but maybe there was something about us not being evil maybe that was the motive for him being evil that it, it just there's no sense of like actual difference and so you have no sense of world story that's actually unfolding yeah it's just really weird because <clears throat> it seems we have the imperial imperials just going around killing everything because they want to want, want to expand then at some point this weird rebel faction with their face markings and stuff are just going around and they somehow build a fleet i don't even know do they have like a home city somewhere well, they got base they got supplies station? from that Super planet that had all the resources they do, on yeah. it before it got yep. nuked. <laughs> so, this, so right uh, now it's right there just seems like the, the, the these guys were at some like okay time to pillage everything around us and then we go it's like oh look at this little village look at this thing nuked oh damn we're out of food get to this moon and get some grain does this happen like, because they they don't know they're not going to go in this way because they're going like everywhere in the universe currently. So there's like multiple dreadnoughts like this just going around nuking places left and right. It's just it's, like there must be a bigger faction somewhere where like, oh, they're just coming for us. Uh, is, maybe we should fight back. Not just the rebels that somehow get things from random planets. Well, also they establish, and I don't know why they would establish this because it just limits what they can do with the world building. But I guess Zach didn't notice. Um when uh, what you see in film one, when you have all the rebels sort of arrive and you, you have the scene where where Korra basically tries to recruit them, that is the entirety of the rebel fleet. There's mm -hmm. about 20 ships. May, may, it might be less than 20. It might be like 15, 16 ships. And we are told explicitly that that is the entire rebel fleet. That is not a threat to the Imperium. No. Liar. <laughs> if, they, if they blow up their grain, then it'll kill the, the empire. Actually, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> if we starve ourselves, then they can't recruit our children, our, our children as soldiers. Then. If we just tape all the grain to our spaceships, they can't do anything against us. <laughs> See, uh, <yeah. laughs> See that, that, that's the kind of shit yeah. that would be in the parody version, because this is yeah. already so stupid. Yes. They have to go stupid. <laughs> yes.
Uh, just run into battle and tape tape the grain to your chest. <laughs> yeah, no, don't shoot. He's got grain. <laughs> or if they like toss grain to them that has C4 in it, so they're like, grab the grain, we need it. Oh god, it's a fox. Hey booby trap the grain. How could they? <laughs> oh one weakness. Um when when he says seize her, by the way, there's a guy who's like throughout the whole sequence trying to wrestle her gun off her one hand and he can't do it. It's just so funny I mean, to she's, me. He's very strong. Puts okay. her arm out and then shoots like six people, all the guys with guns, because nobody else has guns. And then she and just all the people with knives. Oh god damn it! I just thought of another fucking problem with this. So, but if Balasaurus' so whole plan was to get Cora into the position where she can carry out this assassination and then he can like pin the blame on her, why did she have her trained like to this insane degree uh -huh. to where she can just solo like fifty guys on I her mean, own? I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if like in Rebel Moon Part 5 or something, it was a reveal like, you see, I let you escape. Oh, ho, ho, oh or something. Oh. Having you as a fugitive galvanize the war machine. Well, that's so, like, that's so that was could a plan. Make sense. There's no other way it can yeah. make sense. Because like, if, if that wasn't what they were going for, there's actually no reason to have her here to begin with. Okay, so, like, I'm looking at the scene. To assassinate someone. By the way, you don't hire a wedding band for an assassination because that's just <laughs> fucking <laughs> more than this is. Red it, wedding. Yeah, you could just kill her and expense. say, "Oh, it, she did it. She did it," and she doesn't have to actually physically it's, do it's, it. You could just blame her for it. It's really weird the nature of Cora as the protagonist of the story. It's like, all mm -hmm. right, so what is the nature of um? I guess the thing that galvanizes her it's like okay well so she did it she did the thing that she is like being hunted for by the uh by the mother world like she she did it um there was somebody who i guess you could would you would say is like ultimately responsible in terms of orchestrating it but it's not like she's innocent she she did it she did the crime yep. um and it's like okay so she did it and is now evading capture, and all of the people who are trying to capture her, it's its a very small number of people who know that she was, in, in a sense, partially framed, because it's partial. She did it. It's very um, partial. And it's like, okay, she so was on she, board. She was very on board yeah, like, to do it. I mean, she, yeah, I mean, she <laughs> hesitated a little bit, but she, she <clears throat> did it. Um, and it's like, uh, okay, so oh, you're now going to hide out in this village and endanger all of these people in the village to evade capture for a crime that you did. You it's did. It's really, uh, <laughs> really, really weird to write a protagonist Dude, in this way. When she gets shot, I'm watching the scene right now, when the little princess gets shot, she kind of looks down at her chest and goes, and sees all the little sparkly things come out and go, oh. and then she oh. fucking plops down. <laughs> By the way, there's two armed guys with rifles standing right behind the door, right behind her. Yep. At yeah, the but door. they're not in frame, so they don't exist. They can't draw an aim fast enough yeah. because she's, she's, she's a scar what, giver, bro. Okay, she's gonna kill them all before they can kill She gave him some scars. Did you see what the subtitles say when Cora shoots the princess? It it says divine resonance. Divine resonance. <laughs> I just have magic spilled oh. out of her when she killed it. <laughs> she like she bleeds magic. You're like, oh my god. Um, oh yeah, you, you should probably we should probably have mentioned that the princess is like space Jesus kind of thing. Yes. Like I think mm -hmm. she's, they're yeah, clearly trying to like imply that. that she's like the second coming of Christ. Um, how and why we don't oh, know. They, they but... explained that in the first movie. They said when there's when there's loads of war, it makes the peace person comes. That's how it works. Oh, so it's kind of oh, like the Matrix. And, and remember, good. this is all this is all for Rebel Moon. You'll get all the answers in Rebel Moon Part Four. <laughs> yes. There's something funny about. Oh no, we do have too much more. A peace person was born, and then they shoot her. <laughs> <laughs> was that fucking peace person killer? I'll find her. She glows in the night. I. <laughs> I will say as well, uh, I saw people arguing this on Twitter, so it, it could be true, because there is a line for it. Uh, he immediately talks about her ethnic impurities. So did he frame her? Yes. Because that's a more believable story of the Imperium or something. Like, see, well, she's not one okay. of us. That's that's why I did it. It's so funny because everyone in that room, I don't even know if the musicians were in on it. They all have to, like, clarify when he starts saying, like, what have you done? Some of them are like, Oh, is this? Are we? Is she? Oh, we're, we're framing her. She... Okay. Yeah. Right. What? Okay. <laughs> it looks like you kind of were all, all on board, but I guess it was her plan. Murderer. Ah! Yeah. We is don't like her not either. at all concerned that there were so many witnesses. All you need is one to say, like, nah, he did it. That's <laughs> that, like all you need is one person. Well, and really so much, it's it's such a stupid chaos. like assassination thing. There's so many better ways to have done this to the point where Balasaria shouldn't even be in the fucking room. Yeah. The, the, yeah. They're because no the way they. Because the way they set it up, it's like, oh, they're all in on it, and they all want to get rid of the, the, the royal family now. 
And then, because <laughs> the novel way to do this is probably, oh, we're going to maybe frame, frame you, or don't even need to frame you if you're all on board. It's like, oh, there was like an assassin, we got rid of him, and then uh, fed it to the space face that controls our ship or whatever. And then it's like, oh, okay, whatever. Or he's like, oh, we got to frame you, but you're oh. actually just going to live with me in my palace because they can't do shit because we're so cool. Like, there's so many better ways out for this. Including uh, not doing it in front of 70 people. <laughs> uh, right? Especially when you're framed, at, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead, but at the very least, uh, for attempted murder. you That's still bad. Yeah, yeah. And I went back and looked, uh, the guys with the rifles, when she was seized, they did not, like, pick up the rifles and put them to her head, which they just s stood there until it was time to get shot. Yeah. Well, when you say seize, just seize someone, you typically disarm them you don't just let them have their yes. gun you know? <laughs> Hold on to yes. their gun so that she can then shoot all of it because i mean if it was balisarius's plan to have her escape it's like what if the one guy's like you know what i don't mind living uh actually it's pretty swell and then he gets rid of the gun takes it. it's like oh well then i guess she would have been screwed i don't see how the plan could account for any of the guys with self-preservation instincts shooting her before she shot mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. so like there's no way around it it's it's just absurd well, it, it's really it really stop. really really stupid it doesn't stop there because like, when, when you you know she kills everyone in the room and then she leaves she opens the door and kills the people on the outside of the door you're like wow this is all yeah. very lucky but how does she get out of the yeah. ship and she basically just says like i left like, yep. but, yeah, but, 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 yeah, I fought my way to the ship and then I left. It's like, just, oh, but, 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 okay. but, 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 but you can't just. And it's funny because it's like, why didn't they just deactivate the ship, shoot the ship down? It's oh, like, no. because yeah. they can't. Yeah, here's the thing we learn in this movie they can remote well, control these ships. Yeah. Oh my God, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. They yep, can take control. Right. And uh, the funny thing is, Friggy is probably absolutely right. Zach will read some criticisms and be like, no, he wanted her to escape. <laughs> like it makes, yeah, 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 it makes sense. Plan. But Zach, why are they hunting for her all across the universe now? They Shut only up. wanted to look like they were. Oh, oh do, you, do you like how? I didn't expect the them to have grain. <laughs> because the writing is so good. Cora just openly states her motivations. She mm -hmm. just says, "You know, I thought the only way to honor the princess was to run away and create a life for myself beyond, like, you know, fighting." That's ba that she just declares her motivation. Yeah, like, she did that all the way through part one as well. Because it was like the unwritten rule of this is that whenever she and Guna have a conversation, it's just an excuse for a flashback. Yeah. So yep. like, and part one has the first one when she does like, "Oh, I was I was a child soldier. And I did this," and then she finishes the flashback and she says. That's why I'm telling you all this, so you know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the audience says, thank you. Oh, thanks. And again, the, the, the absolute non-reaction by Guna is just hilarious. He's like, oh, okay, you just told me you shot a child and lots of people, this... and you were actually, you're the reason we don't have peace right now. Uh, that's pretty hot. Let's kiss some more. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yep. Guna's not allowed to have like an actual reaction to what she says. No. He's just like, I am supportive boyfriend. You're great. I, I love am. you. Well, I think uh, it's it's weird. I th I think like Snyder would say, well, no, the f the film is judging her for for this decision. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's just providing yeah. her like a, a pathway <laughs> she can take. That's what you would probably say. <laughs> but Maybe. but why does the is why it does though? Space I'm not sure forgive her right before well, she gets shot. <laughs> Again, it's 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 a really bizarre way to write your protagonist to where it's not it's not that she was framed for something she didn't do. It was that she was given more account. She was she was like made more guilty than she already was. Mm -hmm. like, Wait, I mean, it's, it's really to weird. an extent. It's like you know, kill the princess according to my orders. Then she does it. And then you can be like, why the fuck did you kill the princess? You know, like because it's still like. I did order you to it, yeah. But like, why would you do something so horrible that I? Because there's there's actually examples of this. In all kinds of stories where a higher up will give an order hoping the person will like push back on it you know so it could have been a test <laughs> or something <laughs> but it's just funny cause she's just like yeah i did it wait i'm in trouble now it's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> you should be in trouble and, and then of course after she's left she's like you know what i probably should be in trouble but i mean well, it's, whatever isn't it weird that like the, the she realized that the you know the the empire was bad because she personally got slighted rather than for all of the horrible things yeah. that they had apparently been doing for a very, very, very long time. Well, and that's the thing. You can then have her say things about it. Like, she realized things more. To, but we don't have that scene. We don't have her talking about the ideological differences or what she's learned since nope. she's been away from them. She's just like, 
yeah, they hate me, so I guess I hate them. Fuck them. <laughs> but it's it's going to be almost impossible to do the ideological difference thing when her introduction is that they enter her planet, kill them for resisting, murder her family, and kidnap her. So th there's not a Wait, huge amount of ambiguity with that one. You're going to have to be more specific. When you say her, 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 the backstory is that they're in a nice place and it all gets destroyed by the Imperium and then mm. they get mad at the Imperium, which of the 17 characters' backstories are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's hard to tell sometimes. Them. At the same time, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll get a twist in Rebel Moon Seven that that is also Balasarius's um, Ooh, yeah. backstory. Maybe the the king's uh, like father, I guess, or grandfather, however the timeline would line up. Maybe he did that to Balasarius, and he made him into the monster that he is now. Oh, you just want to like you imagine the flashback when he does that. Yeah, <laughs> I just keep growing up on this peaceful little world. Yes, and the mother world turned up, and they murdered my family. And the and mean people me. show up. <laughs> I would like it if uh, if a random grunt soldier type, right? She like hits him in the face, and he's he's down. And then he says, "Wait, before you kill me, you have to know." But I was young on my home planet of Gargaleth. The Imperium invaded. <laughs> they killed my aunt and uncle who took kids. She's like, "Shut the fuck up!" And shoots him. <laughs> I hid, I hid in a refrigerator, <laughs> <laughs> and I came out of it six times in my flashback in slow motion. Just in case you forgot. Just in um, case you forgot. It's funny because there's Sorry, so many. Sorry, show. Yeah, there's so, there's so many big criticisms to have around moves. Sometimes I want to slip in some smaller ones. Like, uh, we started the days now, so they wake up and farmer man is like hitting a bell to wake everyone up. And the way Zach shoots this, like it's it's so bland. And then suddenly, like, super zoom into the bell, and then we're just looking around all these characters, and it's all, like, very flat and boring. But uh, some of this just randomly hits me is stuff like, oh, yes, Titus is one of the last people to wake up. It's like, I feel like he should be first. I feel like he should be awake already. Like, he's the one that feels Ooh. responsible for everybody. He's a leader and everything. Yeah. But he's he's awkwardly like, oh, I guess we got to get up. Yeah. You know, um, oh, even though I just did this big speech that we need to work, oh, I guess I have to get up. Uh, potential counterpoint to that is that uh, he is an alcoholic, which the film uh, makes clear in the first one. Um, it's so funny you say that because I was like, what, what, I don't remember that yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I say it makes clear. It's like the only thing that we see him do, but like, yeah, I, I don't really quite know how that works. But Does that um, get a payoff of this at all? Yeah, it does. He's so he, um, so basically what happens is that during the grain montage, and I'd forgive everyone here for just zoning out during that because it's a fucking grain montage, <laughs> um, we see that he um, looks into like a, a thing of water and he's looking at his um, his his like booze bottle that he carries on him. Uh, and the, the implication there is like, oh, okay, maybe he's considering, you know, drinking water instead of drinking alcohol. Um, and if they had left it at that, then it would be like, okay, he's taking this a little bit more seriously. He's going to stop drinking because he hadn't stopped drinking on that particular morning. Mm -hmm. um, but then what they do is in a later scene when they have the, the backstory round table, um, Cora says, basically just straight up explains it. It's like, hey, Titus, I noticed you're not drinking your alcohol no. anymore. It's water. And they, yeah, yeah it, it, that, no faith in the audience at all. Had, had <laughs> they just left it with that shot of him looking at the water and then looking at his alcohol um, Well, you, you, We see him fill it up. He spits out the, water, the alcohol yeah. and then fills it up with water. So... Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, e yeah. even then, like that's 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 more blatant than than how I remembered it. But even if you just leave it there, you don't then need to have a character address it. Well, I was also going to say um, to make fun of it of, almost. Part really of why weird. I wasn't like uh, aware almost of this is because I just don't I don't think they have his attitudes or his uh, approach to this whole movie reflected of it at all. Like there's there's those little pieces no. you're mentioning, but the broad like he's. If you take away like every action everyone does, he's he's the leader. He's the one that gets everyone together, understands what they're doing, orders everyone to do this, that, the other. It's like it feels weird to have him have that role if he's supposed to be dealing with alcoholism. Like well, it, it, you'd think there would be um, more to do with with that sort of thing. But then again, I am talking about a Zack Snyder character, so it's it's just like you know, yeah. Do we know how much time has passed? And did he get the DTs? You know, what's his detox like? What's yeah, the alcohol know. like? And this is a character who, on his introduction, is is told, "Hey, have you maybe considered revenge?" And then he <laughs> thinks, "Oh my God, no! I'd never thought of that one before. I've just been wallowing here in my alcoholism. I'd never thought revenge might be a good idea. Yes, I'll go and do that." Like, there's not going to be extensive character work for anyone no. in this movie. But like that scene, um, you would have thought maybe like that scene would be the evidence that um that Zach would need to convey to the audience that he is now putting his old ways behind him and he's no longer going to be an, be an alcoholic because then he also goes on to uh, you know partake in the fight 
at the end of the first film. And the way that ends is he gives his little rousing speech to, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's, you know, he's, he seems fully on board with fighting back um, and avenging his, his fallen soldiers, which is what his backstory is. Mm. But then in this film, they're like, no, he's still an alcoholic. And then he changes his mind during I mean. this film. Wouldn't you do the contrast of, like, he's okay-ish at getting everything together, but he's still kind of out of it, he's still making mistakes and stuff, and then another character's like, you gotta, you know, the people need you, you gotta, you gotta get rid of this shit and, like, toss the bottle, you know? That's sort of, the, like, what I'm talking about is 101 character stuff. Like, not, yeah, not anything like, special. <laughs> maybe he starts giving his plan, because he gives the villagers their plan to, you know, strap the grain to the sides of the buildings. Maybe he starts <laughs> that plan, and then he kind of, you know, he can't finish it because he's he's drunk too much that morning or whatever. Yeah. And then one of the other characters has to kind of sit him down and jump in and finish the plan. Because um, then you don't even have to make it explicit. You don't have to have the characters have a conversation and say, man, you've got to stop drinking or whatever, even though obviously Zack Snyder said they're going to do that. And then you can slowly have him sort of become more sure of himself and more confident and more driven to actually defend the villages. Well, it feels like it would be more effective, but why would we even try that? <laughs> There's no oh, point. One more <laughs> Um, Holy shit. Yeah, well, so was we are at the grade part. Um, it's so <laughs> fun. That, one of those first shots of uh, uh, Gouda, like, blowing on the grade. <laughs> it's just like, oh, look uh -huh. at that. Ooh. Ooh. Um, I guess when they were filming this, they must have thought, like, it'll, it'll look good. He knows what he's doing. He'll, it'll look good. <laughs> uh, it's basically been... a music video. It, that's pretty yes. much what it is. I would argue this is one yeah. of the most made fun of things that I've seen about this movie being talked about so far. Just the fact that there's this huge, it's and this is one yeah, of good. it's not even the only sequence, right? Of graining. No, this is the first it's like the three. Four, five. Yeah, well, this yeah, is there, the are, one there are three, and if you add them together <laughs> and remove the bits that they cut away from, there is five minutes of this film is grain. <laughs> <laughs> and that's there's ridiculous. no yeah there's no character stuff uh, well no that's a lie there's a couple of tiny character moments within it like the the bit that we just mentioned with uh titus you know drinking water instead but apart from that and one other you got five minutes of and then they got grain like that's yeah. it <laughs> yeah i think you got nemesis dark. looking at this little boy who's <clears throat> yeah nice to her so that's, like, that's oh, prepping okay. the big arc yeah of, you know, i so the boy. Right. I don't know if this is a hot take, and I don't know if you want to wait to have this discussion, but I think Nemesis is the best character in this film. Really? Um, I, I, I would can already so. imagine what your argument would be for that. Okay. Well, bear in mind what we're comparing her to here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the reason why... The, she's I, the I, least I, broken. That's probably what you're saying. Like, kind yeah. of, partly, <laughs> but like I th I, maybe it's because I'm just in shock, because in uh, Rebel Moon 1, I think she's probably the weakest character. She literally... After she um, joins with Cora, she has one single line of dialogue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you, you learn, because I, yeah, I, I basically went back in and I checked. She literally says, what will they do now, right at the end of the movie? And that's it. You learn nothing about her. And then in this, you've got two little character moments. You have an emotional payoff, which is more than you can say for basically any of the other characters. That's, that's the short version of my argument, but I might elaborate when we get there. I, I sort of agree up to a point, except that her characterization in this movie sort of contradicts her characterization in the previous one, which would be my criticism of that, which is, so like, I've actually got the script for part one up, the, the extended, the, the most extended line of dialogue she has after she kills the weird spider queen woman, <laughs> and she says, there's no honor in this, this could easily be any of you lying here in the gutter of some forgotten world in the name of revenge. Revenge is bad. Um, later <laughs> in the film, of course, re revenge is good. And in mm -hmm. this movie, she says, I've become revenge which is sort of, again, not exactly in keeping with her bare bones characterization in the previous one. Um, the, the, there is a bit of a payoff in the sense that her shtick is that she lost her kids, I suppose, to the, the mother world that was introduced oh, in part one. So simple they as spawn a random magical child in this one in order for her to sort of pay that off. I don't know that that's any stronger necessarily than Cora's with the generic boyfriend guy, Guna, because her shtick is that she was told to fall in love and then her boyfriend died on the battlefield so she doesn't like love, and then she falls in love with him and then he dies in this film. And I say it's basically the same thing. It's just they, All they've done is just remembered the one thing they've established and reminded well, yeah, us of it. We're at the it. point where I could be like, Farmer Man is the best because he wants to defend this place and he does. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, you, I absolutely you all keep mentioning you. these these bits from the first movie. It's like, oh yeah, that 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 did happen. The weird spider queen thing. It was like, yeah, oh, that did he's happen. the only the one hell? who thought to like uh, save the child while everybody was watching uh, Nemesis fight the spider queen. Mm -hmm. 
like he did the one human thing in a very inhuman movie. I think, I think you guys are digging. There's nothing to this at all. They, they, like they, and I know no. you have to. Uh, you have to find something. You have to find a grain of humanity in this. Uh, Heck, grain, grain. Nice. Hey, nah. <laughs> you like that? I didn't even mean to do that. It was totally unintentional. Uh, but Zack Snyder directs. These are like three hour, two hour, soon to be four hour uh, trailers. That's all they are. I, like, there's no substance to it. Uh, and it, like you watch the trailer for Rebel, we we reacted to it on Real BBC for like an hour, yeah. uh, and I felt like there was more in that trailer than there was in this movie. <laughs> so it's bad. It's really bad. It's worse than Sucker Punch. Uh, oh, way worse than Sucker Punch. Yeah. yeah, we can fix that one though. So no more. You can it. fix it. Yeah, you can fix no. it. While um, fix all his movies. While Grain slow mo scene two is playing, a uh, uh, metal has posted a. A tweet that says, Zack Snyder, when asked why Rebel Moon has so much slow motion, quote, the obvious answer is slow motion is awesome. The use of it is a way to just <laughs> embellish heroic moments that our heroes go through. Okay, like grain and, <laughs> and throwing grain. There, here we are, right? I'm watching it there right we, now in, in the well, little let's not, let's not forget the slow mo sausage in the uh, Snyder Cut. <laughs> oh, God. The yes. slow mo sesame seed. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. He's, um, He's an interesting man, that's not his choices. We, we haven't, there we they haven't are. Talked about it because now I'm thinking about it just because of observations about his filmmaking. The fucking blur, I don't know what is going on with like this camera that his he wants to use now. Dude. Yeah, like, I think it's it, just it's, broken and just doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> well, no, it is. Well, the one the when he used the lens he used for Army of the Dead is a bro, it's a, it's a rare lens that's broken that gives a certain depth of field. He does a whole video on it. I mean, it's it's like it's it's blurry. It's distorted. There's like chromatic aberration sometimes. It's it's really really strange. I'll um I'll get to the part that's like one of the worst because me and Fringy watched this wonderful film together, and we really picked it up with the uh the the sort of peace talk part at the beginning. Not peace talk, like negotiations part. Uh, particularly whenever they had a shot of Cora yeah. and you could see Gunnar in the background. Look at this yeah. fucking shit. I can't it, it, like this, I can't stand watching this fucking movie when it gets this ugly. This is Army of the Dead all the time, by the way. Oh yeah, Dude, God, I, Army of the Dead. Jesus Christ! Oh. There is a long slow motion scene of of Titus <clears throat> dipping his canteen in a fucking bucket of water, <laughs> in a barrel of water. I'm watching it right now. I'm like, this thing goes on forever. Like, look, he's drinking water now. Yeah, I, I. It's just. It's so. It's. It's. It's grating. It's it's like annoying. It's it's annoying to look at. It's so yeah. fucked. We can only uh, be thankful it's not as bad as Army of the Dead uh, or well, whatever. Army not, of the it Dead was like so persistently yeah. does it. Whereas yeah, I mean, yeah, Rex keeps saying it when we talk about time. it. Uh, that he had to just look away from the screen just to see that things are not blurry all the time. Yeah, just to recalibrate <laughs> his eyes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to be like, what, what does it yeah. look like? Looking at things normally look like because he he looks like a dream demon right now, Gooner. He's all fucked and he's like kind of spooky, yeah. Slender Man style. And you're like, Hell why why goes. is this happening? Not if you know, wanna, man. It's, if you want to know, if you want, oh god. I was, no, just no, gonna, I was just going to say, if you want to know what the world looks looks like to me without my glasses on, watch Army of the Dead. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I, I was just going to mention, like, I don't know, the fact that it was starting with Army of the Dead that Snyder became the cinematographer for his own films. Yes. Just, it's fascinating to me. It really kind of, like, recontextualizes... I don't well, know, people, feelings about prior films that he made uh, that people had some were much nice more shots. inclined to share the shots of 300 Watchmen and his DC projects than they even, have been yeah, with these three. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like 300, yeah. I think, looks great. And I think that the, the slow-mo in 300... Nice yeah, like, and the slow-mo in 300, I think, is really... It, it's used generally pretty well. Like, it, it's not mm -hmm. used at inopportune times or inappropriate times. Um, and it's also... It helps build part of the, I guess comic book or graphic novel, I guess, visual well, style that it's going for. You know what's sad? Well, is I, think, um, I watched uh, the Slow Mo Guys' video with Zack Snyder. It came out pretty recently, actually. I remember seeing it was 10 hours ago when I was watching it, so I think it was like oh, yesterday. Oh, really? I didn't see that. Um, it's really... It's, it, 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 I had feelings of some kind when he was explaining how he cracked this for 300 because uh, it was a commercial for Gatorade, 
where the the that's where he was doing he cracked this in the first place that someone said like they wanted him to you know film it in normal motion but then when the guy like gets tossed the can of Gatorade he wants to zoom into the can and slow mo and Zach was like that's not like we need two different lenses at once and so we can't really do that and so he um he had like a split focus lens or something so he had two of them running at the same time which means he can uh you know seamlessly switch between them when he needs the particular shot and anybody thinking back to 300 he uses it over and over again where it's like you can see normal view and then when something interesting happens it'll slow down zoom in and you know come back out and do it and it's it's a style thing that i think can be used in such a way that would really accentuate certain parts as was mentioned it's like there's parts in 300 that look pretty fucking cool there's, you know there's no need to deny that in any way shape or form but somehow he's gotten worse like, I think it, it's mm. like, a, it feels like a crutch, like he'll go out and shoot a bunch of stuff in slow motion and be like, yeah, this will just be footage that I can find some way to use to like, it's it's like he doesn't, ha it's like he doesn't trust his own ability to make a well composed shot, unless it's in slow motion and it holds on like a specific beat of action for 10, 15 seconds. It's such a shame because um, the choices of what to slow down that's something that almost every filmmaker has the choice to, you know, like, like everyone's thinking about it at some point, maybe. It's like, will I slow that down? I could slow that down. Maybe I won't, maybe I won't. But with him, it's just like, can it be slowed down? <laughs> and it's like, yeah. <laughs> but he's like, right. <laughs> well, well, then let's do it. Let's have a slow shot of Titus using a pitchfork and running as he put dumps some hay on the, uh, on the, the hovering uh, wheelbarrow. It's like... Uh. The hovering wheel, <laughs> the, hovering the hovering funny. wheelbarrow. Yeah, it's funny. But they need the, a horse to pull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but don't you see? It's like the coal thing. This nature, is how you know technology. It's uh, whoa. It's, it's how you know this was all made by the same guy. Because you're like, oh, that yeah, that's there, that's there, that's there. It's like nobody told him no. Nobody recommended anything. They were just like, yeah, let's do it. No, no, but this will this this will presumably mark the end of the era of just like of of that where when nobody says you know what that's a really bad idea man well <laughs> like, you know you, you know probably him, do that between him and a few others right they've actually really damaged the notion of like we should get creatives the you know writer directors that have absolute say let them have their vision it's like fucking hell we're wasting a hell of yeah, a lot of money on this uh, Abby yeah. Jenkins with Wonder Woman 1984 is like another pretty prominent example of oh, oh. you got to do whatever you wanted and it was yeah. it was worse it was it was worse than the it, it was worse than Air at least Aries well no you know there were things in 1984 that were funny but Aries man he was comedy gold yeah Taika, Taika with DC <laughs> as well working to damage yeah. it. Dave Filoni <laughs> I mean if you, can believe it. you know it's it, it, it's funny because it's something that I think everyone could agree with. It's like it just sounds like a good notion. We don't want to have focus groups. We don't want to have the community-based sort then of like the, storytelling. Then you get something like this, which is just this incredibly self-indulgent like vanity project. Yeah, that just feels like a waste of of an immense amount of resources that could have been yeah. used to make several really cool films. It's like that. There's a difference between relying on a focus group and having, say, a, a writers' room or people around who are equivalently good at telling stories and equivalently equivalently invested in your story who can maybe give you advice on how to tell it better than you currently are. A focus group sort of implies that you're just saying, "Well, I'm going to play it by numbers, basically. Uh, we're going to mm -hmm. try and please as many people as possible." Um, and in trying to please everybody, we please nobody. Nobody wants that. Obviously, nobody wants yeah. that. But it's that it's not a case of it's either my way or the focus group. There is a nice happy middle ground in there. There is. Not only is there a nice there happy middle be. ground, there are good mm -hmm. and bad of both of those. As in, like we can mm -hmm. get focus groups movies that are probably like okay, and then we can get the insightful and visionary movies that are just absolute course, crap. It's just like um, it's just like how games when they're play tested. It's like yeah, sometimes that can yield really good results. Sometimes it can yield bad results. It really depends on how you interpret and use the information. Well, because you so, know, it's, uh, it's as simple as if you have as many as two directors and ten writers and fifteen producers on set. It's like, oh, this sounds like a nightmare. It's like, what if it produces a really good movie? It's like, oh, just I guess in that case, oh, they all cared. Happened. Yeah, I was we, just we were thinking, lucky enough that what, they all give it, gave a movie? shit. The Simpsons movie. That's a good fucking movie. That's a funny movie. You know how many writers worked on that movie? I think it's like eight. Yeah, well, the screenplay impossible. was written by one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven, yeah, eight, a, nine, and eleven. Eleven writers. Gary so Kurtz, checked. great producer. The, um, the uh, Rebel Moon and, and its sequel had uh, three writers, one of whom is Zack Snyder, 
And uh, one of the other two is a guy called Shea Hatton. I don't know if any of you recognize his name. No. Uh, because he, so he uh, is at least partially responsible for the screenplays for Army of the Dead, Army of Thieves, John Wick Chapter Three, and John Wick Chapter Four. God. <laughs> so, uh, mm. yeah, the third guy uh, is responsible partly for 300, 302, and Atomic Blonde. Like, Atomic Blonde's okay, but that's it. Like, that's the best you got. Well, well, you can add Rebel Moon well, to it now. Yeah, we can. Uh. <laughs> when um, I mean, I've heard, I've heard worse. I mean, those you know, three hundred two. Um, <laughs> but I've heard worse. <laughs> three hundred. They could have gotten a writer from Captain Marvel. <laughs> so you know. Yeah, that wouldn't be so uh, great for your uh, project, would it? Um, the uh, when when Noble is getting ready to get back into the game, so to speak. Um, I couldn't oh. get over his fucking diet. It reminds me of so many times we've come across this in media where I don't know what it is, but it's like they want to write the shittiest dialogue possible because they're like, I gotta make sure the audience understands they're not a good person. It's like, I got it. He says, um, by the old gods, I'll have you all court-martialed. Every one of you will die. I need none of you. In fact, I'll murder every one of you myself. I am the commander. Why are you standing there staring at me? Cowards. What a clown. Ugh. He's such a worthless uh, well, yeah, character, I mean, and it's not fair because the actor he can do things. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. The way that the scene plays out, Matt, is so comical. Like how he, it, it, the doctor's like, "Hey, look, all right, we need to run more tests to make sure you're okay." And for for this very unreasonable request, Noble just shoots him in the fucking head. Yep. Yeah, he's like, T "Test, I'll show you a test," and then he like throttles him and shoots him. He throttles him in one hand because at some point between part one and two, and having been you know just just recently reanimated, he's been given super strength, super powers. powers. Yeah, I, I'm I'm assuming he got them from being reanimated. Maybe, so, maybe I no, I, no. I, see that's what I thought. But later we see a random soldier man also picking one someone up by with one hand and just on their throat. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's, that's kind I of think we're supposed to powers. read that. Like most of the soldiers, or a lot of the soldiers, have some kind of like technological, yeah. like cybernetic augmentation. Like you know, he's got a bunch of shit plugged drug. into the back of his head right now. Okay. Um, well, it, from memory, you've got the scene in in uh, part one where he like uh, it's implied that he has sex with a tentacle monster. Yes. Um, <laughs> and in that scene, I swear he has a bunch of like Matrix style plugs on the front of his body, and they're not yeah. in this scene. Am I misremembering that? No, no those, those plugs so were there. I was thinking about that with the scar. Oh, yeah, Scar was given well, by the Scar Giver. By the Scar Giver. <laughs> That's right. You must be some and, kind and of he, Scar Giver. It's, it's so funny. He looks at it and he's like, you know what? I want this. This is cool. This makes me edgy. I'm a cool, edgy fella. But the explanation that he gives doesn't make any sense. He says, like, no. leave the Scar because she's the one who, like, gives Scars. Um, and the point of it, I think, there, that from what he says, is to remind him of the fact that Cora, like, you know, gives Scars. And that he has to fight her because she gives scars. And every time he looks at his scar that she gave him, he'll be reminded of the fact that he needs to beat her. Like, I think I think that's it. Like, that's yeah, yeah. really bad, but I think that's it. He's come to that pretty well. Yeah. It's uh, it's so funny to me. We would have covered this probably when we were talking about this movie on its, being on its way. But Scar Give is not a great name because it's just like you are famous for people not dying when they fight you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Give them cuts. Strange. She like, also doesn't. She also doesn't heel. give a scar. Like she's not, because she's. It's not like she left a scar on Balisarius or whatever. And you know, when she was escaping yeah. from the attempted murder of the princess, she doesn't. She kills. She all isn't those guys. a scar giver. Yeah, yeah, she just kills them. She doesn't scar them. Yeah, she's like the shoot. Shoot. The, yeah, the, the shoot shoots. giver. <laughs> the shoot giver. <laughs> <laughs> she killed the princess, and it left a scar on the face of the mother world. That is obviously oh, where. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, oh no. No. We want to talk about giving Zach too much credit, Platoon. <laughs> well, because that's the thing. If you're a random civilian in this insane world, you'd be like, why is she called the Scar Giver? It's like, because she kills people. All right, well, <laughs> it's close enough, okay. I guess. It's like, wait, but she scarred Admiral Noble. It's like, yeah, yesterday. Why has she been known as the Scar Giver for like 10 years or whatever the fuck it's been? I don't know. It's such a, it's such a fascinating world. I love it. Also, uh, again, small detail, which they actually contradict in part one. It doesn't require part two. Uh, when she, like, punches him to death, um, but then fails to, you know, actually punch him to death, she, like, punches out a load of his teeth, but then his teeth are, like, back in his mouth. 
must have been like there's, uh, there's a slow motion th- shot of him of his teeth flying out of his mouth and then they're back. yeah yeah oh yeah, yeah it's a good dental plan they have a good yeah. dental yeah, plan they fixed them yeah up. they regrew in, in the little yeah. cocoon thing that he lives in that sort of well, yeah weird if, um, sperm thing just could be a clone. Cinematic language, if if one could be pretentious enough to say it. If you're supposed to be like, oh <laughs> shit, look how strong he is by being able to pick up this guy with one one arm. He doesn't crush him with his hand and toss him into a wall, a la fucking Darth Vader. Instead, it drops him to the ground and then awkwardly waits for his subordinate to hand him a pistol to shoot them in the head. Th- doesn't that undermine uh-huh. the whole point? <laughs> like, I shot you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm fine now. You're like, okay. So That's... unnecessary, so funny. Like, just add it to the fucking big book of this is not how you make villains intimidated. Which, by the way, why would we ever find him intimidating when we said in the first film he got defeated by her and he's just going to be defeated yes. again? Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but in this film, she, he actually beats her. Well. Like, it, I mean, kind of. Like, essentially, if not for another character's involvement, he wins. Otherwise known as time. he loses. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, yeah. He, then, he then loses, but yeah. It wasn't mm-hmm. because of Cora that he that he lost, is what I'm saying. I guess you're right. Yeah, I was a little shocked when she was saved by a man, but then she got the kill shot, and then that man died. Well, so the other man did uh, penetrate him with a, a phallic like weapon. The crypt, okay. crypto, what is it called? The Kryptonia sword or something? A uh, cringe sword, I think. Is what yes, it's yes. The, there you go. The subtitles, the subtitles refer cringe to Nemesis's saber. swords as Oracle blades. I think. Oh my Oracle god, blade. Oracle! Yeah, I'm not. I'm not Good joking. There, there are so many tiny details that you get in uh, just from like looking at the subtitles for this film. It's insane. You hear like you know when the ship makes like a rumbly noise and it's off screen. It will tell you the name of the well, ship. Isn't it's, there? Yeah. Isn't there like a guidebook that's available online that you can read? Uh, this is the Rebel Zach, Moon Wiki. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Essentially. But uh, Zack Snyder tweeted about it like two days after Rebel Moon Part One came out, and a day before everybody forgot about it. You know how he's um, clearly susceptible to horribly bad ideas. Do you think you could like sabotage the film by just being the friend who's like, Zach, what about a sword that's powered by grain? Let's do, that would mean that would mean so much because they're farmers, right? They would have grain powered weaponry, and he'd be like, "Would they? Yeah, they would." <laughs> He's like, "Yes, yeah, yes." They grew on, up surrounded on. by grain. That's insane. Zach, we need a scene where someone's loading their grain gun with grain bullets. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to do they, it. In they put the grain way. into like a particle accelerator and blast it through someone's head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zach, we have a line where he says we'll shoot them with our defenses because the greatest is and the it's defenses, powered, right? Our it's greatest powered, defense is our greatest weapon. Yes, it's powered there's a line by, in the film. Sir, uh, yeah, the, the grain CERN is uh, powered by space burrows that are like w- walking in a circle too. Maybe a little coal too. Oh, this this costs sucks, lots of man. money. <laughs> it costs, yeah. mm, combined, How it much costs the budget about, for this? Both of them combined was about $165 million. Oh, that's so many Godzilla minus ones. I know. <laughs> that's a, that's yeah. what we need to gauge everything on. How yeah. many Godzilla minus ones yeah. did this cost? Uh, well, it gets uh, even funnier if you say how many uh, paranormal activities or Blair Witch projects, you know, that sort of oh thing. God, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How true. many sores? How many sores could we have gotten? Well, 165 of them, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Guess, uh, <laughs> I would go for 165 swords if Hoffman's in all of them. That'd be fucking great. <laughs> the Hoffers, let's go. Doesn't I might be misremembering, Ugh. but doesn't he like kill someone with like a really hot cup of coffee or something? I swear that happens in one he, of the later films. Uh, yeah, so in Source 6, he's about to get found out. So he tosses some coffee at a lady and then slits some guy's like jugular. And then he stabs like a power outlet and it knocks out all the lights. And then he uses the person who... He uses a lady as a human shield to block the bullets from the person who he threw <laughs> coffee on. explaining and why then... Hoffman is the best character, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he is. I remember oh, in, uh, in 7 when he breaks into the uh, to the police station, he just keeps stabbing people in the I, neck. Like, I, I seriously <laughs> feel like they will not have understood the assignment if we don't see him do that at least once uh, in the next film. Yeah, we need to see him do that. Yeah, definitely. We need to see him, like... We need to see him use the reverse bear trap again. Like he needs to, yeah. he needs to bring it into a fight scene and like slam it onto some guy's head in the middle of the fight scene with like five seconds left on the clock, and then it explodes with teeth. <laughs> I'm in. Do it. Four eleven. It got delayed to next year, and I'm sad. No, oh, really? No. I think it's, yeah, it's coming out next year now. You gotta hurry. It's my it's only won't be around forever. Saw ten was very fun. Yeah, it was. Yeah. 
Guys, we're supposed to be talking about the scar giver, okay? I don't want. Oh, yeah, to... you want to? Because the next scene up is the uh the town hall. Grain. Where it's the... more grain, actually. Grain. Yeah, that's true. We're not through the <laughs> oh, grain yeah, yet. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, we get more of the slow mo <laughs> grain. We're not done yet. We're not even. We're not done yet. <laughs> it's, it's so no, funny. Be like Zach. You know, they, we could just say this happened. We don't have to. And he's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> we okay. Need to show it. We need to see them. See so this cinema. Is the at least do it game. all at once or something. I don't know why we keep cutting away into the grain. But it's the editing is fucking weird in this movie. By the way, it it's is. Just all over the place. I thought mm -hmm. the green thing was finished. Like when we cut away from the first one to go to the ship, when you have Admiral Noble yes. being revived, it's like, okay, well, well, at least we're done with the harvest, right? Oh, fuck, no, we're not. We're back. <laughs> still going. No, it's nighttime. Yeah, it's still what... going. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Like the third time happened, I stopped the movie. It's like, it's, this, this can't be happening. I know I said it so, before. It's just so f dumb. Just I wasn't. Cool. I wasn't exactly sure when I should bring this up, but I'm still not entirely sure that I understand why they gathered the grain. Because the explanation that they give is that they're going to like strap all the grain to their houses so that way it will like disincentivize the um, Imperium from just nuking them from orbit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the concept of nuking from orbit, that's not a precision weapon, which means that if they were to nuke the village from orbit, it has a blast radius. It would hit all the grain anyway, because the fields are like right yep. next to their houses which means they could just not harvest the grain and it still serves its purpose. Well, you got that. You got they could have faked the grain. Like I said, they didn't need to actually get it. They could just say they have it All unless right. they actually have instruments mm -hmm. that can tell the difference between sand, soil, well, and you're grain. Right. That, uh, that shockwave is an important one because, yeah, there was a big shockwave. It would destroy all of the wheat. Uh, yep. And then instead of spending three out of your four days farming, <laughs> you could have spent four out of the four days training. Or running away. <laughs> Dude, I want to see right. that movie where they finally arrive and they're like, right, time for the negotiations. They're like, not here, sir. And he's like, where no are they? There. We don't know. Okay. Oh, well, for all credits. <laughs> that's that, I guess. So you you got to farm wheat and then you got a slow mo scene of all the Imperium soldiers farming wheat. <laughs> yeah, because we, we, we're which, doing by the. the way, they so start milling it, right? Anyway? That's another slow mo scene where they're doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they demill it everything. It doesn't fucking right. stop. Right. Turning it into bread. But, they, but, but they're probably, like, part one actually said, they say, well, we will give you robots to do the harvesting for you. But, like, if you've got the robots, then why do you need the villagers? Just use the robots and get it yourself. So you, you don't need these people. That is funny, um, by the way. Yeah. You can write a laundry list of how out of character, how assassinated Anthony Hopkins' robot is in this movie. Like he, he's oh, supposed he just to be a good man, but his... he doesn't do anything except in one moment of one scene. Like that's it. Yep. It's so, so yeah, funny. He's, we just keep seeing him standing off in the mountains, just watching them do all this hard work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What he so can do is for like free. The, at the end of the film, he um, the the robot learns that Cora is the one that he's there when Titus explains that Cora is the one who attempted to kill the princess, and um. The robot is entirely like he was pre-programmed to want to protect the princess, but he never could because he wasn't there to do so. And he's just learned that Cora tried to kill the princess, but doesn't care. No, nope. It, 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 I don't even think Zach thought. It's that. cool. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I shot her. I I killed her. As far as I was concerned, and the robot's like, hmm. <laughs> it just snaps in there. Did yeah. just... <laughs> I still don't know why they just fucking reprogrammed the robots to not have that weird setting anymore, where they just randomly well, start fighting Well, considering how they're immensely valuable, I think it was Garrett on yeah. FNT that said, could you at least get their armor and put it on people? Yeah. It's fucking it's amazing. Oh, yeah, in part two, well, the robot is essentially bulletproof, whereas in part yeah, one, they ones. yeah they pretty much show that that isn't the case, because mm -hmm. the yeah. one of the guys shoots it and it falls over like immediately. Yep. No. He was training in a cave. Because that was a special he, gun. He, it was a special anti-robot gun. He drenched himself in elk blood, and that's yeah. made him impervious. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God damn it! I can actually see that happening in the extended version. <laughs> yeah, you, in that the is extended scene where we get a slow motion shot of him grabbing the guts and ripping them out in slow motion, and then smearing them on his face, and then we're like, "Well, you see, this is meant to be an allegory for I don't know, the fuck. What would it be for? Elk." He got. He has Elk. the horns. So he's now it's one with nature. the planet. Nature yeah. is cruel, but Na the cruelness can mean the preservation strongness. of life or something. There you go. Yeah, we got it. Beautiful, really. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so they're coming back from completing their grain adventure. Finally, it does feel like a relief well, when you know we, that that's we, uh, like coming we close to happening. Over the second phone call, where oh, yes. the guy Cassius finally says, "Like I haven't heard from Bob," and then he's <laughs> oh yeah, they're, oh they're yeah, busy. he's uh, busy. Yeah. busy. They've working. You want him to do the, the, the Toy Story yeah. meme where he's like Bob, and then he holds up like an arm, and he's like, "Hey, I'm Bob. How are you doing?" <laughs> 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 That would be pretty yeah. amusing. It would be. It would. It would be. It would make this film twice as good as it, it is right now. Like it would double its quality if they just had that. I mean, they could have the fixed that problem it. in film one, though. Like, if if they wanted to, because they could have. It would still be really lucky if this happened, but at least it would kind of line up. If they established that Private Aris, the guy that he, he's speaking to, was the comms guy, then it would mm -hmm. make sense for them to be communicating with mm -hmm. him. And it would it would be really lucky that, okay, well, it's lucky that the comms guy is the only yeah. one of them that isn't a rapist. But at the very least, it would make sense. <laughs> it's so convenient he's not a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's conveniently not a rapist. If he, if he was, then the film doesn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but it's because of this conversation that they're like, ah, oh, yeah, he's defected. It's like, what do you mean? You said in the first scene of this movie that Cora was on Velt. So why the fuck do you keep having these phone calls? Right. You already know that, that, I mean, I guess all that you learn is this one soldier has defected, but how, how beneficial is that to you, really? I mean, you would have to assume that something must have gone wrong there if you believe that she's there and a heading there. Unless, like, we're meant to conclude that up until this point, they actually thought that the garrison was still d assembled and that they were still chill. Even though, why would he think that? She assembled, like, her, you know, seven samurai to go back. The, um... Like, at this point, it should be a foregone conclusion that all of the other guys are dead and they've got their weapons. Yeah, oh, the... they should absolutely know that they have their weapons, but the only way that they can think that Korra hasn't killed them all, basically, is if they believe that Korra, uh, sort of, you know, snuck out of the village to go and gather her samurai and left the rapists to do their thing. Which, why would they think that Korra would do that? These are difficult questions to I mean, answer, okay? I know, they're questions I don't want to answer, but Zach's <laughs> making me ask them. <laughs> the impression I got from this scene was that moment where you're talking about something for a while because you haven't figured out an obvious thing, and then a friend goes like, oh yeah, you, you, you're saying all that because of this, and then you're like, oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, I knew all of that the whole time. Like, the noble is like, it's clear they've... Uh, you know, they, they've all been wiped out or whatever. The guy who's been on the phone this whole time has just sort of agreed with him, like, obviously. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, I noticed that myself. I definitely did. <laughs> but, but the implication of that, of course, is like, wait, did you? Did you actually fuck this up? Like, and how? Whatever keeps the story going. Because, of course, uh, I think even Zach was like, the audience is going to find it weird that they've only ever spoken to this guy especially when he's such a low rank. It's so weird that they've only spoken to this guy. Hmm. If yeah. only he had that thought about other things in the film, but oh well. <laughs> but also they should have had Cassius realize that like, ah, oh shit, if my, if, if the platoon is not little platoon, if the, you, the rapist platoon, if they're all dead, <laughs> then <laughs> if little they're platoon's all dead. Alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> rapist oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if Cassius realizes that those guys are all dead, then that means that he should be like, ah, shit, I've, I've warned them that we're going to be here in five days' time, which means that I should, you know, we should expect some kind of resistance. But that that is never mentioned. He doesn't acknowledge yeah. that he's obviously told them that they're coming when it really should have been a surprise. Also, did they call back home when they weren't sure that Noble is actually going to survive? They're like, yo, she... she almost stabbed him she's probably back on the moon like shouldn't the mother world know anyway that she's here and send more people just in case well again he said yeah you, that's that's a good point why wouldn't they send even more ships to go get her if this is the number one biggest fugitive yep. yeah like at this point the idea that the grain matters at all is pretty <laughs> insane it's insane. Uh, like, it's absolutely insane. I was doing it. They would be utterly indifferent to getting the grain if it means that they can capture her, which is funny because eventually they decide that that's the case, but not after having already lost hundreds of soldiers for the fucking grain. Well, that's arguably that's the reason, even, right? As well, we've we got less mouths to feed now with grain. <laughs> that's that's yeah. basically why I assumed that they needed the grain because they didn't have enough food to get back to the mother world. Like, I 
that makes sense. It's it's really dumb, but like that's the only way that I could make that make sense. Yeah, shame, shame they've if... contradicted it right at the end of the movie. But I was thinking like re rewriting it on the oh, fly. Oh, oh. What happens if like so Cassius like nails Space Twink Alpha and says, "Hey, uh, Core is on the moon. Go capture her." And then they use her as the kind of ruse to try and lure the mother world into this trap. And then it's a kind of a a game of double bluffs as to whether or not they know that they know that they've been betrayed. But they think that okay, Cora is the thing that they're after now. So we're gonna use Cora to lure them into this trap. And then the grain is completely gone. We don't need. But then again, we'd lose like such wonderful lines as Titus saying, "The grain is the most powerful weapon you have." <laughs> so maybe the, the film would be worse for this. But I still think it would make more sense if they'd used Cora as bait. It's funny, I, I just can't entertain the idea that they actually need that great, because they're like, what, uh, miles away from a town? It's like, can you not get any supplies from there? That are Probably mm. more so than this settlement that hasn't even well, processed the, the grade yet? The first film established that no, they can't, which means that if you buy that, then I think that the stretch to say that there is not enough food on the King's Gaze for them to get back to the Mother World, I don't think that's too much of a stretch, but I completely understand that what I'm saying is monumentally stupid. Like, I, I totally get it. What, the, the, but... the King's Gaze relies on this tiny settlement on some random moon yes. to feed them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, because that, that, is one of the, that is one of the prerequisites for the plot of these films happening. So if you buy that, then I don't think it's... I don't really consider it to be another step to Wait. suggest that they literally don't have the food to sustain themselves. Just, just another thought as well. Maybe they can't go to anywhere else to get more food because they don't have enough coal to get there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. They can open up the space vagina. Yeah, well, they got to go to the other moon of Velt where the settlement of coal miners are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, those are the ones with the coal guns, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's where the um the the bullet giver is, the one that shot the other important person. It's it's this whole mm -hmm. thing. Also, I, I like how how all these how they just assume they still even need the the grain because it's been I don't know a week, two, maybe three. Like, why would they assume they still need the grain at this point? Why do you think they decided to... Why do you think Zach decided to make it grain? Because... That is a good question. He could have made it... I, I, well, when I say grain, I mean food, like, period. Because yeah. Yeah. he knows that the ship runs on coal, which means that it could have been, like, a, a farm of... You know, it could have been a bunch of coal miners, and then the plot remains the same. Um, it could have run on oil, and it's a, it's a bunch of people, like, you know, farming, well, quote-unquote, oil. You, you, and the plot remains the same. And don't you don't have to ask the question... Make it, you know, yep. an obtainium or whatever. Some yes. really important thing that is only found on several moons or some bullshit. And act, it could actually start to make sense. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, oh, wait, oh, okay, a material that can only be, okay. Yeah, like something to power their fusion drive or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and that's why they specifically came to Velt, because they're like, this is what, the, it's the, it's the, uh, we, uh, we broke our engine in a, in a fight with the rebels or whatever. And this is the only planet in range for us to get um, fusion drive oh, and him. In seconds, it already makes way more sense than what he wrote. Yep. You, like, could, oh, well. you could say there's a grain then, of potential there. Mm -hmm. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. But then we wouldn't be able to have slow mo grain montage. No. Or we can do slow mo coal mining or whatever. Yeah, oh, yeah mining. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Zach, you can get mm, muscly, that... sweaty men, you know, <laughs> mining some <stuff>, coal. <laughs> get in there, buddy. Yeah, it doesn't hold up. It's pretty hard. To, to, I appreciate you guys trying to find, <laughs> trying to make sense of this uh, fever dream. Uh, but Jesus, I, I was, I'm watching this and uh, I just fall back to what Mahler said. Leave, leave. You have a giant, see, uh, Cora's ship crashed in the mountains that they just left there. I guess they yep. didn't need the tech from it. And uh, there's this giant mountain range you could hide in. It will give you the high ground. Uh, you can just hide there. There's probably caves. Uh, well, they they can obviously dig holes, have Gary. They could dig super fast, so we'll just dig a bunch of uh, yes, really fast. And uh, they have game, right? They not grain. They have game. They have this big chunk of meat uh, that Titus sings the song next to. So uh, well, they you could got just, food. You know, contact the rebels and be like, "Get us out of here, please. We're all about to die." Uh, you <laughs> could. They would show up late. They would show. Up so <laughs> oh, that was so funny. I can't believe they did that. <laughs> That was the funniest part. That was the funniest part of this. I, I got to ask you guys, like, did you laugh more in the first one or the second one? Oh, second. Second, for sure. Probably the second. I, I don't remember a lot more the first one. I think so. 
I did have a bit of a, like a, you know, losing my mind laughing in terms of just like, no one should be writing a script so childish. <laughs> like, this is so nuts. Because we're almost at the scene, the famous character scene. We're getting there. Um, I was going to say, is the next one now the, uh, the way they've sewn... The town hall, the village. Yeah. yeah. Yep. They've got like a bunch of towels that they're giving them. Like, here's some towels and they have some symbols on it. They have meaning. And, and it's it, just it, like, have we got time for this? <laughs> well, it's funny because she get, she gives like this big rehearsed speech, which is really like, it's so distracting how like it's, it's, it's like this clunky, long oh, soliloquy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's and, what it and is. And it's like... It's not. It's not like a real person is talking. It's like. It's like the. This is an actress reading the lines off of the script. I also like, just don't believe it. Cue like, cards. Like, this. This. Yeah. This seems like a scene where where you, like you like five movies in or like five episodes or whatever, and they had like all these adventures together and know mm -hmm. each other very well. And this 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 village they know. But the, there's like four people they've seen for the first time in these last yes. five days, and they're yeah. like, oh, "You're the powerful wolf man, and you're the ah uh, yeah." Well, we have to mention that. or whatever. I don't know. It was my, my takeaway is like, like she already knows more about these characters than we do. We, we do. Yes. We yes. <laughs> There's so and much over familiarity. Fire this was... of resistance that burns in the heart. I was like, oh, "Fuck off! I don't understand how you know this." Yeah. This is. It was this scene where I just kind of held my head in my hands and just cried a little bit because I was just like. It it kind of it made clear to me what I think is possibly the main problem with the Rebel Moon movies is that the character development is only ever implied. So yes, right. it impli this scene basically implies that um, we, the audience, have learned about the characters and that the villagers have also learned about them since their arrival during the grain harvesting montage. But instead of actually giving us any kind of meaningful, or, no, not, I'm not even going to say meaningful. Instead of giving us any character development, period or exploration of, of the characters themselves during those scenes, we just get slow motion montages of harvesting grain. And then we cut yeah, to this and scene. And the next scene, they declare yeah. their growth. They yeah, declare that they have changed. Yeah. Exactly. They're telling us that this has happened. And basically it's a, it's a, it's a payoff without a setup. You skip to the end of the, of the character um, in, uh, relationships, basically. Yeah, you're right. It is really funny that you just have the, the farm girl like, all right, let me give you some towels that have images on them that are just open declarations of like what you are essentially in the views of the villagers and Snyder, obviously. Mm. Like, it, cause Titus gets one with some mountains on it and Tarek, the guy who jumped on the, the Griffin thing in the first movie, he gets one with an elk. Uh, Milius, who's like the cringe, the the rebel girl who screamed and had a funny face when she did it. Like she- The Hamburglar. On, on it. <laughs> 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 And then Nevesis gets one with lightning on it, Gunner gets one with a heart on it, and Cora gets one with a fucking wolf on it, because, mm -hmm. like, man, Snyder, your imagination running wild. Look, she's a wolf. So there's- mm -hmm. how, come, how come, like, terrible screenwriters can't think of any other symbolic animal other than a wolf or a lion? Why, <laughs> why is it never anything but a wolf or a lion? Give her the slug so towel. Do it. <laughs> yeah, do it. You are slow and boring, like a slug. <laughs> That would be pretty funny. That would be, I would, I would really, that would be super funny if, if it's like, you are a frog, you, you sit in the water and you munch on bugs. That's, well, that's who you are. Here you go. They, they could have actually pulled a joke out of it. It could have been a rare moment of levity, like unintentional, sorry, intentional levity, because they could have said like, Tarak, you have an untamable spirit and undeniable nobility, like that of the forest slug. Um, and then he's just like, wait, what the fuck? I'm a slug? And then one of them has to explain to him, no, 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 we revere the slugs because they're really like tough and they can survive in all climates and or something like that. Some kind of like cultural misunderstanding that leads to a moment of levity. Could have done that, but no, it's Tarak, you're like an elk because you're strong and shit. <laughs> it's, it's just, why can't, I, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm still just stuck on this like, ah, see, she's like a wolf. Why, why is it that like, the only animals that will ever have any like symbolism in terrible movies is either going to be a wolf or a lion or an eagle. Yeah. It's never any other animal. <laughs> I, I like. When do you ever even see something like as simple as oh, you're you're like a peregrine falcon or something? It's always wolf, lion, or eagle. Well, always. also this is this is science fiction. There are science fiction creatures in the, I can't remember yes. what they're called, but the the yeah. like space horses. They could have said like you're a. a I'm a blumble or something. And they're like, <laughs> the they fierce explain, Borg, you know. Yeah, and then they have to again explain what it is because they're not, they're unfamiliar with it. I like that they gave but, up with the sci-fi animals thing because they, they begin yeah. with that like, by calling the space horses something else, and then they thought, well, fuck it. You know, they are actually just elk. Um, and, <laughs> and they, 
But you might oh, as well yeah, just do. You are and... you are like the chicken. You you fly sometimes and you eat grain and, and you smell and delicious. <laughs> and <laughs> casually you go, <laughs> and it's really you amusing. Eat bug out of cow feces. Bugs. The funny thing is, like, we're making memes of it, but it's like you can make a meme. Isn't this kind of what dude does? You know, the whole uh, kangaroo yeah, mouse with thing. The, the little yeah. mouse, which is cool. Not That's good. cool. I like that. It's yeah. uh, as opposed to just going for the most boring choice ever. Yeah. Of like, uh, it, it's I don't know. It rem it reminds me of Dave Filoni, like, and him be like, ah, yeah, wolves are pretty cool. Yeah. Like, that's like, yeah, they Party are. But there skull, are there yeah. are many there are many 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 other animals that are also interesting and cool <laughs> that exist not just wolves and lions god damn um so yeah. one bit of this that i do want to defend in this the tiniest of ways which uh by all means call me a moron for trying to do this um oh. but i'm sorry, sorry now <laughs> sorry um yeah so uh the one that they give to nemesis is a storm cloud they say that she is as fierce as a storm and the storm is the mother of us all hence obviously like the mother parallel with her backstory um i'm not quite sure what the storm is the mother of us all means but if we kind of blow past that basically she gets quite emotional as the others start partying which is yeah it's what you've got on the screen right now um like she looks at the gift and she's kind of reflecting on what she's just been told the fact that she's just been given a gift by someone who is relying on her to defend them um and that they're i guess recognizing that she is a maternal type figure um that's all i've got no, and no, that is. It's, I remember yeah. when we were watching this, we were like, "Oh, sweetheart, you've put so much work into such a You're shit acting. film." Yeah. Like, I know. Is, this is not fair. But it, You're actually <laughs> acting. Like, yeah, you have no material. Like you are straining so hard to inject your character with any character at all. It's but fascinating. The, the villages, see the villages this level don't of acting. know this about her, right? That, that, that's the other thing, which is that, that, that we know that this is Nemesis's backstory, so we know that it's thematically resonant. The villagers don't know this because she doesn't talk to them about it at any point. Like The, the point of the later character roundtable scene is that they're all confessing things that they don't normally speak about. So the villagers are consciously tapping into a thematic thing for the sake of we who know it, but they have no reason to know it themselves, so they have no reason to be doing it. Well, yeah, I don't this... understand where they recognize it from. Well, the yeah, idea that she would be considered uh... like a mother figure after the grain sequence is bizarre. Like, mm -hmm. she... it's, it's just it's Snyder speaking through it... the character yeah. to just declare who these yeah. characters are thematically. That's Again, what the it's... scene is. It's that the character development is implied. We have that tiny little, like, 20 second long bit where the kid goes to, like, tickle Nemesis's nose with a bit of grain mm. and she, like, grabs it and he's kind of freaked out. And then she kind of, like, does this tiny little inkling of a smile. Um, smirk. Yeah. And then, and that's it. And, like, he's like a Zach mother. Snyder evidently thinks that that's enough to establish that there's going to be some kind of an emotional connection between her and the kids that are kind of fucking around with her and, like, poking her and trying to find out, you know, what her deal is. And then he stops and doesn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. Like he's he, he's missing the meat of the story. He's got the the suggestion of an idea, and then he's got the payoff here, where she basically gets emotionally overwhelmed because of the immense like motherly responsibility that she is having to take on. He also does these things on the fly because I'm pretty sure none of these kids existed in part one. Like no, they he, didn't. He, he needs this to happen, so no. they just spawn children at some point in the intervening. Maybe kids just grow really fast on this planet. Um, yeah. Also, who is that, that boy's? Green. Who is that boy's parents? Is the suggestion that he's an orphan? Because it, no if they made that more explicit, then it could be like, well, that's why he's particularly attached to Nemesis. Um, he's, you know, he's curious about her, and she kind of takes him in as like an almost like an adoptive child in like he's the three days that they've known each other. Modok's son from like, because he dies in part one, doesn't he? And then yeah, they could have done that. Yeah, his orphan son. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's in the extended version. Who knows? Maybe. But I, don't, I don't know why you wouldn't make that. I was kind of wondering because, where his parents were. Yeah. Anyway, oh well. <laughs> but we got nothing. Well, yeah, then, that. They, then we just get like a minute of them dancing, and then oh. uh, Titus sings a song. Yeah, that oh, goes well. on for like another three minutes. Yep, it does. It's just yeah, and I imagine that Snyder's like, "What do you mean? I'm building character." And then if you ask how, I wonder what his answer would be. Well, the words are all in another language, though. So yeah, I don't even know what he's, he's singing about. about. <laughs> Just yeah, it's like having wong, a shot wong, of the wong, robot wong. staring into the cosmos, and there's just he does nothing with this. He's like, he wasn't even trying you, to do you anything. Uh, with it. You need to show. I don't know how we managed to do it, but like Snyder made the night sky kind of like ugly looking. I don't even know how he accomplished it. Like I don't know how he managed to make looking up at the night sky look garish, but he did it. Yeah, look at that. I don't get it. Like a look at that puddle. Shit. 
Ugh. What the hell is that? Look at that. That's so lame. It's the sky. It's great as it is. And it's like, yeah, that's <laughs> why are you fucking up the sky, awful. Zach? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Come on, man. How did you do this? It's now I'm now I'm getting real sad because I'm thinking about in Wally. -E. It's one of my favorite oh, yeah. shots in Wally -E when uh you see that the galaxy uh reflected against his eyes as he's yep. flying towards the uh the axiom, and it's like, man, dude, that whole sequence is like Man, that's that's so good. <laughs> like it's so hmm. good. Wally out in space for the first time, standing by the window, pointing out at the sky and looking at Eva, like, hey, do you see this? Ain't this cool? Ah. Oh. And meanwhile, what do we got here? It's like, yeah, look at that ugly sky right there, huh? <laughs> yeah, what are you thinking about, Mr. Robot? Are yeah, you thinking we... about how you gotta wait until all of the villagers are dead before you finally <laughs> try to yeah. help them? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just waiting for the script. Robot X Machina. God damn it, 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 you just reminded me. So the robot, I don't know if you want me to wait, but the scene with the robot where he's talking to um, Cora, have we have we done that yet or am I skipping ahead? Uh, oh, that's, that's way later. That's, uh, okay. that's right yeah. before the battle. I'll that's hold right off then. I'll hold yeah, off. We're, doing the, like... we're setting up training them now, right? That's like the next step. Yes, this is the final day of their preparations where they accomplish an inhuman number the, of things. The, to, be clear, <laughs> to be clear, to be clear, the chat, right? They are placing their bags of grain all over their buildings because that that acts as a shield, and they're also creating like That's sandbag, sandbag sort of chest high walls with them as well. It's so funny. Yeah. Yes. While digging an intricate set of tunnels all throughout the village, <laughs> yeah. dude, those tunnels look clean as shit. They have like yeah, uh, they're amazing support beams in them. I'm just like, y you did this in like one and a half days or something. Well, that they was activated them in one and a half days. You did it while you were all being trained at how to use weapons. You did it yeah. while retrieving a ship from a crash site and doing maintenance on it. You did it while moving all of the grain and stacking it up in front of all of the buildings. Dude, them and getting you while you were retrieving all of your ammo. Yeah, them getting the ship is so stupid because they waste so many people to get there, but then it just works. Yeah, Maybe it you just should works. have just tried turning it on first before you just dragged everybody. It's crazy <laughs> that it works. It's been sitting there for what they say is like two seasons, totally yeah. exposed to the elements. It's even got pigeons fucking nesting in it. And it works. Mm. <laughs> and the premise is that it crashed on the planet. How did yeah. it crash if it still it works? I I, yeah. I got nothing, man. Like if they had fixed that in the previous movie, they could have taken it to wherever they needed to go. Why? You know what I mean? It wasn't that the whole thing in the yeah, first movie? They needed really to find useful. a pilot to to get them to oh, places. Shit, yeah. Oh my god, you're right. <laughs> Yes, yeah, fucking sorry. hell, oh, because, yeah, yeah, because yeah. the reason why the plot of the first film happens, they find their pilot, and he's like, yeah, I know some, like, you know, big dick rebels that can help you. And if, if they hadn't specifically met the pilot who knows that, then they would have gone straight to find the Blood Axes and um, General Titus. Tarak and Nemesis would not be in the film. <laughs> so the only reason Tarak and Nemesis are in the film is because they forgot that they have a spaceship. Yep. <laughs> this Stop is it, what I mean. <laughs> It actually makes me wonder if he wrote and like, it, it's like he wrote the scripts for the part one and it was like locked in and he couldn't make any changes. And then he made like mistakes in part two that like almost stem from making a sequel to something where you set down, you know, you, you, you established facts that you can't change that you then counter later on. Do you get what I mean? Like, it's really yeah. weird. It doesn't feel like it was all well, written yeah, at the same time because you was, know why would this mistake? In there. You know for a fucking fact you would have been like, how do I solve the the fucking dreadnought ship thing? Like how do I how do I beat this? Like, what if they fly in there themselves with a ship? It's like, well, where would they have a ship from? It's like I guess they could commandeer one. Which by the way that would, would have been way smarter. <laughs> that would yeah. make way more sense. Yeah. But no, he's like, no, they, they could always have... did have one because she arrived on this planet at some point. So, yeah, there we go. I I did it. Oh, I'm smart. It's it's <laughs> really clunky how they did it as well because I, if I remember correctly, there's a, there's a line where one of them says, "Yeah, when we first found it, it's it was like in very bad shape, but it still crashed at the same side." So there's like an implication that he maybe did some fixing to it, possibly. Well, it's maybe because well, he says, "How long has it been there?" And he says, two seasons." It's like, is that is that a, is that cycle? How would he yeah, use that? that? <laughs> what is two seasons to a cycle? They, it? It. <laughs> they do that like two or three times. There's like, oh, how long is a cycle? It's like, I don't know what that means, but thanks for the info, I guess. 
Um, I've only seen it, I think, from what I recall from the novelized version, like it's um, it's Anthony Robotkins who fixes the ship, so it's always been there. But like over the course of, because like it, the the narrative sort of dovetails with him, it's not very like explicit, but there's like little intersection uh, chapters where like you just follow him on his little adventures, which are way more interesting than the actual story. But he sort of does these running repairs on the ship, so when they do need it eventually, it's like at least it explains why it didn't work before and does work conveniently now. Well, it's amazing because the convenient. film, she just goes in, turns it on, and is like, wow, uh, yeah. it's on. It removes some <laughs> bird, bird nests from Wait. the engines and just fired it up. Yeah, so does I that... think um, they actually say, wow, it still works, which is like, yeah. man, no, oh, no okay. shade, that's buddy. convenient. Does is, that mean guys... that the robot is the hand of Zack Snyder frantically trying to make his plot work in universe? Like he, he's the the robot is there and it makes sure that everything happens. Is well, that no, pretty the, much? The, he, he can't even be bothered to do that in the film. It's whoever he paid to do the novelized version who had that very good idea. Oh, okay, right. I thought, yeah, I was thinking maybe Zack originally came up with the idea and then just didn't film that because he figured, well, it's in the book, so who cares? Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Or it'll be in the director's cut because that's a I... great excuse. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a completely different movie experience. Yeah. Well, and you're going to watch it, aren't you, Gary? You're going to watch all the extended version. Uh, yeah. Well, at least for these two. <laughs> It'll be the new Lord oh, of the Rings. You say these two, sure. if you're not going to watch it for the next four, come on. That'll be. Do you think he's going to get more? Do you think he gets his I six, so. nah. his six I, movie I trilogy? Feel like <laughs> the maximum is he gets one more, and that they would be like, if your next one doesn't reach like a you know particular threshold of something, we're, we're finished. Like that's it. Yeah, because uh, I, I don't no buy for a fucking four, second right? that these get engagement. I just don't. I mean, how could they? Nobody talks about them, and when they do, it's just very unfavorably for a couple of days. They're seen as a joke. There's no way that that's good enough. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yes, we are at the scene that. Oh I, no! Seriously, I seriously think this might actually be like the worst storytelling accomplishment of his career. Like that it's is insane. So to awful. Me. It, it's insane that he thought that this was acceptable. Ev everyone on Earth understands what is wrong with this instantly because it's like the baseline for the idea of telling a story. You do not mm -hmm. do this ever. This is uh, not how you do this. not after you had a scene where some random verse like, oh, you're all so cool. Here are these things that re represent what you are. And then after this, you have like the exposition roundtable where you tell the audience more backstory. It's like, okay. So yeah, and to understand what this is, is that Titus just says, let's have a group trauma dump session where we all relay our backstories to each other. And then it's accompanied by slow motion montages of their backstories, which, as has been mentioned uh, many times, are uh, more or less the same story over and over and over again. It's insane. <laughs> also, yeah. it's 40 minutes into the second film. That's unacceptable. <laughs> it's, it's, like, you can't it's, do it's, this. It's so funny to think about how it starts. Titus just stands up and says, we have to we have to explain our backstory so that we can trust each other. I'll go mm -hmm. first. He sits down and starts talking and then we I murdered all your families. <laughs> you know, that would have been funnier. <laughs> Like, that, this is where the parody comes in because they could all do like really horrible shit <laughs> to each other. Wait, that would have been no, funny. This well, the should have been is, a comedy. The thing is, he probably has done lots of horrible shit. I, I, yes. I just don't believe he just said like, "I'm not going to attack this well, capital this time." It's like what to be crystal clear when you write yeah. a character and you want their history to be made very clear to the audience and you imply it through their actions their experiences their reactions to different people their involvement in different scenes what they happen to know at what times what they will share in certain scenes with certain people in certain ways how they interact with any fucking average object even can give you so much about how what they know and where they've come from and everything that's hard <laughs> like that, that's for a writer yeah. it's like well, that's fuck that's, that's that's work you know you've got to you got to keep in mind everything about them you got to make sure it's all consistent you got to keep flagging it up you got to make sure people see it you got to try and integrate it into scenes in perhaps subtle ways sometimes not so subtle it's okay this is the easiest thing in the fucking world this is just like this is me hi next this is me hi the next this is me explain exactly remember, what their story is and their motivations in the plainest terms possible remember remember hot shots did you guys see hot shots oh it's been a long time it's been ages a whole yeah. background about the father 
uh, ejected from the jet, but he survived, and then he accidentally got some uh, yeah. branches on his head, and they think it's 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 antlers, and it's like, oh, my father shot you. We had you for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they should have well, done. One of the things this makes me think of is uh, One Punch Man, where Janos is explaining his backstory to <laughs> Saitama, and he's just like, shut the fuck up. I don't care. Make it, like, make your backstory is too goddamn long. <laughs> Yeah, make it ten words or less, or I'm not listening. <laughs> I just can't believe that he thought that this was okay. Like, I can't, I can't believe he thought that it was this was acceptable, like storytelling. Yeah, that you, and then... just, you can do this. Just have the character say, "Let's share our backstories." Here's my backstory and my motivation, my central yeah. motivation. Now I am you. next. This is my story and my central motivation. I'm next. This is my story and my central motivation. All right, lastly, it's me. It. One person does it, and then everyone else says, yes, same. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone <laughs> that's what I mean. To what you have to wow, understand, like, the aesthetic of the weirdly places similar. <laughs> are a bit different, sure, but, like, the story feels the same every time. It's so fucking oh, yeah. boring. It's basically all, all of them. Is, I was just doing my thing, emotion. then the mean Imperials did a thing, and then I ran away, and now this I'm here. They're all in slow motion. They're all in slow motion, yeah, every this, single yeah. one. There's not a single shot that is running at regular speed. Every single shot is slow motion. And, There's some and, pretty uh, ridiculous problems with each of them, just in terms oh, of yeah. like the story that they're telling. Yeah, Nemesis especially is one Titus I think is my immediately favorite. when when this one's your least got... favorite. No, Nemesis is probably my favorite, just because like her backstory oh, is funny. I lived in a peaceful fishing village, but it yeah. wasn't always peaceful. So we kept a couple of lightsabers <laughs> around, and I, I cut off my own arm, and just lucky that I have a, a plug-and-play robot one that I can just stick in right yeah. there, and it, it's all fixed now, and it's great, and now, I, now I'm revenge. Do, do you like how she says, I, I, I activated the blades with my blood, and then yeah. the ancestor told the me how to fight? My ancestors yeah, told me how right. to fight. She, so she was hand. just a regular like fishing she, fisherman, and yeah. then she plugged her arms into her ancestor's robot arm blood thing, and then and the blood told how her to how to fight. Yeah. Became that's Katana. Ridiculous. Can we agree that's the, the, um, the edgiest fucking character Zack Snyder's ever made? It's yes. so funny. It's absolutely, so, absolutely the hilarious. Character that he's well, also, I don't know if you up. can get the can get the um the shot here. So just when she is holding the sword above her arm and she's like about to do it, um, because in the box that she opens, there's two swords, and obviously she uses two swords. Yeah, there we go. So there's also two robot arms. Yeah, and it gets made clear later in the film that you cannot just hold one of these swords because they're incredibly fucking hot, even the handle. I don't know why you design it that way, but that's that's the way it is. Yeah. So she has, in this shot right there, she has already replaced her right arm yeah. with a robot arm, which means that she's cut off her right arm somehow, and she's now using her right robot arm to cut off her left arm to replace it with a robot arm. So she's how not she screaming do... in pain. And how did she do the first arm, is my question. Yeah, because she can't hold the first. sword. <laughs> Well, she, uh, she she stabbed it into the ground, because as we know, these things, when you stab into any material, they just stop moving once they're in. And then she uh, cut her arm off by, you know, pushing it into it when it was uh, stabbed into the ground. Easy. Done and done. I easy, like how, uh, as well, in her story, it's because um, the, the cringe rebel lady, uh, the Hamburglar, she's like, I came from a little village like this one. And she also said, like, I come from a little vi village. <laughs> and then the last guy, like came from basically from royalty Tarek was and it's like why is there never anybody who's like i came from a middle-sized city like i came from indianapolis yeah. or something they're always from either the most important parts of the civilization this... or a tiny peaceful little village. A middle class anywhere this film's what begging for that character in the first film but like well written you know the mercenary to just be here and say i'm doing it for the money yeah, um, that's mm -hmm. it. Like, yeah. I don't give well, a they fuck had that, about any of this. I, they had that guy and they killed him. Yeah. Yeah, they that's could have right. had him now... in this film and just, like, he, I mean, he could just say, yeah, I'm just doing it because I want money. Like, fuck it. I don't care. Or they could have had him just make up some absurd backstory by copying the details of everyone else's <laughs> and just see if they notice. Oh, dude. Yeah. That would have been so funny. If he, just, <laughs> he, he, like, collects pieces of all the other stories and makes his own one and then they all look at him and he's just like, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like, I don't know what the uh, fuck's going I on. This, like, I love this. <laughs> Two, uh, two rocks. Uh, the hippogriff rider, yeah. his mom, just so uh, so nobly commits suicide. I don't know what the fuck we're supposed to make of this. <laughs> this was so that, much. What the like, hell was that? <laughs> even, wasn't well, that just what? me? I I was surprised that he was like 
here in like a city and like of some blood or whatever because i thought he was just like some weird tribe man who no he, he dresses as fucking mowgli for the rest of the film and and yeah. just and uses axes and yet it turns out he comes from this incredibly advanced i say incredibly advanced society they do ride griffins against battleships which is yeah, not a good I, idea uh, but not a good I idea and why he has the fashion change for example it, well, also, yeah. apparently he must have been somewhere that taught him to use all these axes and stuff really well because it seems like he was just next in line in the in the uh in the family to uh be the next king or whatever and then he just mm -hmm. fucked off to somewhere got smuggled off planet and is now super warrior man <laughs> I like, I like, like how he like he, uh, he says at the end like you know the last time i cried was when my dad died is what his line is it's like dude what <laughs> what what is this like <laughs> Well, and why did they show us that when his mom is slowly committing suicide that he does nothing about it? He's just like, hmm. <laughs> he just turns around and leaves. Well, I'll miss you, mom. I don't Bye. Know. Bye. It's like, I don't even understand why, because he says, like, she didn't want to run, and she wanted to, like, preserve the bloodline, so she killed herself. I don't <laughs> oh, okay. understand. Good. Like, also... I don't understand what we're meant to conclude from this. He also says after the flashback, he's like the quote is, "I ran for duty's sake for the preservation of a of a kingdom and a bloodline that no longer exists." Which so the kingdom doesn't exist, but the bloodline does because the bloodline is sitting here telling us yeah. his backstory. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's why he left. Oh, uh, the worst one is uh, Antifa screaming girl. Uh, and we, you know her familiarity with uh, Ray Fisher's character, and we got the famous scream, and we finally got their the backstory. Famous scream, it's like, well, that one do the like, scream. Oh, that, <laughs> do the backstory <laughs> is that she came from a, a small village and then got turned into a slave, and then the resistance came along and blew up like the whole area and probably killed a bunch of the slaves. Killed a bunch of the slaves. And then, <laughs> and then emerging from the smoke is like, yeah, there's a cyborg. Look at how cool he is. But, but by the way, now that I see it on the screen, why is she just cutting into the stone in the at the entrance of this mine? Uh, clearly, like, she's mining the stone entrance. She's mining the rock. <laughs> <laughs> but why here? They metal? already have a hole that goes inside. Metal. Like normal behavior. Maybe no, that was like her first stage. She has no idea what she's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like I don't know. I'm just cutting the stone. I guess. It's like I don't know what I'm doing. And yeah. All in fucking slow mo. It's just non stop slow mo. All in slow mo. And it's just uh, bombing the shit out of people, and somehow the slave survived. <laughs> even though there's no way. The most Look at there's a. Well, yeah, she could easily have been killed. Everywhere. Yes. I, I was liberated. <laughs> I was liberated because I accidentally lived. It's one of those things where it's like, can I join you guys? And they're like, yeah, I guess. Who are you? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> sure. More bodies. Why oh, not? You guys aren't the Imperium? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, riveting stuff. Oh well, and uh, Titus's storyline is that like he he was sent to a planet to intimidate them to like vote to be annexed, and they voted for freedom. Yeah. And then he fought with them, and then he surrendered himself for the lives of his men. So Balasaurus just decided to kill his men in front of his eyes with a massive orbital blast. Yeah, like, that's also really stupid because of me. <laughs> Yeah. As I was trying to, to to say earlier, I was like, why did he refuse the, the orders here? Because he probably already, I don't know, killed thousands of people before this. Like, why was why, this capital that change of heart? I think it's just that they, they fought for their freedom and that inspired him. So oh. he, decided, he decided the cowards who didn't fight for their freedom, whatever, screw you guys, but the ones <laughs> who did. Now I realize the error of my ways. And but then also, he says, like... Hmm? I was going to say, I don't know why he would be, because he's been serving as a general under Balasarius for at least a period of time. This can't have been exactly. his first mission, like you said. But so why would he believe that Balasarius would accept his terms? Well, yeah, like yeah. he has to know that he yeah, can't get out of this. Balasarius is cartoonishly yeah. evil. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, oh, this is the first decision, you know, that I just don't like from you, man. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. And then he says, he says, basically, he states his motivation as like, he he says that his surrender and courage condemn them, so he will never surrender. And it's like, all right, I'm done. Now, next story. Next story. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> next story. What's well, like, pointing out? Really like, his, his response to his men being killed in front of him is to go get drunk and fight in the Colosseum, right? And yet, at Obviously. the end of the movie, we discover that he already knows that, if we're doing the spoiler at this point, the princess is still alive. 
<laughs> so what was he doing just pissing about in a coliseum rather than doing something useful with his life like trying to track her down would that not have been a more natural response no mm -hmm. it, yeah i can't <laughs> think of i can't think of a possible circumstance that he know. could reveal in film three that would explain how titus knows that the princess is alive and still make his actions make sense i mm -hmm. don't see how that makes how that could possibly work i also would have thought like doesn't he doesn't he want to pull her aside and be like, what the fuck happened? Because he knows the, who she is, right? Scar give a lady. Uh, yeah, he knows. He knows. Yeah, yeah so all, like, all he knows though is yeah. that she was unsuccessful. That's that's like, all he should know. If you were him, wouldn't you be like, can you tell me your POV? Because like it, it, the story is crazy, and I assume it's a bit bullshit because of Balasaris. But yeah, just tell. But no, instead he's well, like, tell is... us your story. And she's like, no. And he goes, come on, come on. Come on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you told us everything? Yep. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then she starts, and then she's like, "You've not been drinking alcohol anymore because you're concerned about the fight." I'm like, okay. Tell me a story. Tell me a story. We need another slow mo flashback. Come on. Was that? Was... go to, to Guna, and Guna's backstory is that he's not interesting enough to have one. So yeah. Just yep. on. yeah. I'm a farmer. Yeah, just, I've been farming. He's just chilling. <laughs> he's not right, allowed yeah. to have a story. I should have had a slow mo sequence of like one day I was farming and I I fucked up I I made a farming mistake and then he collapses to his knees in slow motion and starts crying no. from that yes. day on. Oh. Make a mistake farming again. I stood on a noble he... frog. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say like maybe he fucked up like counting the grain, which means that some people starved or something because the first oh film God. told us that he was the grain counting man or something. Oh no. Or like, and I've never yeah, failed like... to count things properly since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's also the guy that went to. Uh, he still asked me to count. <laughs> he's the guy that went to it's whatever dramatic. the name of the Moss Eisley place is in the first film. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and he's the guy that traded their surplus with people like the Blood Axes. So maybe yeah. he trusted the wrong person and got like one of the other farmers <sighs> killed as a result. Like, there's loads of things you could do there. No, no, this is no. we had to do this. This was what we had to do. Um, but yes, I think on that note, since that's probably like a good slot for the halfway point, Gary is going to have to leave us. Sorry. Oh, no. It's all right. We already knew we would take this long going through it. I actually thought we might have been a bit fast with this one, but it is just so cringe. Like, there's just so yes, much that's wrong. Big no, I had to get through that characterization scene. That was, uh, <laughs> that was something to behold, man. Impressive, wow. to say the least. I think you're right. I think, uh... Not that film school's doing anybody any good these days. They should <laughs> show this in the future to like this is what you don't do. It would be funny if, if they open with like they watch it and they're like, hands up, is this a good movie? And if someone puts their hand, it's like detention, right? Immediately. Get out. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> you failed. Oh, uh, before you go, broke. I'll uh, we'll let people know, I would I would say that the real BBC plushies have indeed launched. Yes. Here they are, after all this time. For those who watch the show, they're uh, very much referenced memes. You'll understand it very well, but uh, yeah. we've got us the X-Ray Girl plush, along with Peeping Tom as us, the team, right? In the, uh, in the ongoing story of him trying to defeat evil by trying to get a look at, uh, you know, the, the natural at, beauties look of at life. women's boobs, <laughs> yes. Yeah. All he wants to do is look at women's boobs, but he ac accidentally thwarts evil in the process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, Gary of Rivier, the uh, classic reference, because uh, Gary's quite into video games. Uh, yeah, yeah. We tend to bring him on yeah. for the video game episodes because he's like the, the insight is just flowing. As everyone knows, Rebel right. Moon is based on the video game uh, The Witcher. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, yeah, very inspired. And um, oh, and all that, all that Fallout knowledge I had. You know, <laughs> we were talking about that. I have uh, idiotically fooled you all not put a link in the description it will be on the re-upload so if you listen to this in future you can access it pretty easily but it's, it's easy to find it's just makeshift and then search our names but uh there's also the cthulhu version of my plushie i've seen people call it battle damage mauler which is a pretty good uh name for it as <laughs> well um i thought it was a pretty neat one that they came up with for that i was very happy with it but yeah if you buy them together you get the 15 percent discount it is the uh the real bbc team and of course thank you so much gary for joining us we shall uh I'll catch you on the next thing I see you on. I saw you almost like every day for this week. Yeah. And I'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> yes, yeah, see you in a couple of days. Right after I finish my Rebel Moon review. <laughs> so, yay. Plenty to work with. Uh, plenty to work with. It, yeah, it's like, how am I going to keep this down to like a reasonable amount of time? And I know I'm telling this to the long man, but, you know. <laughs>
we we always I've keep only it got a reasonable so amount of time. time. We never we try never go over. Guys, it was a pleasure. Uh, please continue watching, everybody. These guys are awesome, and uh, subscribe to all their channels. I'll Thank catch you, you later. Much, bye bye. 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 See you later. See ya. We may or may not have someone else pop in at some point, um, but if they don't, it's you don't have to imagine who they are. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> they are. They may or may not be too busy. It's it's all right. It's, it it turns out not many people liked Rebel Moon uh, Part Two, the Scar Giver. I just can't believe it. And so so many people are Wait, just ready to shit on it. Really? Yeah. I thought it was like best movie ever made. Uh, said no one ever. I did see a. There was a comment on the FNT episode, I think, that said something like, uh, I knew you guys would just shit all over Zack Snyder for no reason. <laughs> like, uh, Oh no, there's a reason. There's, there's a, a reason, reason, I swear. I can plenty, explain, don't plenty worry. Plenty of reason, actually. Uh, what do you think part three is going to be called? I was trying mm. to think of this earlier when I was writing my script for the video, and I, I couldn't think of anything dumber than the Scar Giver. The Skin Grafter. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, it's got to have something to do with the princess, right? Because that's the hook for... That's the cliffhanger for film three. They're going to go and find the princess. The princess's diaries? <laughs> it's just the child I mean, one... of fire and the scar giver. It's not like it implies a third one there, does it? It's like... Uh... No. I mean, one potential option that they have the route to go down is because Tarak says that he's going to... Like, once once he's done here on Velt, he's going to go back to his home and see what's left and try and pick up the pieces. And then he changes his mind at the end of the film and is like, yeah, right, let's go find the princess. So... Maybe we're gonna get um, Taraka Star Wars. Sorry, Taraka Rebel Moon story as a as like a spin off. That could maybe happen. But I mean, names for part three that are princess related. The magical princess. <sighs> That's not cringe enough, though. It's not as cringe as. Wait, what was it? Divine Resonance. That was what the subtitle said. Rebel Moon Part Three: Divine Resonance. That's my. That that's be, my answer. Would be pretty cringe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can always kick on with the next scene, because this scene is pretty much drained of its uh, magic. They really did uh, you know, make so much use of it. Because at this point, you know everyone really well, I would say. Uh, and it's like it's like perfectly well, Yeah, you prepped. understand their stories and their motivations and their the, in the clearest terms possible. That's right. But now it's like the training day. <laughs> <laughs> We're in sub-traded, it's more traded. Oh wait, we got a. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's, it's the robot it's scene talking... next, isn't it? Oh wait, no, no, no. That, it's they were talking scene. about um, he he like continues to talk about his plan, like that he basically it is it is Titus's expectation that the mother world will send a handful of officers down and they'll take him in close quarters combat and then negotiate for the safety of the village. Which it's just like, man, you're delusional. Like, why do you even think that this is? How unlikely is this outcome? Like, surely. <laughs> It makes sense for yeah. maybe, maybe for someone more naive, maybe Gunnar says this, may, or Gunnar, maybe yeah, he maybe says so. that, but um, yeah, General Titus already knows from experience, first-hand experience, that that is not going to happen. He has tried this before and it didn't work. Yeah, um, like, uh, presumably he knows more than anybody that if he defies the Imperium this, like, brazenly, like, why wouldn't they just destroy the village? Well, we... well also, if they if they offer them the grain, if they offer the Imperium the grain, and the Imperium's like, yep, cool, deal's a deal, they take the grain, the villagers will have then lost their bargaining chip, which means that there is no reason why the Imperium wouldn't just blow them apart. Yeah, why wouldn't they just blow them up? Why wouldn't they just hang out in low orbit? You know, yeah. and, and, exactly. They, and you know they, the whole, they, um... they are not from a position of power. They have no power in this situation. You know they're doing the, the at the beginning where it was like we're relying on the principle that they always return once an admiral is taken down in battle or, or just dies in general, and then it's like they they always do that right. And Titus is like they sometimes just don't follow their own thing. So it's like so what if Titus that they just blow us up because we don't even have that much grain? I just picture him being like, no, they would never ever do that. No, they need the grain too much. They, yeah, they that was a line earlier in and the then, film. And then when they actually target them, that. he must have been like, but they would never grow up, blow up grain. There must be some crazy situation <laughs> <Right>. happening. <laughs> it, must, it must be something right. insane. Come on. He like picks a bag up, starts waving it at the ship, like, what are you doing? We have grain. Don't blow us <laughs> up. But then we get the, this 30 second shot of the, the ship, the king's gaze flying to Veld. I think it lasts actually about 30 seconds. It's really long. Well, how would you understand what's happening if we didn't have that? It's like, it's, uh, I don't know what's happened, but after, like, the Snyder Cut, he's gotten less respectful of the viewer's time. <laughs> Look at that shot. Look at how long it lasts for. 
Come on. <laughs> it's kind of surprising, honestly, that Rebel Moon Part 2 is only like one hour, 50 minutes, because it feels so and much longer really than that. This is well, also... Because he'd probably say, yeah, but the first shot in A New Hope, that lasts a while. It's oh. like, it lasts less time than this, and it's more iconic than this. Well, think of the composition, the implication. Like, because yeah. there are yeah. shots of the Death Star moving toward, like, you know, targets and everything, but... It's so imposing and so unique. This is just its yep. ship heading toward planet. It's a ship and it's flying to Rebel Moon. Look at this shit. It's so it and it's not an cheap and crap shot. as well. Yeah, no, it's not. I mean, it looks it looks made for TV, which it technically yeah. it is, but not for this budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, there's nothing interesting about this, and and the music as well. It's at this point that I notice, like, man, this music is really um. It insists upon itself. We get these loud <laughs> choirs constantly coming in, like, <laughs> like the, oh, I think my mic cut out when I did that. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> it's my singing. Um, it's terrible. It's really, really, really obnoxious. Well, robot conversation then. That's next up, right? That's right. Because oh, she flies just, just before we get there, because I'm confused about this plan. So they have one dropship. And it's their only air support, but it's also their only means of escape if things go wrong. And their plan is to fly it miles away and put it behind a waterfall, which will take them, you would think, ages to get to on horseback. It actually, in the event, takes about three seconds because time doesn't function in this mm -hmm. film. But what, what exactly is the thinking behind this? If you're just going to go and pick it up later and bring it back anyway, like, would you not be able to hide it in a barn or put some more fucking in a hole. over it? Yeah, they could they could have dug a hole and stuck it in the hole. Like they're very good at digging holes. They could easily have done They are that. very That's good right. at digging holes. True. I don't mm -hmm. I don't know why they did this now as well, because it, it the the film almost draw, almost draws attention to it because Titus says, Cora, tomorrow morning, the morning of the day that the Imperium is coming, I want you to get in your dropship and I want you to hide it. Why not do it like now? Because if the Imperium arrives like an hour early, we know that they have planet scanning technology, which means that they would see where she's hidden it. And Cora mm -hmm. would know that she, and Titus, fucking both of them, would know that they are planet scanning technology. Nah. Nah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we are, pretty stupid. We are moving to the robot conversation. The, the first thing that I thought was really funny is that she's doing all this work, she's getting prepped and everything, she lands the ship, like, oh, there he is again, that fucking weird robot who wears all of his trophies and stuff, I don't know. You, and, how does he know she's coming here? I don't fucking know. But she says, uh, hi, James. And he's like, the last time I was called that was by my Mechanicus Militarium leader as he died in my arms. And I just picture being like, didn't ask, buddy. <laughs> like, I just I just <laughs> said hello, okay? Like, here he goes again, fucking ranting about his life. I know robots could be cringe. That's what I mean, though. It's like, he's set up to be the easiest, like, character for everyone to like, but he's done nothing with him so far, except he shot someone, and then he ran away. <laughs> like, and then he, yeah. he went and killed an elk and, and took his his bones and put them on his head. I see, just quickly, there's a couple of people in chat who evidently didn't see the first film or they missed this. So, yeah, the, the name of the military branch of the Imperium, if this wasn't already <laughs> warhammer enough, is called the Mechanicus Militarum. Which is the names yeah, of two funny. separate Warhammer 40,000 factions that they've just slammed together. And the leader of one of them is Belisarius. Another name is directly really? from Warhammer. I've yeah. seen um, a meme of uh, just Star Wars title and 40k and then just a little people with a hammer smashing them together. That's what Rebel Moon is. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm not going to jump forwards, but the thing that Platoon mentioned earlier with the big face on the, um, on the King's Gaze... I did a little bit of a deep dive on that, and I did a little bit of research on the wiki. That is heavily ripped from the backstory of one particular faction in Warhammer. But I'll wait until we get there. It, it's shocking how how similar it is. Doesn't surprise me at all because everything's so shallow yeah. in this. It's all like I, I I really like that movie. Let's get that in there. It's like yeah, people will like that. Pretty much. Good. Just grab and throw them in a blender. Uh, and and it's like a shitty blender. It doesn't really work very well. So there's lots of big chunks of shit left in it, and then pours it out into a smoothie that's got all these chunks of crap. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of <laughs> Rebel Moon, this is a guys. movie now. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking Rebel. of shallow, th th this little dialogue exchange where she calls him James. I, I don't think these two have actually ever interacted before. This is their first actual speech, and yeah, apparently they're already on first name terms. But she calls him James. And he says that he doesn't mind it, 
because it makes him feel something other than hopelessness. <laughs> I, like, I don't understand what that's supposed to be. This is what I mean. Like, imagine having a even... friend like that. Every time you talk to him, you're like, "Hey, bud," and he's just like, you know, the death of of all of us is inevitable in many ways. You'd be like, "Shut the fuck up, James." I mean, they they then do the yawn. We're not so different, you and I. We're yeah. both designed yeah. by the Imperium to kill. Uh, the the biggest idea would be us is. fighting against I don't them. Even he's understand. like, mm -hmm, okay. The funny thing is, oh, go, ahead. go for it. No, okay. no, no, go for it. Okay, I just, I just I, I'm I'm just questioning their uh, programming capabilities, or I, I just don't understand what this robot is supposed to be because apparently it has like feelings, but it's still a robot, and then it can stop some things. But now he uh, has that blockage written away by the other lady existing or something. I'm just so confused as to how these robot mechanics are supposed to work. Yeah, there was like a I bunch think of meant them. to conclude he's basically a person, um, like except it's weird because he doesn't want to help the villagers for some reason. He takes fucking yeah. ages, even though the one girl that he really wants to protect is among them. Exactly. Yeah, he, he explicitly he... says, I think it's in this scene that um, the reason why he intervened and and saved her in from the rapists in the first in the first film um, is because it woke up a part of his programming that I guess it like it, uh, she reminded him of the princess that he was never able to save basically is what they're doing. Yeah, he said um, nothing then can it, come to harm her or destroy her. Yeah, but then it takes like the entirety of this movie for him to realize that wait, hold on a minute, but if the imperium like kills their way through all the villages, that means that they're going to kill that that girl. So then he jumps in and stops them. Like it he doesn't yeah, when do had that he, early. If he had gotten involved from the beginning, like this whole fight would have been very different. Same, by the way, for the fleet that comes in at the end, which is still so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah, that robot should have downloaded some more RAM. And also, um, Cora would have known how effective this robot is in combat. Because it's when we see it, it's like unbelievably effective. It's like having a Terminator that can do acrobatics. Oh, it's insane. Yeah. Um, you would think that given that Cora has to know that she might put in a little yeah. bit more effort to convince him to join their team than um, we're not so different, you and I. Like, you know, she should not accept no for an answer. Well, and instead he just says, you can't win, and then runs off. <laughs> <laughs> just runs away. Oh, fucking... Like the, when the you ship, can't win, Lamau. <laughs> when the ship arrives and they're just talking about how clever the villagers are for surrounding themselves in grey. It's such a joke. This is easily like parody of it. Because, because, like, when Snyder wrote that down, he wrote they wrote clever, and he's like, "Yeah, I am pretty clever, <laughs> aren't I? I'm a smart boy. I got I'm such it. a good screenwriter and director." <laughs> but like with this and, scan, and there's no reason to assume they actually know what's in those sacks. Like they don't. They just it just for some reason it shows up as red. Well, it's like it, all right. It's weird. It's like it's simultaneous. This scanner is is like it's able to detect that there are a bunch of uh, women and children in the like town hall. But it can't detect all of the like trenches that they've dug out in the field. Uh, the yeah, see, where you fucked up the there, Fringy, is that they explicitly show a scene where they pile some soil on top of those. Uh, those, those. I like how oh. they pile it on while it's visible from yeah. the side. Like, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if someone was looking out the window and said? The farmers are like they're doing stuff down there. They're like covering up. <laughs> well, like there's trenches. a guy posts his head out. Hey. What are you? What's that? What are you doing? <laughs> and they're like, like nothing. If, they can, if you can see them, they can see you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to see that. The guy with the telescope also, is back. He's like, hey, wait a minute. They also like the, are the village. This is a question that I have, but then the film just it it breaks again. Are the villagers aware that the Imperium can scan them? Because Cora, Titus, and Aris would have to know that that they have that technology, they which means that, that yeah, yeah, which means that the villagers have to know. That the Imperium oh. knows that they've stashed the women and children in the longhouse. But they seemingly don't know what the ship is that's coming for them. Because when the, the King's Gaze arrives in orbit, there's this sort of long shot where Titus looks up in almost like shock and horror and says, A dreadnought. As though he didn't know that, was that, that was the thing that was already coming. Yeah. So, but they, they should have already known that that was what was coming. And if they did know, then yes, you're right. They should absolutely know what its capabilities are. But the film seems to think that they didn't know that that was what was coming for them. Yeah, they have to have known because they had discussions in film one involving what the threat was mm -hmm. and Titus was present yeah. for, unless he was too drunk or whatever. Like, I don't know if that's what they're going for, but... Um, so, you know what's funny? Yeah. Um, when I was watching it for the first time and they show the uh, the soldiers getting close to the town hall with the women and children, 
and they keep coming back and forth and back and forth, I was like, oh, I've seen this a million times. It's going to be they burst the doors open and it's a trap. It's not actually the town hall or it's not actually the place we think it is. I was like, oh, no, it is. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's such a, like, I expect a lame twist. And it's like, no, you just don't get anything. It's like, okay, sorry. I didn't even, why did I even? Why didn't they <laughs> hide the children in little bags of grain? And then both ah. of them would have been saved. Yeah, give them grain mech suits so they can't be attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Punch it just reminds me of this, of, of this, 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 this comic page where some guy has just has surrounded himself with babies, like taped lots of babies. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's just all grain. <laughs> this movie's very clever, as as is just pointed out by the villain yeah. character. It's very, very, very clever. When they it's, launch, yeah. they're a, they're a fleet. By the way, it's just like this is over. This is yeah, yeah, this done. fucking yeah. over. Look at all these Look things. It's so like, many. Wait. Got, like, I counted the number of ships that you see. There are 23 drop ships that you see on screen at once. <laughs> um, and even as far as I'm aware, even the drop ships that just, you know, dump their payload and leave, uh, they have like weapons. They have cannons on them. Oh, they have like a tank cannon on top. Like, yeah. Small like, Gatling thingies what or they, whatever. It's so nuts. like to be, to be clear, what they need to do is because at this point, the rebels don't know, or the, the villagers don't know that um, Noble is alive and they don't know that Noble is here to get um, Cora. They believe that the reason why they haven't been nuked from orbit is because they've covered themselves in grain and the Imperium really wants the grain. So they're ready to make a deal. Yeah. Um, but, hold on, this film is stupiding my brain. I've forgotten. Oh, no. I've forgotten exactly where I was going with this. Hold on. No, it's gone. It'll come back to me in a minute. And Zach's, it's gone. Yeah. No, right, yeah. The... We've gone. Sorry, Zach tried his best to break my brain. So, what um what the what the Imperium needs to do what uh, what Noble needs to do is he needs to I mean he wants the grain some would say he needs the grain but he he also really needs Cora so what you do is you point your guns at the the village and you say Cora come here and get in this drop ship otherwise everyone fucking dies he doesn't have to land an army to do that yeah. He also doesn't need that to land all of his army outside the village, on one side of the village, as opposed to landing it, you know, in the village, given that they can fly, or rappel yeah. down onto the rooftops, in which case, you, you know, you've immediately defeated the whole trench warfare plan. Or maybe put some artillery up on the surrounding ranges, which doesn't have the sort of the nuclear capability of an orbital bombardment, but it's still quite powerful. Like, th there is no way these people should lose this fight, and yet, inexplicably, they do. Well, yeah, they they have it. They have total air superiority. Com total, complete, yeah. and utter air superiority. Mm. Have you considered one secretly good guy boy in the sky, though? <gasps> that could fuck no. up their entirety. Isn't one? Of, yeah, one of them is smoking on the way in. By the way, the rest of them odd. It's just like. What's, what's yeah. the deal with that? Oh, yeah. What's, what's yeah, going on? There, so that, that shot right cool there that's on the screen right now, it's a visual inconsistency, because where's the big black plume of smoke? Mm. When, when you see, like, the rear view shot oh, yeah, that you just right. had on the screen, it's, the, the, yeah, there you go, it's just gone. Where is it? What are we doing? Listen, mm. that, that costs more money. <laughs> you can't <laughs> <laughs> you want the plume. Oh, okay, so it's the bigger ones they all make. Yeah, because it's in the, you got another wide at one point, you can see the actual smoke is is trailing behind them, but the other shot it wasn't. Yeah, so I think it's the um, the larger ships that are dropping the yeah. like tanky spider robot boys, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing that the reason why they smoke like that is because they, of course, they run on coal, uh, <laughs> 19th century technology. <laughs> no! Um, so that, is, that is my guess, but then it makes me wonder, what are the smaller ships running on? Dude, that's the um, worst when it makes sense in the way that it doesn't make sense, you know what I mean? You're like, <laughs> no, yeah. that's probably why, no... Like, maybe if they had multiple generations of ship. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm trying to think like of, a, of an example of this, but I don't think I've ever seen anything quite this dumb in a sci-fi movie. Um, and I'm thinking of, like, in Star Wars, you've got the different um, ships. You've got the Y-Wing and the X-Wing. I, I think it's only those two that you see in A New Hope. Um, and maybe, like, what, what you could have potentially done there is made it clear that maybe the X-Wing was developed more recently and it has more up-to-date technology and the engines are cleaner um, and it doesn't have as much of, like, an, a, vis a visible exhaust. They could have done something like that, but, I mean, there's no... Why don't the smaller ships also run on coal is kind of what I'm getting at here. 
this is the thing with parody at this point. If you were to parody this film, I think if, you know, like Spaceballs, if they were making that and you go like, oh, let's have our ship powered by coal. And they're all laughing. And then someone says like, well, they actually did that in Rebel Moon. Like that, that was like, <laughs> we'd have to be sillier than that. And they go, okay, well, we'll have like a little compartment. You open it up and that's like the core of the ship. And it's just a mouse and a hamster wheel type, 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 that sort of situation. <laughs> and then you'd be like, yeah, yeah. And Zach's like, oh, that's a, yeah, that. That's a good idea. They're like, no, stop. Like, we can't get any stupider anymore. Like, we I told you to like, not let Zach into this room. You're ruining our like ability Simpsons. to make movies. It would be like the Simpsons already did it, but with Rebel Moon. Yeah. The thing is, no one would have saw it, so how could they know? <laughs> they they would have been like, wait, he actually did that? You have to prove it, like, on your phone. It's like, yeah, he did it. Look. I love that the first thing that Noble does when he steps out onto the planet is he unbuttons his shirt, like, look at this scar. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't it cool? You it's gave a, it to me. You're Scar a Scar Giver, Giver remember? Mm. It's such a you terrible You know for a fact name. that Zach was like, that makes it meaningful. That makes the day meaningful. I had to. Yeah. That's right. See, she is the Scar Giver. She gave him one. And then she killed him <laughs> later, so it's just like, oh. Yeah. Didn't really give him a Scar there, huh? <clears throat> Fucking hell. The exchange here is like so weird because Cora says like, yeah, take the grain and say you couldn't find any of us, uh, otherwise we're gonna kill you. And it's like, oh. Okay, he's just landed with a massive fleet, but sure, yeah. you're in any position of bargain. It's it's just like, I think that there are actually more, no, there has to be, there has to be more soldiers on their side than there are villagers. There's oh, like 200 villagers. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, again, the, 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 the crew of the, of the Dreadnought is like 5,000 people. That's right. I don't, they're so, not all going to be soldiers, but like, I don't know, half of them? Is well, that I reasonable? Just, I mean that even the amount that we see on screen who have landed as part of this oh, like, yeah. initial forward force, there's so many of them. Oh, and what you're not considering, Bingy, is that the barns are like spawn points for villagers. And so <laughs> whenever you run out, they just create more. <laughs> but it, but it, but well, but to balance it out, it costs you ten grain to make a civilian. <laughs> no, we need the grain. We can't. That's the, no. that's the thing. It's how they balance it. Damn. It's, um, now I have a question, and hopefully someone here can help me out. Does Noble? Does he know that uh, that it was Balisarius who was ultimately responsible for killing uh, the the royals? Or he, does, no, he does can't he know that. that Okay, so if so, he believes that Cora did it. That that she killed his king, his queen, I and think, the princess. Yeah. I think what we're supposed to get from the film is that Balisarius and the other senators conspired to overthrow the king. They pinned the blame on Cora, which is why Cora is now the most wanted person in the galaxy or in okay. the universe. So, yeah. which yeah, yeah. So I knew that much. I just wasn't sure whether he knew. So think about it from his perspective. He's come to this planet. To get the grain that you know he, he was he was a bit of a dick when he, he came earlier killing Mardok. that was pretty mean um he's come to get the grain and he's got standing before him the woman who he believes killed the entire like royal family including the princess and he's saying look all right i'll i'll take the grain i'll leave the villagers alone and i i'm just i'm gonna bring you in is this not like from his perspective is that not like actually incredibly fair really that he would say, like, I'm not going to hurt any of these people who have, like, corroborated with you, somebody who I believe has actually done this, and I mean has done the crime itself. You know what I mean? Isn't it, like, weird that yeah, so, like, the villain of the story actually earnestly believes that she has done more than what she did, but that she did commit the crime, and he's like, yeah, even though you've conspired with all of these people to fight us, um, in order to protect you, who is a criminal, I'm just going to bring you in. And that's the deal. I'll leave the villagers alone. Mm -hmm. He's meant to be I the villain. <laughs> you know, he's meant yeah. to be like the, the bad guy. I mean, I think at that point, he's kind of doing a similar thing to what he did in film one, in that he's he's wearing this facade of being somewhat reasonable because he has, yeah, he, right. he, he afterwards, when Cora basically rejects that, uh, he afterwards tells her that, like, well, I've got my, um, he calls them the, the crypt. Cryptea, which is apparently a reference to yeah, something. yeah, and he sent them up to the longhouse to go and basically use the women and children as a as a bargaining chip. Which uh, basically all of that relies on the fact well, this entire setup relies on the Imperium being able to scan the re the villagers, but also not being able to scan the villagers because they didn't see the little like ra what are they called rabbit hole fo fox hole I can't remember what they're called yeah yeah with the dude with the rocket launcher in it that blow is he's about to like blow all their shit up. But they were able to scan the longhouse and they knew where the women and so children are. So stupid. Just but Cora, Cora didn't know that they knew that. 
So mm -hmm. <laughs> there is an inch of soil on top of the little flap, so that's why they can't <laughs> see it. It's just like fuck you. I'm not just stupid. I wanted to bring up, by the way, it's is absolutely a small detail, but it's just another opportunity for meaning that I think Zach fucked up, at least before I can tell. Uh, Cora needs to get her hair out of her face. She's got a scene of like putting a band on or whatever. And then she decides instead to cut her hair to match it for when she was working for the uh, Imperium. Why? Seems weird. Seems really weird. Isn't that seems the like antithetical to yeah. what she should do. Why would you want to do that? Why would you why. want the hair um, that you had when you worked for them? It's like, well, because symbolically I'm now fighting against It's like, well, what do you want the hair that you had when you were with these people? Isn't that more meaningful? <laughs> I guess no. the surface level version of that would be that she's maybe going into soldier mode, but on the other side, but that's it. Like, that's, I think, all you can get out of that. I just, uh, I just, the way I would assume any normal storyteller would see it is like that's the identity she had with them, but she's got a new one now with this new family she's found, you know, and the, she, she, the hair she has now, <laughs> as silly as it sounds, <laughs> is, is just cutting it so that it's exactly like it used to be. I was just like, oh, okay, you want to. Want to evoke the times that you were working for them? I don't know. It's just, it's just... But this, this is the way that Zack Snyder does films. Though. He has no idea as to why she's doing it. He's just seen it happen in other films, and so he wants her to do it in this one. That, that's that's how he does this kind of thing. Like, I think the number of films you see that the protagonist cuts their own hair before a fight, particularly mm -hmm. a young female protagonist, um, it happens before, so it happens again. There's a couple of aliens references later, which just happen in exactly the same same way the thing that sort of distracted me about this scene though is that it's like everything now is completely broken because they know the villagers are sort of operating on the assumption that these people do still want the grain above all but the space nazis know that they are not really after the grain they're after cora above all and she's just walked directly at them into them and she's now standing a few feet away surrounded by their soldiers why don't they just grab her and leave and then bomb the village yeah exactly yes well, again, this is a piece of evidence that points me towards them actually needing, not wanting, the grain to get back to the mother world. I mean, I that, think we that's the only explanation. I think based on the way that the battle plays out for the next thirty minutes, that they do actually need it. And when he yeah. decides they don't need it, he's being completely irrational. No. Like I, I don't know. I don't know well, what other way to square it away. I can't remember the exact wording that he uses when he basically changes his mind. And he's like, "Yeah, we don't need the grain now. We have Cora." It's like, well, the one potential read of that is like, are you going to eat her flesh? Like, what, what does this mean? <laughs> um, but then the other, the other way around it is like, he, he delivers a line just after it that I think points in the direction of him literally being like, well, you know, we, we're going to just blow up a bunch of our soldiers now so they don't need to eat, which means that we're not actually short on food anymore. That was, oh. <laughs> yeah, that was what I got from it, but I can't remember the exact line. They could just eat the coal. <laughs> I'm just amazed that like a, a faction like this doesn't just have like some like protein goo like toothpaste kind of thing yeah. that will just sustain nah. like it's not really food it's just calories to just keep them going like that has to be you mean, a thing, like rationed right? food in case of emergency kind of situation like we were able to crack fucking decades centuries ago <laughs> even <laughs> like yeah yeah I mean yeah I it's mean, just uh -huh. you know. they've they're really they far in terms of some tech but they're really far behind in other tech. Apparently, cracking food is just something they haven't done yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, and that's never dealt There's with, by the way. Um, he gets... Yeah. Uh, Guna gets everyone killed here. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say. It's, so she it, she <laughs> makes the call to actually surrender for the sake of the villagers, which is like, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. there you go. Like, now you're making a choice where you're, you're trying to preserve lives, and then he grabs a gun, shoots the bell, and initiates the attack that results yeah. in many villagers dying, and he is never confronted by her for making this call. No, they, they don't mention well, that, that at all. And for some reason, they also don't get instantly killed both after he grabbed the gun, you know? No, she, they just so stand there. They just stand watch. there. It's like, oh, what was that? Why did a bell ring? And then they come out of the poop holes and start shooting. Yeah. So when she goes to say goodbye to Guna, um, she, what she should have said is, they have men at the longhouse ready to kill the children. We've been tricked. We can't fight them. I need to go with them. They have all the leverage. She, should, she could have said that. And yeah. it would have taken the same amount of time. What she says instead is, sorry, I won't let this place die for me, which is like as vague a thing as she could have fucking said. And which of course then leads to Guna taking her gun and, and like triggering the attack because he thinks that she's giving up. He doesn't understand why she is essentially um, mm -hmm. you know, surrendering. And yeah, she she phrases what she says in, in such a way as to allow for the third act of the film to happen. 
no pretty big much gasps. um yeah that, look at that <laughs> <laughs> No, none of the soldiers who see this guy pop out of the ground with a rocket launcher just shoot him. None of these hundreds of soldiers. Nope. Nope. And they didn't know he's he was there. Like said, this... just insane. And I mean, I'm gonna jump ahead because might as well. Um, the 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 farmers have planted like a massive array of uh bombs underground. Yes. That when they detonate, blow up this entire field. Why didn't they open with this? Why didn't they open with the massive set of bombs in their underground tunnels that, like, destroy a much larger portion of the battlefield than this opening yeah. salvo does? Yeah, and oh, so, no, like, they, they use them as a last resort, right? And then and the guy who presses the button has no idea where his own men are at the time nope. he presses the button. And it's yeah, just sheer, exactly. Well, I say sheer luck, but I'm sure, like, there's probably a scanner on the ship that would have detected a plot armor field around the entire village. <laughs> and they just didn't think to look for it, but that's the only reason nobody dies in this. In this, also, I guess they, they were also lucky that they actually came th that way because it doesn't seem like yeah. they have anything else anywhere else. Yeah, and they landed up in the mountains and yeah. decided to walk down, they would have been screwed. All of their defenses, because what you will notice about the defense of this village is, um, it's, it's kind of crazy that they managed to get all the villagers to go for it because it's like a tiered defense system, basically. They, like, line them up from the field in front of the village, and, like, the defenses are stacked the further they get in. The defense is designed in such a way that if you're, like, at the front, you're basically condemned to death because everybody yeah. else in the village will wait for you to get annihilated and then for the Imperium to move forward before they launch their attack. So if you're out in the field, you're basically, you will definitely die compared to the people who are much further back who have a way better chance of surviving. How did they get the villagers, like, agree to agree to this, to this plan? Yeah. That condemns well, several of them to certain death. I think there are the best defense you could ever make of this is like the notion of a cavalry or some kind of defensive force that can flank. But one of the stupidest examples of how like he fucks this up completely is uh what's her name? Screaming Lady, uh Hamburglar. She gets Hamburglar. involved with a ranged weapon from very far away in like the fucking end of the second act of the fight. Like what the fuck? Why haven't you been shooting yeah. the whole time? What is wrong yeah. with you? And then she actually foregoes the ranged weapon to engage them in close quarters yep. with her dagger. <sighs> well, you and see, she was about to classic. get uh, Jackson, so she had to leave. It's, it's really funny <clears> that um, none of the none of the uh, seven samurai are actually involved in the battle for a while. They leave the villagers to yep. essentially just be slaughtered. Like, look at look at this part here. Well, wait, yeah, let's, let's talk about the uh, Man of Steel or BVS uh, scene here. This, <laughs> unfortunately, has been taken. The people knew this was coming because it was in the trailer, but it's just like, Zach, why are you making him do a superhero landing? I, it's so weird. <laughs> he also, he does, like, the, the menace walk and just beats yeah, people up. That. Also, that, <laughs> so that bit that just happened there, I don't know if you could rewind to it. So just after he does his cringe face... Um, you got the guy who walks up to the woman and is like, oh, shit, there's a guy behind you. Here, have a pistol and hold it backwards. And then she, he just snaps her neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And her face before it happens is like, I don't know, what is this? What do I do with this? That's so <laughs> that weird. That's actually yeah. really funny. <laughs> No. What do I do? Do you think they, she just didn't know when they were filming? She was like, "What you? What? 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 What's, what happens here?" And then he grabs her. She's like, "Oh, I'm dead, right? Yeah, I got it." Dude, this, actually, no. this actually kind of reminds me of the uh, Madam Web scene where he just punches the random guy in the diner that's just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> she legit looks like she has no idea what's going on. Well, I just wanted some grain. Ah. <laughs> And the other, the dude who handed her the pistol, he has it the right way to be able to shoot her, and can, he can see Noble. Yeah. Like, here, hold this, hold him off, hold him off while I get out of here. <laughs> and then he just stands there while this happens and lets himself uh, get killed. Yeah, he's still standing there because the camera moves backwards. Like, I feel like he shouldn't have been there, but then he just stands there to take another hit from Noble. Yep. Oh, it's like, so what? stupid. It's so stupid. Stupid. By the way, dumb. there's like an hour of movie left, and it's basically all yeah. like slow mo action. Oh, God. You know, it's, it's so excessive. Of... It's insane. Yeah. They didn't get the memo. Yeah. Like many people don't get the memo. When people um... think of um, Helm's Deep, for example, they're like, man, that was like an hour and a half action scene. I hope I can beat it in mine. <laughs> it's like, it, it wasn't. It actually wasn't as long as you think it was. <laughs> about 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah it's about 20 minutes. That's what I was um, there's a, I think it's because there's a lot of setup to it that it makes it yeah. feel like it's longer than it actually is. Um, that, with, that is actually a question that I'll ask you guys. So, like in, in Lord of the Rings, obviously they set up Helm's Deep, like the geography of Helm's Deep, really, 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 really well. 
um, so that when the shit hits the fan, you uh, you know you can follow the action yeah. and the stakes. Um, they also do an extremely good job of it in Seven Samurai because you spend basically two and a half hours in this uh, village. And you understand where, like the where the river is, and where the trees are, and where the fences are, and the, how many entrances there are, that kind of thing. Also, the enemies in Seven Samurai don't have laser guns, which <laughs> that's true. They don't. Plasma, they don't have a planet destroying slag. Dreadnought. Which yeah. do you guys notice how bad it looks sometimes? The slag coming off of different things, like mm -hmm. it looks like really shitty uh, CG. The yeah blobs of it, which I would have thought would be easier to like, do um, than a lot of things. It, it kind of reminds me of like the the sort of effects in Super Smash Brothers Melee, like the, you know, like the just the the kind of like the GIF images that they had to use. Yeah. Except they were making game for the GameCube where they didn't have as many resources as you have for film. Man. I gotta ask, why do these guys wear armor? Like, the, because it, whenever anyone gets hit by a thing, it's just that they're, they're dead. It, yeah. It, the it burns all right through them. It's movie armor. Also, do you like how lightsaber fight, dude? Yeah, there's one guy in here that has a rifle, like a laser rifle, yep. and he just instantly shoots the blade like multiple times, well, and then all the other one ones only have that. blades. It's non-stop with this fucking part. Why was she cutting up the floor? What was because that about? Because it looks epic. That's her thing that she does. It's uh, why. It, yes. <laughs> um, it'll be in the extended version. <laughs> It's a battle it, ride. It's symbolic of something, I guess. But it's yeah, just it's her. No, maybe it's because she doesn't want to be doing it, but her robot arms are like, fuck you, this is what we did in our time. This is what the ancestors did. I was surprised we uh. didn't get her say something like, I call upon the blood of my ancestors today. We defend <laughs> the future generations. You know, something cringe as fuck like that. But um, yeah, these guys who enter this room, by the way, because you won't know it when this starts. I don't think anybody reasonably would, but... When you see well, everything we know about Nemesis, right, like a feared, famous, amazing warrior, especially with that stupid, edgy history about the blood and the ancestors and stuff, mm -hmm. this setup, four guys with lightsabers and a guy with a rifle, and she's there, I was expecting her to chop through these guys pretty much in, like, you know, ten seconds. I thought that's what was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is what kills her about half an hour later, this same fight. Yeah, she, she like keeps fighting. It's, uh, it's super weird because the, uh, the, the private guy who is now a good man, he is also here, but he just gets knocked out so she can have her weird final battle here. They pretend that there is no one in this fucking barn except that guy, uh, his yep. love interest, and the little kid, when there's loads of people in here <laughs> that can all and do I find things. It, I find it pretty frustrating because he's probably the only one here except her that has any battle training of some sorts and he's he just gets knocked puss. out immediately yeah, yeah they put her at the not even at the front by the way because she should just probably be dead but of course yes the, she blocks every shot it's only when she's allowed to die that uh, she actually takes any damage but it's amazing how long this goes on for and it's like they oh, knew yeah. that they're like the lightsaber lady will be in here. We better bring our lightsabers. Like what? Like why don't you guys just have guns? <laughs> well, I mean, I uh, yeah, I actually kind of assumed I, I gave the film more credit than it deserved um, because when I watched this scene, I figured that they tried to shoot her, realized ah damn she can block the bullets or block the lasers, and then they got out their laser swords. But you just showed that they walk in with the lightsabers. Yeah, yeah, like they're, they're like I can't wait to cut down women and children with my lightsaber. <laughs> yeah. So th this means, doesn't it, that, that you don't need to have robot hands to use lightsabers because I mean, well, there's a glove. A glove. So this is something. It it becomes a little bit more clear, and it makes a little bit less sense. It becomes clear how little sense it makes. I should probably say <laughs> later in the film. So, um, it, basically, the way that it works is that you can't hold the handle of the lightsaber sword because it gets really fucking hot. It will mm. just straight up burn your hand off. Yeah. Um, the Imperium okay. soldiers all have gloves, and presumably the gloves are designed to sort of counter this sort of innate quality that the blade that the sword has. Nemesis has her robot arms, which accomplish the same thing. However, later on in the film, uh, Cora picks up one of the swords, and the way that she gets to use it is she wraps a bunch of like fabric around the handle, and she can then use it. Which yeah. means that none of that is necessary. It's not actually that hot, and anyone can use it if they just have like a bit of fabric. They could just she, um, you know take their shirt off and well, wrap he, the shirt has, around the handle. I have a crazy idea for you. Just don't use it on. Just use it as a normal blade if you don't have the glove. Yes. Well, yeah. that is also a good idea. Maybe, maybe they're very blunt unless they're super hot. But I was, I was going to point out as well. Like, is it is it Cora that sizzles her hand on it at first, and then she's like, "Oh, I got yes. it." Yeah. Why doesn't she know how they work? Surely she would. She's stupid. Um, I don't 
Were no, they, are they a recent technological didn't... advancement, even though they were part of the fucking crazy nemesis lazy's ancestors? <laughs> Just... well, I don't I don't know if it's possible to read that scene as not that she didn't know how they worked, but that she knew how they worked and just kind of grabbed it quickly, stabbed the guy and was like, ah, fuck, that hurt. And then kind of poked it a couple of times until it had cooled down, uh, cooled down once the blade turned off. I, I don't know if that's a reasonable Maybe. read of the scene, I got, but that's I got the possible. impression that she was like, oh, I can't hold the handle because it's too hot, I see. Like, like we're learning with her, but maybe. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know why they chose to establish that using Korra, because like you say, Korra would know that. But yeah. Why the fuck didn't mm -hmm. they put the children in a place that wasn't going to be fucking attacked? <clears throat> What is wrong with them? Like, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, didn't they just be running away? Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're just going into the hills children. or something. Yeah, out of the village to hide in the waterfall where you they just could've... hit the dropship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, yeah, there yes. you go. That's the most obvious fucking go. place. Perfect. Or if not they could have them... dug a hole for them. They could have dug a hole for them because the Imperium can't scan holes. Yeah, they would all that's just jumped into holes. a hole. We'd be fine. Oh my god, they actually could have all hidden in the hole. They could have all <laughs> hidden in the hole with the grain. Yeah. <laughs> so that, like, so oh, that we, if they the did grain, find the hole, actually used it all. all right. They open up the hole. They're about to throw a grenade. And someone lifts up a grade. Just, just one grade. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you, you can't yeah. do it. Stop. Like they're holding up, like they're holding up a flag. Like a we surrender, but it's just like a piece of grain. <laughs> <laughs> um, we get uh, Farberman has a boss fight with Noble, and it's such a yeah. Why ever? We know how films work. It's just like he's gonna have no chance. There's no fucking way. You're just having Noble kill someone, and I guess in this case, it's like, look how impressive Noble is. He can kill strong Farberman. It's like, yeah. Why? <laughs> why would he, you know what I mean? As a choice for storytelling, it's just like, sure, I understand but that. The guy had a gun. He's holding his gun when he sees Noble go into the into the dropship, and he goes ah, and then well, jumps very, on the dropship without his gun. He very cleverly upgrades to a melee weapon, right? Which in this case um, is it just his fists? I think it, I don't even think he, just he has beat a... him with his fists. I yeah, think, it's yeah. just his fists. What Ooh. a clever dude! One of them pulls out That's a knife perfect. because the the way that Noble kills him is using a knife, but I can't remember if it's I, I can't remember whose knife it is. Knife, yeah. Yeah, but in which case, why he, didn't he open he with a knife? Threw away his gun to not pull out his knife. <laughs> <laughs> he threw away his gun to get the fistfight. Very good idea. Clever oh, boy. Man. This gun well, is I getting in the way of It's supposed to fist. be sad, by the way. What the fuck was the farmer bad's name? Den. Uh, I, 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 I only know that his name is Den because yeah. I've watched this film three times. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's hard to remember their names. It's very, very hard to remember their names. I do like how the quiet kicks in as soon as Snyder has decided that he's going to lose the fight. Yeah. Like, it, basically, he's winning, and then they go, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, yeah, all right, well, he's lost. Yeah, and then he does. He loses, and then he gets thrown off the, the ship and lands on the ground. It looks really awkward. Yep. It's, uh, so I like that. that I'm sorry, I like that he doesn't just tell the guy who's supposed to fly the things, like, Hey, there's this guy here. Can you shoot him really quick and then start the show? Ah, uh, he's he's <laughs> such an edgy boy. He's gonna do it himself. Oh wait, Look have him. we gone past the bit where I think we have? Because isn't it Farmer Man who who lobs a bunch of grenades into a <laughs> yes? Yeah, oh, oh yeah, the, the pilot just turns square. around and says, "Oh damn." Oh, oh damn. Just, just, not again. Just to illustrate what Freaky said, if if people have the stream up, it's so funny watching him go blip. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize he just flops on a <laughs> blip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they, they typically don't show you that in, in, in movies. Yeah. They often cut away before that part because it looks awkward. It's just like, oh, do do you think in the extended cut they have like a zoom in and it's just splattered on the ground? Yeah, you're everywhere. gonna see his brain. His brains are gonna come out. It's gonna be yeah. His it's, it's gonna, gonna be explode. Like, uh, Those extended cuts like are gonna be so part. cringe, dude. Mm. It's gonna, it's gonna be, be so like edgy when uh when they throw the fa the pig that's dressed as butters off and then he explodes into guts and it rains <laughs> on everybody. <laughs> and then the doctor's gonna come up and say he didn't make it while checking his He just guts on the ground. Uh. Oh yeah, they're doing their oh, and, ingenious and, plan now. They leave yes. the waterfall and go into formation to get onto the ship. Pretend to be this one of the bad guys. This plan is actually insane. This was their plan. This was yeah. not improvised. This was their plan. Was that they were going to get on their ship, fly up to the King's Gaze, which I believe is the name for the ship. It is, and then yeah. pretend that they've taken damage and just hope that the crew allow them to land because I guess they know that the Imperium has no means of identifying their ships, like no call signs, Which no awareness is... of who their pilots oh, yeah, are, to... how many ships they've deployed. 
We have to roll this back all the way to the ship she escaped on would be known. They would be like, she just left in, yes. you know, CF yep. 2028, you know, num num one fucking bullshit. Day. No, Everything's going to have a unique cool. identifier. They will know they if are. that ship shows up in any system, that's where she is. That's just like a normal mm -hmm. thing. So when yeah. you see it coming toward your ship, you'd be like, that's her fucking ship. What the hell? And you'd yeah. be like, nah, and if that's fine. not if that's not enough, because they pretend they they're they're damaged, they take remote control of it, which surely is going to connect to their systems. They must whatever know they are. at that point, yeah. And no, then go have, like, bibbidi boobidi, that's not my well, property. Even if <laughs> even if not, it would it would confirm to them that the ship isn't actually damaged, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's. So um, they see it like, oh wait, the ship works. They, I can't they, be able to say this, but. You can at least maybe argue maybe like our, our instruments show no, uh, you know, damage, but you are clearly smoking and you're clearly heading toward us. I'll give them mm -hmm. that, but like Metal said, as soon as you connect to it, oh, the, the system should be built up to fucking notify them. It's like, this is a ship you're actually looking for. It belongs to the Scar Giver. Be like, whoa! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is just how just simple work. IT works. If you connect to a server, you need a you need some, some ID, something like a key, an ID. Some is it a password or or a certificate or a key file that the server goes code, like, sir, oh, you're out. allowed on here. Something that's really weird about this as well is that you, you see like the officer aboard, they're like, oh, you're, you're wounded, soldier, get back on here, we'll take care of you. It's like, why are you, wh why are you characterizing like the space fascists like this? And that they, <laughs> like, why are you presenting them as being like oddly sympathetic? Well, and, and then if of, you're um, gonna do that, why do you then show your hero wow. indiscriminately fucking annihilate them? <laughs> like, that. if you're gonna yeah. do that... <sighs> We're not there yet, so, okay? We're I didn't even... About more crime comes later, okay? So I didn't even notice the, the things that you guys just brought up about the ship, like they should have detected it, because I was just distracted by... Their plan is, is to, like, fly up there, which means that the idea of two injured injured soldiers fleeing combat and returning in a dropship that has guns on it to the Dreadnought is normal. Which, like, there is no fucking way that that's the case under the Imperium. They, they, it's going to be a case of you land and you fucking fight. I don't care if your leg's on fire. Like, mm -hmm. you you fight. You don't you don't take a dropship back to the Dreadnought with two guys in it who have just got shot that's in the foot. Like, like, that's not going to be a thing. If they'd had them say, like, are you cowards, you know, running from the battle? And it's like, we're injured. And it's like, I just asked you if you're running away. Like, it's you know, mm -hmm. some kind of dialogue yeah. that makes us think, like, oh, they're assholes. But they don't do yeah. that. Instead of having <laughs> like, oh, like you're wounded were... soldier, get back on here. You've done your duty. Why, why would you write them this way? Yeah. Why would you write the, the space fascists like this? Also, do you also think it's weird that because they get taken in remotely that they just go to a completely different hangar apparently and not just the same one i mean maybe that was the reason why they pretended like the ship was damaged so they go to the ship repair hangar maybe I mean, yeah i just find that i've never seen this b before it's definitely weird yeah it just feels feels weird but right after right after this where you have the the bad guys being oddly sympathetic about the welfare of their own soldiers you cut to titus standing in the barn having watched all of the villagers up front get slaughtered just sitting <laughs> yeah. there waiting it's so weird why would but you it... write your heroes like this that they just stand by and watch as a bunch of villagers get slaughtered yeah and then they decide all right now's the time that we're gonna go out and fight also of all the things plan. of all the things they put bombs on they don't put any bombs on this small bridge where there's like 50 soldier yeah. on you could kill instantly fucking morons. Really, it gets really even worse than that because yeah. you've got like excuse me you've got general titus who's there like all right come on let's do our war speech and then we're going to run in and then here you've got tarak he's he's just instead of going out at the same time he's like he sees what titus is doing he goes all right we can't let them do you know die to save us why are we going and we'll fight and it, and it takes like a good like 10 seconds to do during which time titus and his guys are getting presumably killed is it not insane <laughs> that the, the the way that the, the seven samurai hero guys orchestrated their plan was such that, like, the only time when they would get involved in the fight was after a bunch of the villagers had already been slaughtered and the soldiers were moving into the village. I just find it insane that their plan is, like, tiered in such a way that it condemns certain villagers to death. Yeah. While the the, like, the hero protagonist guys stand around and just watch this happen. It's it's crazy. I don't know why it would be written like this. Well, but now we're back to the slow mo fight with uh, Nemesis. Well, it's, it's a uh, 
uh, we we did already talk about it, but the tiered release of reinforcements when had they been involved in the fight from the beginning, they would have lost a hell of a lot less people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's yeah. really weird to watch Titus release with a bunch of people with ranged weapons. Being like, right, then, that will help. Yeah, oh yeah, their great plan is to just run into the open and just start shooting instead of taking cover or anything. They didn't even like oh. put anything up for cover, you know? It's like, not even... But they don't the even just shoot metal. Like, Titus runs out with his gun, and then he oh, starts yeah, yeah. hitting him with it in close quarters <laughs> combat. Yeah, because Tarzan and, and, but, and It's uh, like, why are you guys behind Titus, cover? They... What are you guys doing? It is, it is seriously like an obsession with, like, bad filmmakers. The idea of you have people with guns, but you still need to try and find ways to get him engaged in close quarters combat. Halo yeah. did it all the time. John even Wick. though John Halo and John the Wick, yeah. John Wick as well. It's like... That when you have gun, but it's it's because they're obsessed with again. You're talking about Lord of the Rings, right? Everybody wants their ride of the Rohirrim, and they can never find a way to justify it because when you're in science fiction or contemporary settings, the idea of just running headlong into into an invading army is just like stupid. There's no yeah. reason to do it. It's dumb, but they love they love it because I guess they don't think that you can make an interesting battle where people are shooting at range. Because I guess they've just not seen any like World War II movies. At yeah. all. <laughs> they've never seen Saving Private Ryan. How does Saving Private Ryan create an incredibly engaging, um, you know, climactic battle uh, with the fact that they all have guns? It's like, well, it's they give you a clear understanding of the battlefield, and each of the uh, each of the members of the of the squad are like deployed and placed in locations that are best suited for whatever objectives they have, right? You've got, like, the machine gun, you've got the sniper in the tower, you've got, like, your squads moving around, planting explosives and everything like that. You can have it be dynamic without it just being everybody runs into each other and engages in close quarters combat, even though they've all got guns. Well, and dude, we have that moment, right, where uh, they both are out. Is it, they both had a rifle ammo, they both throw their helmets Captain... and then grab their uh, sidearms. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, um, yeah, they <laughs> they run out and then, yeah, their, their guns don't, they're out of ammo and they jam and then they both throw their helmets at each it's other. It's like, it's like funny. And then, yeah. he, and then also his like, ah, oh, fuck. Like, cause he's been shot. Son of like, a bitch. Yeah, yeah he so... gets shot. And then he just throws the gun out as he like stumbles behind cover. Oh, oh man. Because, and uh, just like, I was think about say... like how awesome. There's a, there's, I think, a, a worry with uh, ranged weapons. It's like, oh, this will be boring, though. That's why we've got to break it up with hand to hand. That's, that's why I genuinely so like, what I think John Wick's thing is. But I think, I think so. If but, um, I look, mean, looking at Saving Private Ryan, it's like Jackson's Jackson. action yep. scenes are all intense. Hmm. Well, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's it's a really cool sequence. Jackson's final stand of him like up in the tower, um, moving around and 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 spotting where the enemies are, and then uh, and then landing all of these shots, and you're just like focused in on his face, and then you know cut between his face, the scope, his face, the scope, while he's uh, uh, recanting the Bible verses, and it's like, yeah, this is this is awesome. When the um the the one thing I remember really sticking out was watching him. Take shot after shot after shot, and some of them missing, which is uh, yeah, and that, yeah. It makes it feel so much exactly. more real. Well, and it's it's just it's um it's it's a sequence where and and this would be the kind of thing where it's like okay, so Snyder, this is called subtext. He knows that he's gonna die. This is his last stand, and he knows it. Like that. That's the reason why he's firing over and over and over and over and over again from the same position, rather yeah, than get as many kills as possible. This is the final stand. Yeah, yeah. and his... the fact that the last thing that he does when he's about to die is yell at his fellow soldier to get out. It's like, yes. yeah, this is this is just character. This yeah. is this is how you write characters. It's so good. Look, all right, we we got to gush about movies? Private Ryan every now and then. Okay, it's it one is, of the best uh, movies ever made. Top tier, that one. It's top of top tier. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, top, 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 top tier in my top five. I <laughs> love that movie. Anyway, back to Rebel anyway. Moon. Um, <laughs> Rebel Moon. Yeah. Fuck While it, here, it. Titus and Turok's great plan is to run out directly into them, and they, at some point they're just standing on that bridge and just mm -hmm. mow people down without well, having the, any casualties. Hail of laser shots go off, plasma shots going past them as well. It's yeah, just, like, you are actually. It's not just that the premise is implausible because they should all be getting shot. It's that you make it so clear that they should all be getting shot. Um, yeah, and somehow are not. It's it's very unartfully done. Um, it's it's like a it's it's the scene at the end of Rogue One. It's as though like, he's saying, "I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me." And as yeah. all the bullets just go around him, it's just that they haven't actually got the Force in this because he couldn't steal that. So, but the same. <laughs> he wanted happened. to though. 
<laughs> I mean, who knows? Maybe they will have the force in some way, shape, or form. Who well, knows yeah, what hold that on. Fucking Maybe... girl will do. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say the princess is a Jedi, or, or you know, parallel. If she turns up as a blue ghost in the same, <laughs> 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 oh, that's no. a third one. I will say as well the uh, the nemesis scene because uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's just really shit Boromir scene as she gets her first arrow, yes. which equivalent, which yeah. is the arm is chopped off. It's like, <gasps> and everyone's and like, oh my god. Spiding. So oh, I find no. I find I this idea on... extremely funny where she gets her arm cut off, which means that she no longer has the blood of her ancestors telling her how to fight, <laughs> and she just reverts back to being a fisherman. <laughs> You like, know, what um, am I doing here? Ah. It's funny because we keep just talking about other movies of why they were better. Um, Boromir getting hit with the arrow is such a fucking great moment because he's very carefully, like in a logistic sense, forcing the enemy to be sort of bottlenecked and he's taking fights one at a time, two at most, which is something he's capable of because he's a very talented sword fighter. So someone shooting at him with arrows while he's doing that is not something he could have accounted for because he's got them right in front of him and that's far away. And then everyone else realizing... Oh shit, he's gonna die. He, and here he realizing like, I'm probably gonna die. This is it. Uh, who getting your arm chopped off? I, I, I was just struck by like, I thought you were supposed to be like the most amazing sword fighter in the history of the world. How are you losing to like these two randies? What's going yeah, on? Yeah, like, like Titus, has, Titus has already killed considerably more uh, of these enemy soldiers than, uh, than she has. So the only potential defense that I have of this is that these are the Spec Ops Spartan guys, the Cryptaea. Um, that is it. We don't really uh, yes. have a point but of reference we've, because... We've all not been shown that they're, they're good bombers. in this whole fight. Well, the, yeah. the, it's so arbitrary yeah. when she loses an arm. It's just like, that's happening now. You're like, oh, okay. Yeah, like what they needed to do is maybe establish in the first film that the Cryptaea are like, you just completely do not fuck with them. Like, I, I can't like believe... kind of kind of like the Sarukar in, um, in, not um, in Dune, Dune 2. Dune. <laughs> Well, less so in Dune 2, but you, yeah. We, um, um, yeah, there are examples this, of that being done well. Had they given her a fight on the level of Obi-Wan versus Darth Maul after uh, Qui-Gon was dead, I'd buy it somewhat. Like a really fast and intense sort of thing where it's clearly it's pushing her to her, the edge of her abilities. But the choreography is boring, man. It's just like, yeah. meh, meh, meh. Yeah, and then, oh, really lost bad. an arm. You're like, oh, yeah, I know what that means in stories. I don't well, we intercut between that and the the farm girl and and soldier guy getting into a tussle with just one of them as well. Yeah, I mean it it does it does hurt presenting them as special forces when the farm girl takes out I think at least one of them. I think maybe two. Yes. Like yeah, and the, and the private yeah, soldier it, it, he just gets knocked out. He's yeah, and he manages to like... kill here right here. So he jumps on the guy's back and stabs him through his armor. Like, why are they wearing armor? <laughs> Like, the Why most basic care? way of characterizing bad guys and going from, like, your ground-level grunts to your more advanced ones, just look at video games, all right? It's really straightforward. You just have them be obviously more impressive in ways that are very apparent, uh, and you, you show them, like, in contrast to the regular guys. I mean, in this case, it's just show them being very effective instead of showing them... You know, they get her, but it's it's she's not doing anything particularly impressive either. So they just come across as about as lame as the regular soldiers. Yeah. Um, it's particularly <laughs> funny though at this point, because she's defeated everyone except two, and uh Big Chungus punches her and she like flies across the room. I don't even know it, it, like mm -hmm. it, it's always weird when they forget. It's like if he has the force to do that and he put it all into her face, she's probably <laughs> in a bad position right now. Or put all of the force into his like swing with his sword, and then like I don't care if you well, parry you... that shit. Like that's not going to help you. Well, can you see that both of them decided not to use their lightsabers here for some reason? They were just like, yeah. eh, nah, it's all right. <sighs> I mean, he's seen movies. But... Doesn't know how to make them though. Mm -hmm. But this is her demise. She's about to. It's this so is sad. the end for her. This is the it's one sad. emotional payoff in this movie that I don't hate. I mean, I, when I say I don't hate it, I mean it's like a two out of ten instead of a one. I out get what you say. Yeah, yeah. Like, they milk it so, so hard. They they do. Oh, they do. Hours they do. Die. It's but just she's staring got... and staring and more staring and yes and more staring and then like two minutes later it's still staring and then she just flops. Well, and so yeah. this is something I brought up on FNT. Uh, we'll go back to him in a second. There's a lot of scenes between what we just saw and then her next scene, which. We cut back into it, and she like does you know attack, attack, stabbed, and it's like oh, mm -hmm. if it's as weird as like Boromir taking the second arrow, and then we cut to just some other logistical stuff going on with some other people, and then someone else like setting up a bomb and blowing it up, then someone else doing something, and then it cuts back to when he takes the third arrow. You're like, okay, 
I guess you yeah, can do it like that. Why wouldn't you keep us in the moment? What What do you... Yeah, it kills the momentum. With basically, what is essentially exposition information of just like, ah, oh, look, the medics are now bringing yeah. Korra onto the ship. It's like, why would you cut between what is one of the more dramatic moments in the film? And even he knows it is. It's so... Like, just because to be specific, the characters moving to this area. Yeah, Noble walking and then talking about his next plan. Then the, the nature of the villagers trying to organize the bombing of the whole area. Then back to Titus and uh, Turok, whatever the fuck his name is, Tarak, doing their thing. Then back to the villagers sorting out that explosive, it goes off. Then the medics getting with it. It's just like, then we can come back to Nemesis. What was the editing there? What were you thinking? And it, I mean, I guess... Just the only defense I have of that is that he was trying to draw out the like mid action scene low point because he cuts it in with all of the other villages where you know things are going wrong. Nobles if escape. If you want to do that, you've got to push the first half of her scene further back. Like you. Yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. That's it's, just it's, uh, that's how everything it's works. Really, <laughs> weirdly edited. And also, I mean, you talk about the the villagers. The, the fact that there are still villagers in the field in those tunnels apparently still actively fighting them. It's like, that seems like that shouldn't be the case based on what you showed, because you showed a bunch of soldiers crossing the bridge, but I guess they were still down there. And then, yeah, he blows it up and it's like, man, should have probably led with that, except not with villagers in the tunnels exactly, while they blow yeah. it up. You should have just rigged it remotely to blow it up, because it's hyper effective. It causes a massive chain reaction explosion. It's so sad, like, though. All it's the villagers crazy. are dying. It's sad. Um, oh yeah, very much care about yeah, that. <laughs> but we get real close to uh, the war crime part, but <laughs> we still got like more slow mo fighting before that happens. And oh yeah, I mean we we can't necessarily keep saying it, but for every single seed we talk about, there is slow mo in it, guys. You know, you know. <laughs> this is a lot of slow mo. Yeah. Like it, it is particularly obnoxious yeah. though. Like right after Nemesis dies, we get these slow mo shots that are like so poorly composed that I don't even know why. He thought it would be worthwhile to emphasize the slow motion. It's just like they're fighting in a massive dusty battlefield where there's a whole bunch of dust and debris kicked up so that you can barely even see anything. There's like no color at all. It's really like a really, really like bad looking. Like, look at this. Why would I want to watch this in slow motion? I look at these know. shots. Pew, pew, pew. Uh... Look at that. It just Fucking... flows badly as well. Also just shows mm -hmm. me how stupid it is. They're just standing on top of the bridge with no cover and somehow survive and just shoot everybody yeah, the down. Yeah, slow motion hell. John Wick, the way that they do it is move so fast that your brain can't yeah. interpret the dumb. Yep. Where, yeah, they slow it down so that you can see how stupid it is. Well, and like... And it's funny. If, <laughs> instead of me thinking all the time about, like, how are you alive? There's, like, a thousand people with guns and you're on a bridge that's very, like, exposed... What I should be doing is thinking about, like, oh, how well Titus has done, how well he's ordering people. I would have mm -hmm. to go to Avengers, I think. Uh, first thought is, like, the way they organize that final uh, battle scene, having constant orders being spread to everybody from Cap, and then... It, it, I don't need to go through it. You know how it works. We've talked about it so many times. There's the, the, the approach with every single character having something important to do, something necessary that has an effect on everything, and we recognize by the end of it that they fucking earn that shawarma meal, okay? But th this, Ooh, like, mm -hmm. at the end of this moment is a very much like, we've done it! And I'm just like, what have you done? Fucking just been in slow-mo scenes, just some, with infinite... Mm -hmm. uh, and now Snyder has decided that you've won, but actually yeah. you've, you've not won because the spider tanks that you saw getting dropped down, you haven't dealt with those yet. It's like nope. a they must have seen of the Moomah kill down. thing from Revenge of the, uh, Revenge yeah. of the Sith. From <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, kill, yeah. yeah, you, you think, yeah, there's Moomah kill in Revenge of the Sith. It makes this one really good. Yeah, so they, they they look triumphant, and then and then you get the panning shot through the the mist and the fog of war, and then yes, out come the next bigger, even badder enemies. Yeah, and it's the same here. It's just that none of it's been earned, and it yeah. doesn't look anywhere you know, near um, as good. It reminded me that's of exactly the, the parallel shit. that I thought of. It, um, in because in in Return of the King, it's like the Sauron is using the Haradrim as this other faction who, uh, you know, that that's the explanation for essentially why he didn't use them right at the beginning. That's why they weren't there. Um, whereas in Rebel Moon, it's like well. They have more soldiers who waited for the first wave to die in their entirety, from the looks of it, before sending in the second wave. You know, uh, it yeah, made you yeah. guys think of uh, Lord of the Rings. It made me think of The Mummy Returns when they uh, they defeat the initial wave of the the armies of the Scorpion King, and then 
and then they're like, we did it, and then the the second wave comes around. And I was just thinking about how Money Number Two is not any in any way, but you know, it's some kind of amazing film. But it's just funny how much Rebel Moon, especially Part Two, is just constantly making me think of movies that aren't it. Well, it's it's just an amalgamation of a bunch of uh, d- uh like understood storytelling ideas and 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 tropes and concepts, but all thrown together haplessly. Like, how incompetent is this? It's just like, yeah, slow mo fight, then they won. Oh wait, no, they didn't win because of things that we saw getting dropped earlier in the film. There's no like, it, like they saw them dropping the spider tanks. They must have seen them dropping them. So why did they think that they had won when they hadn't dealt with those? That's stupid. They felt safe, uh, surrounded by a grenade. Now- I was um, <laughs> I was losing it when those spider tanks they start shooting just and it just firing. annihilates yeah. the grain. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I guess we don't care about the grain then, because they're just firing through the fog right into the village where all the grain is. Uh, it's like how those well, defenses see, um, do in Titus. By this point, they'd lost enough soldiers to where they knew that they didn't actually need the grain anymore. Yeah, they were like, <laughs> yeah, we can, we can stand to destroy 10% of the grain, yeah. That would be funny if, if uh, some guy was reporting that. It's like, we could destroy 10%, they do, and it's like, right, can't destroy anymore, then it's like, he shoots that guy in the head. It's like, can we destroy more now? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess also worth mentioning as well, insane plot armor uh, oh, yeah. for Titus. And, oh, yeah. And yep, yep. Oh, Arguably yeah, for everybody now, all now, the time. They stand out of the open when they, the spider tanks start shooting and they just all miss and then they just yeah. go yep. down. And then like, they run okay. out in the open and dive and they all miss. But that brings us yeah. to. But hey, Frankie, time for war crimes. Oh, wait. One this thing... is one of the most. <laughs> One thing before yeah. that, because someone mentioned it in chat, and I did mean to bring it up. Uh, it's been brought up by other people as well. All of it is laser weapons in this, but they have a lot of bolt action and lever action uh, rifles in it. Mm-hmm. It makes no well, fucking sense at all. It's just another <clears throat> person who likes Firefly and didn't understand what Firefly did or why. Yeah. I wondered yeah. whether oh, like, yeah, some is of that. Country- Oh, it's just Firefly is Western. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, Space Western. So let's get Western guns with lasers. Okay, sure. It's so all cringe. right. Bolt yeah, action laser know. rifle. What? <laughs> <laughs> How much of that was just like the villagers being backward? But then I don't think they had any guns because that that was the thing in part one when um when the uh, the old farmer maggot guy gives Cora her pistol back is that like they don't have weapons in their village. So I don't think it's just the villagers using like these old flintlock things. I think it is just like you say, it's just complete inconsistency in how they're borrowing from other things. It's, I, it's just I thought aesthetics. that it was that. I mean, I don't think it makes any sense, but I, I thought that the sort of like lo-fi tech was the villagers' rifles, like the one that you see um, the Giga Chad guy I use before he throws it away to yeah. use his fists. But, yeah. but then, like, why we never had any even a hint that they had anything like that in film one? I I'm don't pretty sure know. Film one actually says explicitly that they don't have weapons, so maybe they just forgot. I mean, hell, if, everyone else forgets. Yeah. Everyone else did. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I guess maybe Zach's relying on people not rewatching part one before watching part two. That brings us to that one does, of the most bizarre yes. scenes that uh, Snyder has ever created. So Cor- basically, Cora's plan was that they tricked, they-, they were to trick the medics on board the ship that they were injured soldiers. And the medics are like, all right, you're wounded. We got you. We're going to take good care of you. They put them on the, uh, the, 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 the bed with wheels. I can't remember what it's called. They wheel yeah, and then they wheel them into the elevator and they say, we're going to do a visual inspection on the elevator. Imagine if they had done one not in the elevator in front of all of the soldiers. But then they're like, yeah, right, we're going to take care of them. We're going to take care of them. Wait a minute. And then she kills them. Cora just yep. kills the medics, unarmed them. medics. This is a war crime. <laughs> like, plain and simple. It is. Like, and I pointed out on Twitter as well. It's like, you're 90 minutes into crime. your film and the protagonist has so far killed an innocent child and some doctors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Like, this, this is crazy. The, it's it's so weird that like you present the Imperium as having these medics who are like, oh, our fellow wounded comrades, we're gonna take good care of right. you, and the hero murders them, like by deceiving them into thinking that they were helping their friends when she's there to kill them and kill everybody aboard. Um, they don't have weapon. Like the, she just killed medics, and she's meant to be the protagonist of the story. What the mm-hmm. hell? And, I didn't um, even do that. There are, there there's are another so many... film. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, there's another another character in a certain film that's pretty different to this one, where a similar thing happens. 
um, the character basically disguises themselves as someone who is badly injured and then, you know, reveals that actually they're fine. I know. And then doing. kills. Yeah. And uh, that character is Hannibal Lecter in The yeah. Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the serial killing person eating monster <laughs> did exactly yeah, the, what he did. There's even a, an exact shot in um, Rebel Moon where she like kind of where they realize, hey, they take the mask off and then they look at her and then her eyes open and she kind of like lifts her head up. And I was like thinking, why are we doing Silence of the Lambs? Because I swear that that, that yeah, shot Zach, there, you remember, I swear that happened. Do you remember who the good guys and bad guys are in that scene, Zach? Because <laughs> uh, the crazy part oh, is as well, anymore. lots of little details. You can make this scene go in multiple ways, right? She could pull out her gun and say, all of you, like, get, get against the wall, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know? But no, that doesn't happen. They look shocked, and then she wraps her leg around one, shoots him, shoots another one, shoots, shoots, shoots. It's just like... Uh, 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 they're all unarmed. <laughs> they're all unarmed <laughs> medics. And the only and the reason they're fighting... Again, it's like like you said, why didn't she just pull out the gun and say, like, don't move? Instead, it's like, no, she just murders them. Well, and why don't it's they insane. have any guards anyway? Because you one, would think... The one that... guy has a gun, but that's the only one, I think. Like you've I don't got... think any of them have guns, do they? No, she, I think she, she, she pulls a she gun off a corpse. One. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. No, wait, it looked like she grabbed it out of her, uh, like she had the gun on her side, on her leg. Well, no, no, they're, she whipped they're, it out of her leg. Yeah, they're just now, she has a gun and then she grabs another one and I think gives it to Guna. Unless she keeps both of them. Yeah, yeah it's sure. definitely yeah. coming out of a holster from one of the medics. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Still war crime. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not least, unusual that a them... medic would have a sidearm. That's just that's perfectly no, fine. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's just it's just crazy that this is what the protagonist has done. She killed a bunch of medics who were trying to help her, but no. she so, deceived them. There's something that I kind of want to highlight here. Um, basically, Cora has wandered out, not in disguise. She does like Guna, Guna keeps the the uniform on. She does not wear a helmet of any kind. Nope. And because no. she decided to not do that whilst being the most wanted criminal or fugitive in the universe, that directly leads to Guna getting killed. Because if she was wearing a disguise, then essentially what we're about to get into would not have gone down the way that it went down, mm -hmm. uh, which would mean mm -hmm. that Admiral Noble would never have been notified that there was a woman in the cold shoveling room. <laughs> <laughs> which would mean that he he then wouldn't have uh, well he wouldn't have taken any action because he would have never known that she was there which means that Guna would have never got shot um so her not wearing a mask gets Guna killed she which is the somewhat main dampens star, the emotional impact we need to see her that face, is true so... that is true right. yeah. it's main character time yeah also right after the scene very weird so they just took the elevator here together disguised and like okay we bet it here and then she tells him okay go back to the ship and keep it running there's another elevator over there you can take to get back to the ship i was like why did he even why did he come up here was the, he just went up and now he goes back to the yeah, ship maybe he should have just said like no nah, I'm, I'm all good guys don't worry about me I'm yeah i'm fine i mean i guess if he'd done that they could have been like right what off, off you go back to the surface it would like, be why funny you if hide I'm... some hide somewhere in the ship like anything it's just i so suppose weird. yeah yeah or he could claim he's doing repairs, right? He'd be like, I know what's wrong with the yeah. ship. Just give me a sec. Well, True. And oh, he, oh, there's it, a problem. He, there's a smoke attached to it. Oops. Yeah, he does actually know what's wrong with the ship, so he could actually pretend to have <laughs> yeah. fixed it. Yeah. So, yeah, he could have done that. Well, that's the thing. Did anyone actually get a look at that ship that when they intended to? Because they would have been like, where's the smoke coming from? It's like, a smoke grenade. Hmm. Yeah, I guess they would have realized, but they just didn't show it, so it didn't happen. Like, yeah. I don't know. Next time we see him, he's just back on the ship, and he's like, oh, we're running out of time. And it's like, what time are you running out of? I don't even know what's happening. Um, you see, as well, uh, in the next scene, yet more of the nature of the tiered defense of the village that is designed so that basically, if you're, like, in the third tier, you have the, a, high, a much, 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 much higher chance of survival. Yeah, than that's the also where they put their... The they're big auto fire lasers, right? All the way yeah, back there. The heaviest weapons. Like, why haven't we been shooting this whole time? Blow up the building. It's like, oh, so we really don't care about the grain anymore. Yeah, this part's no. really funny for like, how's that grain doing, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're across like, oh, the battlefield. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's all <clears> still there. Those bags are strong, okay? They can survive <laughs> this kind of impact. Look at that. <laughs> you know, for a fucking fact, Zach was like, Oh, we should have been doing explosions this whole time. Why weren't we? And some other guy was like, well, well the, the grade? The grade. And Zach's like, what What do you mean, the grade? Oh, grade? oh, no, we'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll make him say that doesn't matter. Uh, give me a sec. Uh, 
Hey, actor who plays goofy Nazi, <laughs> can you play? Can you say that the grade doesn't matter? It's like, yeah, yeah, I can say that. It's like, good. There yeah, we sure. go. Sure. No problem. You got it. Writing. Uh. This is why it's funny to watch, <laughs> though. You kind of want it because they show wood and smoke and soil, but you want to see grain flying everywhere. That would make it more fun. Yeah. But then this is the part where the Hamburglar decides, you know what? Nah, I don't need this big gun. I'm, I'm gonna get them with my dagger. <laughs> yeah. She Even though there's like, well. like a hundred soldiers down there, she could have sniped from, from up here. Well, it's, it's like she gets fired on for a bit, and because um the the wood structures are really good at blocking those uh lasers, which mm -hmm. I. I I don't see that they would if they're lasers, but then she just, yeah, ditches the gun. It's like, I'm going to take him in close quarters with my knife. Yeah, I'm going to go for a What swim. a great idea. Oh, God, so awful. <laughs> I know, right? It's just, yeah, it's pretty painful. <laughs> and now we get to the part where Chorus just gotten into the fucking central computer, like, nervous system of the yeah. ship. Look at how cringe it is. Look at how edgy this computer is. I was going to... Yeah. Is it yeah. sooner or later that it looks at it? <laughs> it looks like right after she activates all the bombs. Them. Yes, yeah. it's before the coal <laughs> bit. Yeah, um, before she kills the coal shoveler guys. <laughs> so sh shall I? Because again, I, like I said, that I looked into this, and there is a, a very, very similar parallel uh, from the lore of Warhammer Forty Thousand. Shall I go for that now? There we go. This was such a moment it, of it like, speaking us all with no context. It was such a like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What? What are we doing? What? It's like, oh, you, I, I, you, you attaching bombs to my face, huh? <laughs> Is that what you do? Stop it! <laughs> I, I I remember I was looking at my other screen while this, while she was doing all the bombs, and then all of a sudden I saw like glowing eyes. I was like, wait a second. Why is it? What? <laughs> I actually missed it when I was first watching it. Someone pointed out on Twitter, I think it was. I said, I, I no, what? Really? That it's a thing. Oh my god, yeah, it is. It's, a, it's what they call the Cromulon from the Cygnus 5 and everything. It's the giant head from Rick and Morty. It's basically that. <laughs> you just kind of expect them to say, show me what you've got. And then she... Does it not have any problem at all with it? her putting bombs on its face? Apparently it's it's happy to have its head exploded. I guess it's, it's, so, uh, yeah, she's familiar with this, you know? She knows what's going on. I guess this is what passes as a, like a security system in here as well. Because, like... You can just walk into this room. It's not even behind a locked door. Nope. This is like the central nervous system of the of the entire ship, and you could just casually walk in there and plant bombs on it. So and then, um, yeah. well, and remember what's just below her as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> if you want to explain the Warhammer thing, I'd be curious yeah. about it. Yeah. So um, basically, first I'll like I'll tell you what the official this is official Rebel Moon canon uh from from the mm -hmm. wiki page and i did check but it's, it's not like fan-made content this is canonical with like the other content the other uh, canonical content with rebel moon um so the kali this thing is called a kali um and it was mentioned once in the film by name which is uh, in the scene where the king is assassinated he says to balasaris like what's going on where's the kali so i guess the the idea is that usually they bless these this, this thing whatever it is uh before they launch the ship so, the Kali are interdimensional beings. When the mother world oh, figured no. out how to capture them, they were, able to, they were able to pull seemingly unlimited energy from them, which they used to power their technology, allowing them to invent machinery with almost mystical capabilities. The Kali are kept in captivity and are kept in a, a perpetual dreamlike state. So, um, uh -huh. that information is not in the film, but that is canonical to what is in the film. So, so if you can create infinite energy, then what do they need the coal for? Yeah, yes, is know, the answer to that. I, I don't know. They get <laughs> yes. cold really like, easily. Well, and also, does that mean she's bombing a prisoner? Yeah, essentially, no, yes. This, this is, yeah. So, um, the parallel between this and Warhammer is the Catan are star gods that are the oldest intelligent creatures that exist in the galaxy. And millions of years prior to, like, the, the 41st millennium, the Catan fought alongside the Necron tier who became the Necrons against the old ones. And after they won, the Necron tier turned against the Catan and contained fragments of the Catan inside shards so as to use them as a weapon. Um, quoting from one of the books, they are now only echoes of their former selves, splinters of energy that survived their Necron servants' ancient betrayal and were, were enslaved in turn. That is virtually one for one the same exact thing. They've taken infinitely powerful star gods made of energy, captured them inside a technology, and used them as a weapon. What can you say? 
I don't. Yeah, so, that's another one to add to the list of things from Warhammer that have just been slapped into this film. And it's usually I don't care about that kind of thing. But as someone who likes Warhammer, it's very, very disappointing to see it in something this bad. I, I refuse to, to believe like, anyone to who can who can capture interdimensional beings is also reliant on grain and coal. It's well, just, I mean, it does say that. Up. Why why would it not run on coal? Like what? Po it, it obviously it, it runs on a combination of nineteenth century technology and enslaved interdimensional energy beings. Like that's <laughs> just, that's just that's just intuitive to me. Like I don't know. You said like <laughs> you have a little sleigh in the snow that's pulled by fucking Cthulhu. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of you, you joke about that, but like you guys mentioned earlier, you've got the the space horses that pull the hover the hoverboard yep. thing that carries the grain. It's just this mishmash of technology that does not it, it doesn't make any fucking sense within the world that it exists in. Why are you doing this, Zach? Who's forcing you to do this? <laughs> well, and and who was forcing him to have uh, Cora jump down and just start killing all of the guys shoveling coal into the engines? Oh my god! They don't even right, get yeah. a chance to like be aware of what's going on. Basically, like a guard's there, she shoots him, he falls down, and then she instantly jumps down and starts firing at them. All they have are shovels. That's oh, all dude, they got. I just want to yeah. mention: I hate the editing on this part. The fact she's placed the bombs and then it just cuts to him halfway through the catwalk, admiring yeah, like, things, uh, and then being like, weird. "Wait a minute!" Something. It's like you would have noticed that straight away. And then it cuts to her being like, wait a minute, I think I can sense something behind me. And then he goes, wait a minute, there's something that's definitely in front of me. Hang on just a second. And then she slowly tears her. I was like, why have you edited this so fucking bloated? Holy shit. Yeah, yeah why does it take this long? Why is it like this? Why, is, why are you like and then this? We, there's <laughs> and the coal. Yeah. Oh, the slow motion. And apparently Ooh. it's very soft coal because she uses it to land yeah, safely. Look, she just kicked that guy in and it's like, all that's happened from this guy's perspective is he was in here shoveling coal and yeah. some woman has jumped down and started killing everybody. After killing and someone else, yeah. Back and then, yeah, and then gets kicked into a furnace to be cooked alive. But I find it... Like, Go on, sorry. Reasonable to suppose that these people are slaves. So we've established that yeah. Mother World yeah. uses slave labor. So mm -hmm. why would it not be using slaves on its ship? So I'm um, going back to the hamburgers back back uh, story. You know, if Cora had come to quote unquote save these people, she just swings in and guns them all down in the name of liberation. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, just, yeah. But even she if they're not slaves, them. even if they're like Cora, basically, uh, well, presumably Cora would know this because she's ex ex uh, Imperium military, but. Whether they're slaves or not, she has essentially decided that everyone who exists, who, who operates under the Imperium, is Satan. Uh, the doctors, the pilots, and these poor buggers who are shoveling coal in a fucking spaceship. All of them must die, so says the woman who used to be one of them. Yep. Yeah, and the, and the only reason that she's defected is not because she actually had some, like, realization that they were evil, but that she doesn't want to get more punished for the crime that she definitely did. Yeah, she was forced but, to defect, basically. She was betrayed by Balisarius. Had that not happened, she would have continued living under the Imperium. She saw no problem with it. it. Yeah, exactly. It's so, like, balked. It's so balked. And she's meant to be, like, the protagonist. It's meant it's to be crazy. a story of redemption. And it, it, it isn't, because the ending, uh, what, third of her story of redemption is um, placing bombs on a semi-sentient star god um, throwing, star god. yeah, and throwing god coal miners god. into into a furnace and killing to doctors. I like that there's still yeah, people like they, they really use shovels to pour coal into the engine for the starship. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this this <laughs> just like yeah. the Titanic. Just imagine the Titanic where you had the guys shoveling coal into the engine. That is what it is. It's so they stupid though that it like it's just nobody will ever believe that that's happened if they don't see it. Like, it's just no, that's just not a thing. Well, Oh, they should have made a deal with the coal mining people. They should have found a coal mining planet and made a deal with them in, in exchange for like machinery that will help them up with, like you know pump the coal in in a more efficient manner, like robots. Uh, which is exactly the deal that they tried to make with the villagers in episode <laughs> in part one. Yeah. Also, ima just imagine the amounts of coal they would need to actually do anything. It's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah it's, it would be a boggles yeah. the mind. And why would they even use coal engines if they've enslaved a, a space god that gives them infinite energy? I don't know. Maybe I, it just gets cold. Maybe he's taking the, the coal. Piss, man. Snyder is like taking the piss. He really is. 
Stop right there, oh, Snyder. <laughs> what are you doing? The storytelling and then, and police. And, you see him and he's holding a bunch of jars of piss. What? And then he says it's Granny's peach tea. Oh, and see, look, oh, no. you, gotta understand. <laughs> you gotta understand when he flips the picture over, you see the devils, the demons come from the sky, the power demons. It's like Paradise Lost. He's such a cringe filmmaker. Like, it's yeah. just. <laughs> Holy crap. Well, we, we've spoken about it before, but he's uh, he's destroyed his reputation with a lot of people now, um, thanks to Rebel Moon 1 and 2. Well, especially if he keeps talking about his extended director's cuts that'll fix everything. Oof. It's getting really, really, really annoying. Oh, but, man, this scene, this scene, like, how does this scene not completely obliterate the movie even more so than before? That, like, there's an officer in the engine room who says... The core is on the ship, and she shoots him in the back as he's on the phone, of course, as you do. And then, uh, and then Noble's like, "Yeah, we don't need the grain. Blow up the village. What the <laughs> yeah. hell?" It... And there's no cameras in their engine room because they're like trying no. to confirm whether or not a thing is happening. It's like that's impossible. It's just like just open up a fucking screen. No, do we not have that kind of technology again? Okay, fine, it's fine. I can't believe that he's just like, "Yeah, we we got to destroy the grain. We we can destroy the grain. It's yeah. fine." What the hell? So, Everything about the way that the battle has played out was predicated on the notion that you needed the grain so much that you mm -hmm. were willing to risk the lives of all of the soldiers on your ship to not destroy it. And yet you're like, oh, we don't need it. So you never needed it. So what the fuck? Why would you come to this village? Why would you come to a tiny little village just to mess with a bunch of people? Why? Like the, the way that it's played just out essentially means that... <laughs> Uh, it essentially means that they they no longer need the grain because they got a bunch of their men killed, which means that their incompetence led to them not needing the very thing that kicked off this story well, to and, begin with. And to be fair, I'm pretty sure that's just something he's saying, because he the, the explicit reason he gives is we have the Scargiver on board now, so we don't need the grain. Like, that's what he says. And then the guy's like, well, wait, if we shoot, we're going to hit our own men. And he's like, yeah, fuck it. Less people to have to feed. Like, like that seems like a, mm. a an additional cope. It doesn't seem like the actual point he's making, which is we only ever wanted the scar giver. It's like, no, you didn't, you liar. That's not at yeah. all what you said. It all put the premise in part one is that the the only reason they needed the grain is because they were here to conduct a long and exhaustive search, hunting down the Rebel Alliance, which they're no longer doing. Now nope. they are just here for Cora, so they never needed the grain. It, the, the, they could have blown it up from the beginning, and they, yep. at the moment. He's talking about, like, I must bring her back alive, but now he's about to flip and say, well, if I say that I killed her in battle, it sounds even better. In which case, you should have just orbitally bombarded them. Yep. Holy straight shit. away. Like, yeah, there's you're no right. reason for any of this. Well, you're right, because yeah, when, if when they go and fight that, each other, he says that. Sorry, if, if they had threatened to do that, and then Titus or fucking uh, Cora said, you'll never do that because you want the grain... You'd just be like, just fire one shot at one building. I assume they have the ability to do that. They don't have, like, the only form is just a massive destruction thing. And then be like, oh, shit, you've called our bluff. They'd be like, yeah, so give us here. And then they do, and then he just says, yeah, now blow it all up, fuck them. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I would ex There's no use of efficiency at all for these fucking idiots. Nope. It's just all dumb. But they look spooky and scary, and they're going to kill a bunch of innocent people, because that's what they do. Or try, but it takes their gun about 15 hours to aim at a stationary village. Because they need to get yeah. a lock on the barn, because the barn <laughs> is moving around really quickly. If only so... they had set that up earlier, just in case they were going to do it. You see as well, he's <laughs> like, I'm going to go get her, and takes a sword. I love that shit, yeah. man. It's just like, take a fucking gun, you moron. Why do you want to have a sword? If she did, she, she happens to pick up a sword as well, right? She's like, going to have their sword fight. It's just like... Well, yep. he, he has both because he uses his gun to shoot gu Gunner slash Guna. Um, yeah, that, oh, that's yeah, what yeah, happens. He does. And, and then the first thing that Korra does in the sword fight is slice his gun in half, so therefore it has to be a sword fight. Good thing he picked up the sword then, thank you. It, well, yeah, because he could have had a second fight. gun though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of assumed that they were going to do a big like generic knockoff lightsaber fight, but then because the ship kind of starts exploding and plummeting toward the ground, there's so much environmental shit going on that there isn't really a sword fight at all. They're all just falling through a ship and hoping that they don't die accidentally. Yeah. And it's it's not even a particularly climactic final battle for that reason. Then we have uh, the Hamburglar's hyper plot armor, where she's in the middle of like a huge warfare scenario and they're just walking around her and failing to see her. She just wouldn't let her die. 
It was sad because I was kind of hoping that she would do a scream and then get blown up or something. It would be pretty funny, but we didn't get that. Yeah, I'm, I am disappointed that we don't have another Hamburglary from the first film. Yeah. Because yeah. we ask for too much sometimes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bunch of very good late refaces in this film, but none of them from her. Mm hmm. And yeah, at this point, it's just there's a bazillions of lasers flying everywhere, and just none of them are hitting our characters because yeah. they're not allowed. He's using his little hatches and stabs people with it, and then nobody's dying, breaks necks, and it's, uh, so, it's just so lame and shit. It's funny to have <laughs> Tarak and, and Habigla have a moment when it's just like, have you two spoken to each other before? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> he I said one. Actually, I don't think I actually want to die, but if we do, let's die together. It's like. Yeah. Sure, let's do that, I guess. It's it's the film is again, it's it's implying that they've had character development and character growth. It's tricking the audience into thinking that they know each other, but they don't. Yeah. This is another Lord of the Rings knockoff. Never thought I'd yeah. die side by side with a whatever the fuck yeah. you are. Um, <laughs> Whoever the fuck you are. <laughs> with a with a, with a hamburger. <laughs> so now we get Jimmy assassinating his character. <laughs> He's here. Pretty much. He's here. And look at the feats that he accomplishes single-handedly and think, man, why didn't you help before, my man? Yeah, yeah it could have wiped out the look entire fucking army if he wanted to. I think uh, Random mentioned it earlier, but like, yeah, he is impervious to small arms fire. Like, yep. he is invincible. Look at him. Look at yeah, him. He's and just tanking those shots. What and is he made that, of? That actually... is plasma that's hitting him. It's just like doing nothing. Mm -hmm. It's actually even worse than, than I thought it was because these guys here are using essentially like laser rifles or plasma rifles. In the first film, he's knocked on his ass because he gets shot with a pistol. Yeah. Mm. So like, he's upgraded I since guess, then. The blood, of elk. Is, uh... <laughs> yeah, the blood of Elk. Yeah, the blood of Elk saved him. Like, look at him. He's super duper strong. He's really fast yeah. and he's invincible. Like, he could have single handedly destroyed this entire army by the looks of it. And then, of course, it raises a question of. Why doesn't the uh, Mother World Imperium, why don't they just have armies of these guys? Like, they'd be unstoppable. In they'd be unbeatable. One, they they explain that they refuse to fight for... anymore because the princess died, and they, yeah, they lost really... their reason to fight, so they don't... But th that does pose the questions of, well, who programmed them to begin with, and why can't they just reprogram mm -hmm. them to fight? And if you can't do that, why yeah, are you still exactly. sending them to foreign planets when they could turn against exactly. you? I, like, none yeah. of the robotics don't <laughs> yeah. make any sense at all. Yeah, like, it, may, it reminded me, and I go into it a little bit on my video for... Uh, I was about to say Rogue One for Rebel Moon. <laughs> um, and I was, I was again, drawing from like Warhammer lore because it was clearly, I think, trying to evoke that kind of thing, like maybe suggesting that they had designed these robots like a millennia ago. And then through some ridiculous event that we never hear about, they lost the ability to actually make more, mm. which is why they can't build any more of these robots. It's why they're so rare. Because in the first film, you have the, the, the rapists are like, oh shit, they left us a Jimmy. Like I, haven't, I never thought I'd see one kind of thing. Um, but the problem is, again, they're basically just kind of implying through it being the Imperium and, and I guess through what we know, what little we know of the setting, that maybe there are some parallels that we can draw there. But none of that is in the film. That's all speculation. Yeah. And I mean, in the absence of that, all we've got is what we see, which is that one of them was able to take out uh, like dozens and dozens of soldiers and destroy a tank and wasn't harmed at all. Mm hmm. This is insane. But again, it's like, why didn't he help earlier? Why did he not help? Also, he has a cape. The previous one. The, the, this, yes. I think it's um, it's Cora's first like big flashback in part one when we see her leading her troops against some defense, well, not defenseless planet, but innocent planet of people that she's going to go and genocide. And you actually see one of the, the Jimmy robots in the background getting shot and falling over and presumably dying. Um, so the rules have just changed. I'm guessing it might be his little antler tiara thing. It's like one of those fantasy games where you pick up a tiara that gives you like plus 50 armor or something, even though it looks mm. like it does nothing well, at all. Like elk blood, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe elk it was blood. elk blood. I really yeah, like I mean. the elk blood idea. Just have him, again, like we said earlier, be like a scene from The Revenant where he's just disemboweling this elk and doing some <laughs> ritualistic nonsense to just, you know, upgrade Level his armor. Up. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so serious question. What do you What do you think Snyder wants us to think about the elk shit, like with the 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 antlers? What I, do you I think, think we're just meant to think about looks it. Cool. I mean, it looks to me a little bit like a crown of thorns, and this is Zack mm. Snyder here. So oh, again, no. we've got we've got nonsensical religious symbolism, mm. and that's that's the end of the sentence. That's the end of the thought. Like, I got the nothing else. Yeah. Right, so, yeah. So maybe maybe Jimmy is meant to be Jesus. It, well. 
I think that makes more Jesus. sense than Noble being Jesus. Um, well, yeah, that would be really weird. <laughs> that'd be, that would be very weird, yeah. I mean, elk, a crowd of elk thorns, uh, antlers on his head. I don't know. I actually don't know. Like, I, if you, if you told me you had to come up with an explanation for what that's meant to mean, I truly do not know what we're supposed to make of it. Other than maybe it's, it is just as simple as he thinks it looks cool to have a robot with like uh, antlers on his head. Maybe you know, it's not. Maybe he really. was. He went into the wilderness on uh, on Velt, and he lived with the elk for a, for a little while. Well, um, and he them. learned. Yeah, he then learned their ways, and then like his elk papa, like because he could speak to them because he's a robot and he has like you know C three PO translator kind of thing, and he like really bonded with the elk, and then something bad happened and they got eaten by like a tiger or a wolf or something so then he like kind of took their horns and made a hat to remember ah, that that's another possibility memory. yeah maybe it doesn't it doesn't really you know it's, that's not character depth it's just a thing that may it's why he has the horns but maybe we'll get that in the extended version anyway we got a fight <laughs> scene another one Oh, Where you wow. have like fucking seven dudes waiting for her to come out of the elevator. Mm. She kicks one and all of them stumble. They yeah. all go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. I think the last one doesn't actually stumble. He just walks backwards slowly. I'm pretty sure. He's he trying to leave the like, scene. He was like, ugh. He's like, I want to get out of here. Uh, this shit sucks. We covered this on Real BBC. This part, all of them just walk into her and get killed. Yep. Like, they don't even, they don't even look like they're that actually That was in the trailer. People. Yeah. That was in the trailer. It's like, uh, fucking bad. None of them aiming to shoot, they all just die. And then this guy, uh, he's he's there's just no way he could lose this. And uh, she manages to jump in such a way that he doesn't like when you have a lightsaber against someone who's got nothing except their fists, you've won. Yeah, it's over, but of course, she wins. And yeah, it does mm -hmm. come across to me like she's surprised that it's so hot, and then she tries to pick it up, and she's like, Oh wow, that's still hot, damn. Yeah, like, and I just yeah. feel like it's like shouldn't yeah, should know that, but I think I mean the fact that she appears to be an expert swordsman with these, like she knows how to use one and fight off noble, then she must know that that's how they work. I just had a really painful realization, and it's actually hurting my brain. I have a feeling that they wrote this scene and then made the decision to have her remove her helmet and armor because if she was wearing the helmet and armor, she would have been able to use the sword normally, right? Yeah. But she could so have they... just grabbed the glove of the guy she just killed, right? Yeah, that's yeah, that's also yeah, true, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you understand, but instead Cora she just is retarded. Gets some... Ben is just, hey, oh my god, he's retarded. Just gets some bandages and just wraps those around. Apparently that's enough. Uh, yeah. Also, um, mm -hmm. very shitty copy again of uh, Star Wars. The Death Star laser is lining up with our... Unfortunately, mm -hmm. very uh, defenseless now village because grain doesn't count for shit suddenly. Unbelievable. Um, Damn it. And you're like, oh god, but what's what's like the what's the effort to destroy it? It's like, well, she's put bombs on the thing. And you're like, oh okay, but like, does she have to activate them or does she have to get to a safe distance or like, what's the? Oh no, will we make it? And it's like, no, it's on a timer. It's it's it is funny when you line it up like that. The ticking clock is well, her ticking clock is moving faster than that one, so it's all good. It's like, oh, that's yeah, that's it. What you fucked like, it why up? Why would that How do you be fuck the that way up? That you set it up. JJ no. Abrams fucks this up. Like he knows what the whole is. point of the ticking clock is that there is an action that is required right now at this very moment to stop the bad thing from happening. Not we well, already set the chain. Like it's already you've already won. Like she's already won. The timer yeah. will beat the uh the. The um the weapon. That's so weird. Why would he do that? It's like he doesn't know how it works. He's seen it before, but he doesn't get it. So when but I like... watched this the first time, I, I think I again just kind of assumed that the film was telling me something that it actually explicitly is not. I thought that she was placing the bombs on the imprisoned star god. Um because that thing was powering the dreadnought's weapon systems, not its engine, and that therefore when they try and fire on the village. Um, the energy surge will cause it to explode. That is what I thought happened, that, but that's not what happened. I, kind of, I thought that might have been the case, but I quickly dismissed it. I was like, no, it was a timer, I think. Yeah, yeah it is a timer. It's, it's yeah, explicitly yeah. a timer. Yeah. I don't know why they would have that. Very strange. Very bizarre. Like, again, ticking clock is a pretty fucking common 
storytelling trope it's weird to like God, that shitty explosion sorry yeah <laughs> no, it's, it's, she was it's, close it's so by the bad. way if she was just like two seconds later she might actually have not two made it later, they lost. yes yeah so that's a crazy coincidence that saves the day wow insane crazy and then of course like, the uh, um... the king's gaze crashing not on the village had it done that it would have been so much funnier but that would have been yep. hilarious yeah. like, this whole time though um uh admiral what's her uh, name's noble has been standing in the shuttle bay waiting for her to get here and generic farmer man has also been in the shuttle bay just completely apparently unaware that the main bad guy is in the same room as him because oh, if yeah. he spotted that he could have just shot him at any time and didn't because then the film wouldn't work yeah and noble right. didn't check the ship and didn't didn't kill guna like either of them should should yep. have known the only way that works is if noble walks into the hangar and just doesn't say a fucking word to well, the to guy be that he's with. With you, He should be saying, hey, you in the ship, at the very least, come with us. Which actually would have made for a more interesting payoff, wouldn't it? Like you, If he was in disguise, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the disguise to the advantage in terms of being there when she arrived. And then he shot the other guy. You know, just stuff like that, but whatever. Because it looks well, like even they, they show it so that Guna recognizes what's happening as it's happening. He's not like, he should know well ahead of time. Like, it, it, I would have thought a relatively natural way of doing this is that you go in and you find that uh, evil Nazi guy has, has taken farmer guy hostage and uses him as bait and said, like, you know, join me or come back willingly or I will kill your boyfriend. But that's not hard to do. It's fairly simple. It, it's it's an option he could have to try and bring Cora back alive. And then you could have farmer guy sacrifice himself to save her. And then there's the fight. Also, of uh, course, rather he, than also, just... he shoots the subordinate and not the main Nazi man first. Say, you know? isn't, yep. it, isn't it a strange bit, though, that you have Noble come down with, like, a guy to back him up, and then he just dies before the fight even happens. He gets yeah. shot in the back. He's, he's isn't literally a, a Noble's uh, one man, you know, like a plus... It, yeah. It's life. his ablative armor. Yeah. <laughs> he's, just, he's just he's a mushroom for him. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. So well, weird. They, they realize that Guno would would need to realize what's yeah. happening at some point and that he has a gun and that therefore he's going to make a shot. So rather than have him just miss because he's bad with guns, even though he is bad with guns, they decided to give uh, to have to have a uh, noble come here with some guy whose purpose is to just get shot. It's not so his lame. method of solving problems in his stories is really funny because he would rather like once the idea it, like exists on paper, it's like he refuses to change it. And he'll just try to find, like, the easiest answer to keep it the way that it is, mm -hmm. but doesn't realize that it creates a whole slew of new problems. It's just because he wants this one-on-one -on -one sword fight and Guna to have been mortally wounded. That's Which, it. Uh, so they can have this fight while they're sliding down the ship. Was it you or, or Gary uh, who brought up, like, it just immediately evokes the end of Deadpool? It's like, yeah, another fucking movie you copy. It's yeah, the same actor yeah, as well. Right. It's, um, it's, it's funny because they fought on a helicarrier that uh, ended up getting destroyed yeah, and yeah. sliding. So they had a fight while they were sliding down. It's like, oh, Man. and then the same actor in this movie is sliding down this ship having a sword fight, except it's way worse uh, because, like, it's it's just like, look at all of the debris. Look at all of the things that should be hitting them. Look at how dangerous oh, this yeah. is. What, yet they what is it to say about this? This fight is so fucking stupid. They, it's yeah. it's well beyond. It is it is one hundred and ten percent a Zack Snyder sequence where everything is fucking insane nonsense. They they're fighting with, and it's like they're totally not lightsabers. And it's just like, can you stop, please? Well, yeah, yeah. this did begin as a pitch for what he thought would be a mature Star Wars, which is hilarious. <laughs> It's so Isn't funny to so me funny? that that's he thinks Rebel Moon is Star Wars, but mature. That is mature, so funny. Yeah. Like Star Wars is more mature than Rebel Moon. I, I want like, Tony Gilroy's I, I'm opinion I'm of Rebel Moon. <laughs> I'm not even talking about Andor. Like the original trilogy is more mature than this in terms of like meaningful subject matter. Yeah, yeah. I think the prequels are more mature than this. Yeah, I think so. It says on the cover of the novelizations for mature readers. Oh God. Like, no, no, I, pretty sure it I, isn't. I. Isn't it crazy that, like, he's he's nearly 60 years old, but yet, like, he is just a teenager in terms of the, his yeah. attitude for storytelling? It hasn't well, I mean, changed at all. If he was making good movies, then it'd be like, yeah, cool, make good movies in that style. But th he mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. Well, he's gotten worse. I think there's no getting around that. Like, the oh, worst films that he's made sure. are the most recent things that he's done. Yeah. yeah. Army of the Dead, these two movies, the Snyder Cut. These are like the worst things that he's made. <laughs> well, uh, except, 
Man of Steel and, and Sucker Punch sit, sort of sitting there in the middle, just like being like, oh, wow, okay. But even yeah. then. Snyder himself, though, Rebel Moon is, is as popular as Barbie. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I remember finding that about he said. It. Oh, silly. Zed. Yeah. Why don't you walk everybody through his rationale for that? The actual quote is, you think about Netflix where you push a button, Rebel <laughs> Moon, say right now it's 90 million views, 80 or 90 million accounts turned it on, he said of Rebel Moon on Netflix. And they assume, if you assume, two viewers per screen. So if you double the number that they actually give you, then it gives you 160 million people. And if you assume they all pay $10 for a movie ticket, it's $1.6 billion. And that's basically more than Saw Barbie. That's what his... level sure, of that's movie how you can do you have to have to, to believe that your movie that nobody was talking about was more successful than the most successful film of last year? What level of delusional do you have to be to say that with a straight face? Yeah. Uh... I haven't talked about is it Sophie Sophia Butella. I forget. Yep. Um, yeah. Sophia Butella. Yep. I find it to be not fantastic. Uh, this would be one of the moments that really stood out to me is her mortally wounded love sliding down the crashing ship. Just looking. And, and look at her face yeah. afterwards. She's like, mm, well, oh, <laughs> well, that just happened. <laughs> She is not great. <laughs> um, it was it was awkward. It was like, oh, maybe it was really awkward when Nemesis Lady, with the pretty small amount of screen time that yeah. she has, imbues her character with way more emotion through her performance uh, than this lady does for having all of the screen time. In her defense, though, how do you react to this shit? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you don't even know what much yeah, going what on. What was the uh, direction here? What was oh, oh yeah, she, uh, she you totally are dies here. Yeah, uh, Charm. He, Charm he, oh yeah, we're ball. we're crashing He's at floods. almost free fall momentum, and then he like throws her during that, and she goes. Look at the way she slams into the um the bottom of the ship. It just looks like it's like that's dead. Yeah, you don't yeah, get like uh, GG. if you that's land. Let's say on the on your side, I'd still be like, that's got to be major. But look where she lands. This is possibly the worst. It's like on her spine. You don't need your spine. In or space. rather, her <laughs> neck. Like the bottom of her yeah. neck specifically is where all the force goes. Yeah. I feel that's like you uh, might be dead from that, actually. Yeah, that's over. That's, um, you're done. You're finished. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> look at still this screech. <laughs> 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 There, there is a fantastic face that he makes in a sec, oh, which I'm sure you'll pause on. So it's so good. Faces. So many good faces. You've got to go frame by frame here. Yeah. <laughs> and when it. you, because in in the film, if you watch it in real time, it it uh, Zach, uh, thankfully he he slow mo's on the ridiculous face. It is so good. He wants us to relish in it. I will wait. I'll be right back. Sorry, I got to sort something out. But you guys continue uh, to discuss. Well, we could, I mean, it's uh, well, maybe to to. to... <laughs> They are currently in the Dreadnought, who is falling down rapidly to the ground, but not fast mm -hmm. enough for them to be in danger while they're fighting here. The, 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 it's all very conveniently timed uh, well, in, I mean, in, in the way how physics work for them. Because this is falling down, because in a second they're also going to go ahead and get into a ship and then still fly out, and I don't think this is going to... I don't think this is, this this checks out. Well, remember though, all. you have to add on. Not only do they get on a ship and fly out, but like the the, the ship has to like drag its bottom mm -hmm. along the surface of the interior of the ship and smash through like debris and go through <laughs> explosions to get out. And like it crashes, but they shouldn't have been able to get out anyway. Like we saw a bunch of other ships flying out that seemingly weren't. I don't even know how it because we get like these big wide shots that show a bunch of other fighters and like they're getting out. I don't know how they're all getting out when the ship is vertical. How are all those soldiers getting on those? That was the those, thing that uh, hit me. Things? Yeah, like, it's, like we've it's, seen it falling, we've seen it vertical. That previous scene when they are all sliding down, most of the shit you see falling down in flames around them is presumably drop ships and fighters because they right. were in the hangar. So how on earth is are all the ships still fine and how is it, how do people get there? And how do they fly off? Like, none of that makes any sense. Pretty sure everyone's well, and dead. It's a little bit weird as well that they fly off but seemingly don't really do much of anything for the next, you know, five or so minutes. They're, like, flying around, but they're not strafing on the village. No. Uh, they're all just, like, hanging out, I guess, chilling out just by the distance, like, all right, let's catch our breath here and then go and blow them up, I guess. I suppose that's all we can conclude from that, because I don't know why they weren't firing on the village. 
Also, do you like how the sword lands in a place where it can be used again instead of being oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, why doesn't it melt through the floor? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Why is would it, you do that? Well, I'm thinking of, I think it's, is it the robot chicken gag where he drops his lightsaber and it just falls through the Death Star? <laughs> Is that and Rick and Morty did it as well, right? Yeah. Oh, that that might be what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Oh wait, they didn't do it, but it was the um, it was the uh, corridor digital one with the longest lightsaber where they like put it in the ground and it kept. But that one sat on the surface, so it's not quite. The same. If it's on, if it's lodged in the ground behind you, why would you not pick it up and instead he wants to choke go her and out. choke her? He's deranged. He's insane. But That's yeah. why. And also, Crazy if you've got person. super strength, as we've established, you do. How is she not already dead? I don't. Because she's really back. well trained. He wants she... her to look at him. Yep. He wants Ooh. to. He wants to do his like Gooby face while <laughs> strangling her. I want you to look at me. I think he might have been hired for the face, right? It's just such a like mm. you can do some <laughs> evil expressions, can't you? He's like, Bleh. A smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess he was like, I'm going to put it all in for this because it's my last scene. Well, maybe. Who knows? Oh god, yeah, he's gonna get resurrected in part three. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. Sorry, we need your face. Maybe they'll maybe they'll do an avatar too and have him get resurrected in the body of a peasant. <laughs> <laughs> he's so into it. <laughs> you, you know what this is? He's like, How did this happen? How did I lose everything to you stupid grain farmers? How is this? <laughs> well also I don't he even knows like grain. <laughs> He knows that Guna is there. He he knows that, right? Well, well, there's that, mm -hmm. and um, isn't it kind of interesting? Because we brought this up earlier. Does he like have a personal hatred for her for having killed the princess and the royal family? No, I don't think he does. It, but I think I think we're meant to conclude that like all of that is ultimately secondary to ambition. Yeah, he just wants to be like the cool the one guy that got her. Yeah. He yeah, wants a place at the at the table or uh, whatever it was, or whatever it's called, council or something. Yeah. Council More or something than that, like even that. like it's very like strongly applied in, in part one that he's very much like a, a creature of Belisarius because when he goes there's the, when he goes down to the planet that's ruled by Squidward and like they're all happy and that they're pacifists um, and just before he clubs his face in uh, he he talks about why they called the ship the King's Gaze. Um, and it's really confusing and it makes very little sense, but from what I recall, the argument is, uh, we call it the king's gaze after the king because the king's compassion weakened him and that made him die, so we remind ourselves of that by calling our ship the king's gaze, which is obviously fucking nonsensical. But the, the impression you get is that this is not a person who particularly laments the decline of the old royal family, rather he's quite happy that the pacifists have lost. Well, yeah, they don't seem to. They could have, <laughs> if, if they wanted to do it in a different way, then they could have potentially had uh, Noble have been like, essentially like a religious zealot, where he was completely dedicated to the to the king, and that's why he does what he does. But it, like you say, it's not that he's he seems to be completely dedicated to Belisarius, um, and his only reason for being this sort of intensely driven to catch a, to catch Cora has nothing to do with the fact that he hates her, which makes this. Uh, yeah, his behavior in some of these scenes a little bit odd. Well, that's what makes him confusing. Is like I, I, I don't. I feel like it's actually like hard to pin down exactly what his motivation is, other than that he really like he he finds the idea of the scar giver really cool because it's edgy and he wants to get her. There's that, but it does seem like otherwise in terms of his attitude and perspective on uh the mother world or whether or not it's a good influence or anything is way more like of either secondary or no importance at all and confusing. But it's it's weird, right? How can you have four and a half hours of storytelling where you like really don't have a good sense of 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 like the basic core motivations of uh like the main uh player in the in the universe other than well they like war because they they're evil. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, well, it's just as I already said before, it's because it's all the Character building is just implied. It's just like, yeah, mm -hmm. this is this happens. Promise. Anyway, moving like, on. Dreadnought. That is that is also just a hair away from pretend it's what you want and you'll like it. Oh, just yeah. pretend, Classic. pretend that we actually did develop these characters, and just make it up in your head. And yeah, it's pretty. You know, it's all right. 
there are filmmakers who uh, benefit from stuff like that where it's just like i won't say what the thing is so they can all come up with it and fight over it that'll be better for me but i don't know with zach i feel like he's like i, I did thoroughly thoroughly characterize these people what do you mean yeah did you go for a wee during the backstory scene <laughs> There's another um, little Zack Snyder quote, if you want it, which I, it really fits, just not in the way that I think he intends. Zack Snyder added, it's a different model. You give the audience an alternative. Like, what is Rebel Moon? That's a new IP, right? No one knows what the fuck that is. Some space thing, I guess. Well, let's watch it. The barrier for entry is so low that it allows a lot more original and weirdo stuff to exist. I think that kind of explains a lot of what's happened. It's like that there is no barrier to entry and we get whatever the fuck this is as a result and he's not actually aspiring to anything at this point it's just they gave him the money to do it and so he did it and he doesn't care by the way when she chops off his head it says head clatters <laughs> head clatters <laughs> it's a bit strange also considering how viciously this thing is currently going down the dreadnoughts they they have like a pretty chill ride just sitting there oh yeah chopping his head off it's just they're just hanging out have our uh, Return of the King moment of like, oh no, the heroes that saved us ultimately, they may not make it. How tragic. <laughs> and then they just fly out of there in their own ship because that makes total sense. Yeah. <laughs> Do, how could you even list all of the incredible variables that would have prevented them from doing this? Like, It's, it's just so difficult at this point. It's not even... They just get into a it's, ship and fly it's... out of the ship. It's fine. Yeah. <sighs> Another happy landing. Well, something I noticed uh, in, in during the thing uh, when they start flying these ships doesn't matter if it's her or the the the, the imperium guys they always have their fucking hatch open in the back like probably yeah. like three or four times i don't know what's up with that this is just a weird thing i noticed it's like a bad idea especially if you're going to crash by the way <laughs> she's not wearing a seatbelt and he's Gunner just lying just on the on floor, the floor. <laughs> do you like this one random house she just crashes through on the way yeah because there yeah, zach was like what if we put a house there <laughs> wait why would yeah. that house still be there sure that was I right where the know. imperium soldiers I, uh, were landing <laughs> Do you wonder if he's still a bit ass mad about all the criticism of Man of Steel and this was, he's like, finally, I can have wanted destruction in here and nobody can complain because it's not super bad. Also, Gunnar is just, just, Gunnar is just lying in the back of this ship right yeah. now. He just got he no, just locked around, knocked around. I, was, I will say, down. at least he oh, dies, yeah. so. <laughs> yes, he does, that's true. But he should have, he should, like, she should have gotten out of the seat and said, Good, are you okay? And his brain is spilling out onto the floor. Yeah, it's like, oh. <laughs> that's what like. I mean, I mean no, he's well, well, they have their emotion scene where they say, I am emotional. I thought, well, what I will say is, going to burn, man. Cora says, why can't I have this one thing? It's like, wow, that's a <laughs> selfish thing to say about somebody who's losing his life right now. Um, He's like, like I, I, had uh, a, yeah. I had an existence before you, but it's okay. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. fine. Also, again, I don't want to belabor the point, but the only reason why Guna is dying is because Cora did not wear her disguise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. pretty much. So it's kind of her fault, really. Yes. <laughs> There's a couple Good of things she could have done better, let's be honest. But yeah. yeah, I love that the fight is essentially over, and then the rebels are like, "We're here to save you." Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I, lo I started so laughing when I was having. <laughs> I was looking like, "Wait, who are these guys? Is more Imperium?" Like, no, it's the rebels. They just shoot all the dropships. The villagers did all the work, and yep. they come up to just clean up afterward. It's <laughs> like, and you insanity. know, you know that all of these uh, pilots are going to be like, "Yes, we won the war of uh, Rebel Moon," or the fuck this is going to be known as. Like we we did it. The villagers helped. <laughs> they, they... Like, did they did they not give uh, the Hamburglar the fucking walkie-talkie, like a space walkie-talkie? It's like, hey, we're on the way, by the way. Can you start the fight like in about ten minutes? Because then we're there, and it's gonna be super easy. Well, just, well so... imagine if they showed up ten minutes later. The uh, the Imperium, the remaining ones, would have just strafed on the village and killed everybody. Oh, yeah. that's what, that would have been so great. Would have been cool, but. It's... So it's been it's been a couple of months since I've seen Rebel Moon Part One, so I don't know Platoon if you remember exactly how this goes. But from memory, the scene where um where they try and recruit the Blood Axes doesn't go according to plan because uh, Devra Blood Axe, which is the one that pops up here, is basically like, "No, we can't do this. I'm going to mm. hang back." And then Darian Blood Axe is like, "Well, fuck it. I'm going to go. I'm going to take a Hamburglar and like six other guys." 
Um, yep. Which essentially means that Devra Bloodex changed her mind and came here anyway, but arrived, you know, just in time. Why she changed her mind, I, I, I don't know. But I, I guess think it was because she said that like her brother died. So, on, but how did she know that? Or... How did she know that? I don't know how or she knows I'm any of it. Yeah. She said something about a cyborg um, to do with the funeral, which is funny because when she said that, it was like, man, you, you, the villagers should be furious with you. Like they did all of the hard work. Mm -hmm. They risked their lives for you to show up right at the end and then claim credit and pretend that you actually cared about them. Like that's insane. <laughs> oh, this is another funny screamy face right here. We're about yeah. to get it. What the tightest one? Yeah, this one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, is like, is, uh, this is another thing out of the like fringe screenwriting handbook. Have characters scream. That's cool. They've been through so much. <laughs> that old have goober in the back. <laughs> have them randomly yeah. yell in the battle and then have them yell at the end. And then cry because Gouda dies. Gouda's gone. Oh, no. He's Gouda a goner. His soul has gone up to heaven. <laughs> Poor Gouda. <laughs> Look There's not him. many funnier versions of his name. It's already funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, such a stupid movie. I thought the funeral narration scene as well. Like when they all start talking this really grand, highfalutin language about honoring their fallen, and then old farmer guy steps up, and his thoughts immediately return to grain. So that all, well, we have to remember our dead friends, and he's like, "Yes, and the next harvest will remember them again." <laughs> you, you guys really are fucking obsessed, aren't you? But this is also where she, uh, Cora, confesses to everyone what they apparently already knew, which is that she murdered the princess. Well, Titus knew, well, right? Titus, but... well, Titus, Titus definitely knew, already knew. None of them did. Titus, uh, yeah, is, no, we knew that, but and I feel like the there should be a serious like you d you killed a kid, oh, <laughs> you <laughs> shot a little girl. <laughs> Right, so you did that. Blood? They're after you for that, and you're hiding out here. And you, you got all of us killed. You, you are the reason you all of this just happened. Yeah, you did this to us. I mean, how, why, how could know, you? I, I, think, I think the film wants to pretend that most of the villagers survived. They did not. Most no. of them are dead. Most are dead. And nobody like, cries for Modoc. Nobody cries for anybody, which is like, it's, it all contributes to the feeling like none of these characters are acting like human beings. Whereas, like, the authentic emotion in response to what it- like, you won, sure, but so many in your village died. How come they're all just standing there? How come nobody's like breaking down into tears or, or like really distraught or angry? Um, they all just sort of stand there like emotionless robots. They're like, oh, so that, we're a bit- we're a bit sad, but we're okay. You should be a lot more upset. There is oh, yeah, one mention of Modok in this film, and mm -hmm. only one. It's kind of surprising yeah. that there is only one, because he was the, like, village leader. Um, which is when the villagers are like, it's either when they're going out with Tarak or, or uh, Titus. Titus, Titus. Yes. the one who he says, for, for, for all the things you love, for Sindri. It's like, but you never met him. How do you know what he's yeah. called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep his name out of <laughs> your mouth, all right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we were talking about this when we were watching it at the time, but it's so funny they do the whole like, I am choosing to join you in your fight. Me too. Me too. The, the robot. <laughs> the robot's just like I'm programmed to. So yeah, I have to. I, have <laughs> I don't yeah. even have a choice. <laughs> like, it's like, such a weird thing to do. The arc with the robot is that he makes the choice to help. Not well. I got no choice. I I have to. I'm a slave to my programming. It's weird. It's, I oh, I want to talk God. to Zach about stuff like that because be like, I, you get the basic writing meaning of characters being like, I'm gonna come with you. It's like, oh yeah, nothing impressive, but you know, normal. And then just one character announcing, uh, I don't get to do anything meaningful here because it's just what I'm supposed to do. Like it's like Zach, that's right. just worse. Like that's just not something you want to put well, in. I mean, it, it's not exactly subtle. This ending, basically, the whole purpose of this ending is the pitch for the next movie. It's their yep. quest to yeah. go out back into the galaxy. Well, of course, you the know, final this... Rebel Moon movie will be defeating Balisarius and the Imperium, right, and and bringing freedom to the uh, world. Final of... of the six Rebel Moon films, yeah. <sighs> and then they go back to the moon and do more grains. <laughs> Peaceful grain farmers. It's... Dude, when they well, says, like, the princess is actually still alive, I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> What's the score? 
Nobody cares at all. And so, uh, yeah, we got it confirmed. He, uh, it wasn't a fluke with the first one. He's just awful. It's just mm -hmm. horrible. Except unlike with Army of the Dead, this one has like actually people have noticed. Yeah, even really like even like reviewer outlets dead. are saying this is just a, oh, this yeah, is terrible. Threads. Yeah, what does this have on Rotten there. Tomatoes? Like a ten? Oh, like fourteen percent or something. Yeah, and the the Metacritic score for Part Two is thirty six, which is very oh. low. I feel like you rarely see films get that. It's red on Metacritic. That's how low it's it is. red. It is red. Uh, how many how many positive reviews does it have on Metacritic? Uh, one. It's got one, and it's a six point seven. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, it's so, very bad. And you know what? Like for all the references we made to other things, it's not just that he has no original ideas. It's more so that he can't render them into something meaningful. Like, because I don't mind. No, Taking inspiration, this this great stuff we get out of stuff like that all the time in all the different places. But he just doesn't know what works about anything that he's seen. But he wants to be like it. Uh, yeah. And this feels like kind of the it's it's almost like um, critical mass, right? Of 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 like the Snyder approach to storytelling of just sort of grabbing a bunch of things that you've seen before that you like, like you said that he doesn't understand. Throwing them together in the biggest, loudest, slowest way no, possible. No, not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it I mean, it and, takes. Yeah. It pretty much takes everything that was complete piss about part one and dials it up to eleven. No. Uh, yeah, kind of. It's like with the with the first one, it's pretty dull and tedious for sure, and really stupid as well. But it's like set up right. This is like all of the payoffs, and the payoffs are garbage. Hmm. And now, you know, the story is complete. As much as they're teasing, like, that there'll be, you know, more. We'll see about that. But when, this story is complete, and it's like, wow, what a what a waste of time that was. If Rebel yeah. Moon 3 ever gets made, now it's in serious trouble, because the IP is just known to be absolute dog shit. But also, all the stuff he's established to have his stories in the first two are just going to get in the way of him in the third part now. <laughs> Everything to do with the operations I mean, like, of every faction, their energy, their weapons, their interests, their motivations. Like, he's going to forget all of it and do something else again. He's just going to be like, I don't know, this is fucking happening now. Yeah, so he can't. Well, you say... Like, there's no way he has the patience to stick with any of the ideas that he's come up oh. with. Like, he doesn't even have enough patience to do it in within the films themselves. I was going to say, you say you say the factions. <laughs> there's, there's two. Yeah, it's the rebels and the mother world. And one of yeah, one of them is like a galaxy spanning, infinitely powerful superpower, intergalactic superpower. The uh, other one is like me. a we couple have a of hundred rebel people. moon team now. Oh, yeah, they're part man. of the rebels, though, right? No, is that no, not right? The rebel so lady joined factions. the rebel moon team. The rebel team is a different team. All right, you gosh, you got you, it's like you're not even paying attention. These films are wonderful in the way that they <laughs> weave teams, and I think we should respect that. Yeah, I guess you got the robot as his own faction, kind of. Mm -hmm. The yeah. robot faction. Yeah. Look, you got the princess. Oh, that's, that's definitely something he's gonna do at some point. It's gonna be like a like an army of robots, and they're gonna in come in like the ghosts in and Lord of the Rings. Oh my god! Actually, motion. yeah, that's gonna be a plot point in a later the film because what what happened with this robot is he decided to fight and demonstrated that he was capable of fighting after essentially being told that the princess was alive, or you know, in his programming, he need, he found someone that he needed to protect. So. They're going to go and find a bunch of robots and use the fact that the princess isn't actually dead to recruit the robots. Yes. And the Imperium will not have any defenses because the robots are gods. Godly robots. What did, uh, what did Snyder say about the, the... What was this thing that he said about, like, if you don't support my films, you get, like, Marvel stuff? Pretty much. Oh, it's just it? focus groups. Focus groups. What a what a what a terrible defense of your own work, you know? Yeah. It's like, hey, look, you don't right. support me, things don't will be like... even worse. <laughs> um, but I mean, I don't know. I'd I'd rather watch Quantumania than this. I never want to watch this again. No. I, I might um... watch Quantumania again for the memes. <laughs> <laughs> Modok. He's just uh, uh, something we were saying about this. Funnily enough, we still ended up with like a near five-hour stream. But I thought like this was, <laughs> it's so easy to just talk about this film because everything is so surface level. There's just nothing to dig into. No. So bad yep. on its face. And there's well, just no difficulty with anybody power. recognizing it. This is this is the least controversial film ever. Like it's just terrible. Yeah, this is awful. 
So and who? Uh, yeah, transparent. Who would? Now that we're at the end, who would you guys say is the best character? I mean, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to concede it's Nemesis. Would agree with you that it was Nemesis. Yeah, yeah probably. Probably the only one with anything going on a little uh, bit. <laughs> I suppose I have a question though. Is this the worst film that he's made? Oh yes, definitely. It's between this in, and in my Army view, of the absolutely. Dead. Yeah, Army of the Dead yeah, was really um, bad. This is worse than one. Mm -hmm. And I remember I felt that it was really competitive between one and Army the, of the Dead. The thing is, Army of the Dead is visually appalling, like even more than this. It is. That's definitely going to drag it down. Yeah, because quite the a bit script yeah. is all also just fucking terrible in Army of the Dead. Oh as well. yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's between these two for sure. Um, I could see like, this one winning. Yeah. I could. I just. Uh, it's been yeah. long enough that I haven't seen Army of the Dead, so I can't make a you know a confident And I claim. will not rewatch it. You know what's coming to mind is that oh. moment where a paratrooper just drops himself into a bunch of zombies. Uh, just like, what the in fuck? Slow motion. <laughs> in slow, slow motion. motion. Oh god. Yeah, that's pretty stupid. This, this is probably this is certainly like the only film I think which absolutely does literally make me sick. <laughs> in that I did watch it yesterday. I did get mega flu yesterday. I woke up feeling better. And now we've gone through it, and I feel really ill again. So oh, it no. must be the film. I, I think it might actually be Zack Snyder's Rebel Mooniverse. Is I'm allergic to it. Well, you might not make happening. it until tomorrow. What's interesting is the <laughs> most ill I've been after watching a film is Army of the Dead. I had a severe <laughs> headache after seeing it, and I'm almost certain it's because he fucked up my eyes when I was watching it. Not nice, Zachary. <laughs> Which is, yeah, that's quite an accomplishment in and of itself. But I mean, I mean, surely, surely this is the end of of like just getting an ungodly amount of money to make this. I mean, How can they justify making more of these films? Oh yeah, and as people just point out, these are two Anthony Hopkins movies. Like, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, he's barely in <laughs> it at him. all and doesn't do anything. Like, what? Uh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, I forget if we said earlier, but Zach wants this to kind of launch like a multimedia franchise, kind of like what happened with Star Wars. Um, so, you know, video games, comics, animations. Oh, yeah, it's going to die. It's um, going to die so it's hard. not happening. It, yeah. yeah. Well, they did the same with Army of the Dead as well. That was meant to, because yeah. there was like a prequel movie that's meant to be like an animated series. I like it. This is, this reminds me a lot, this kind of attitude of, um, you know how like a lot of the live service games, like the early live service games would declare themselves, we're a 10 year game. That's what we are. We're a 10 year game. It's not. Like, you don't get to decide whether that's going to be the case. Mm. The audience decides whether yeah. or not your game is going to be a 10-year game. And in much the same way, you don't get to decide that your series, like, that your thing is going to be a franchise. That gets decided based on oh, yes. uh, interest in what you made. You certainly don't get to be so brazen that you, when you get a two-part film already, which is already like, god yeah. damn, really? A two-part film, uh, like, two films... Um, and then also director's cuts as well, that you also get to have a trilogy of two-part films and video games and like an animated it. series or a comic. You don't it's get to decide that. It's all part of the confidence trick. Like this, is, this is sort of, I think, what Snyder does quite deliberately as a strategy is that he weighs in very, very heavily with these, these grand ambitions and he, all of these things which you know, producers or funders or investors might look at and say, oh, yeah, that sounds like it's a great idea. This guy has such confidence in what he's going to do that he's already, you know, given us this entire multimedia franchise. And same thing with the Snyder Cut. You know, they've got this huge fan base clamoring for the release of this extended cut. The fact that three quarters of them are robots is neither here nor there. So, he, like, I think this is part of the sales pitch. He, he actually sold it on the basis that this was going to be Star Wars in scope, not just Star Wars as a, a cheap knockoff of something that and was popular. Netflix would, and yeah, Netflix, Netflix would being, yeah, Netflix, Netflix was dumb and said, yeah, that sounds great to us, we'll do it. But, you know, if the first Star Wars film came out and was as shit as Rebel Moon Part 1, it would never have been a franchise. No, but that was back in the era when they weren't trying to brute force franchises. It was, you made something yep. cool and people liked it enough and there was cause mm. to continue with uh, the series that you did it compared to this era where we're in now, where, like, they want to aggressively create franchises, not realizing that all of the franchises of today began as just, like, one film that was really cool. You know, Alien was just a really cool film. The Terminator was a really cool film. Star Wars was a really cool film. They weren't ordained by the studios themselves they to be franchises. They weren't 10-year gay uh, movies. <laughs> no, that's right. So, they speaking of uh, things being brute-forced, uh, someone told me, I can't remember who, 
that according to Zach, the um, Army of the Dead takes place within the same universe yes. as Rebel Moon. Yes. Oh, yes. did he say um, that? Well, see, uh, well, I couldn't find the quote. I haven't looked for the quote, but yeah, if apparently yeah, yeah, that's yeah, something yeah. that that's, he said. He's, that's been known for a while. Too. It's uh, something of a marketing ploy to be like that those two are connected when obviously they have absolutely nothing to do with each other in terms of era or meaning in any way, shape, or form. It's just it's just a arbitrary, like, they're my universe, I said so. Um... The nature of Rebel Moon being a um, original, quote unquote, sci-fi as well is always frustrating. People are like, you want these, but you won't support them. And it's like, of course I won't fucking support this. Like, why would I support this? <laughs> it's just not even close to what we're looking for. It's just, um, God, we just gotta advocate. Like, like people need to get better at writing fucking scripts. This is abysmal. We've like reset. How do we get this bad? So much Actually, money. This is this is crazy to have spent this much money on something of this low quality that really is not of interest to many people. It's uh, it's 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 really been like a strange thing to watch. Where um, it's like in the lead up to Rebel Moon, there was some degree of hype for it because again, Army of the Dead just didn't have any impact on people's perception of him as a filmmaker. Uh, and it was being pitched as like, ah, yeah, this is him striking out on his own after DC, creating a brand new universe. Came out, people fucking hated it. Uh, got torn to shreds. And now, and now it's in a place where it's like, oh, the second part's come out. And the most that people have to talk about is all of the really embarrassing things that he's been saying in interviews about his film and, and like director's yeah, cuts and about making the... a director's cut for a film that came out 12 years ago that nobody cares about. Well, and even about DC, anything he says now about like his interest in superheroes or his opinion, it's like, shut the fuck up. Poor Snyder fans, yeah. which I never thought I'd say, having to just watch <laughs> their god fail over and over and over and over yeah, and over. Yeah, because now it's like... in a place where instead of kind of being these weights around DC's neck that made it impossible for them to essentially make the decision they needed to do, which was reset hard and try it again. Now it's in a place where, like, everybody is so ready to just have it start over again. Well, um... And they're not interested in hearing any more about how, you know, Justice League Part 2 was actually going to have it be that Wonder Woman was a Kryptonian or something. Well, the, the Rebel Moon Part 1 and Part 2 have done more damage to Snyder's, like, cult than anything else could have. It's made them feel which is like... Funny kind of just yeah. passionless about his work which is what it would do well, yeah. I, mean, I don't what, know what? how you defend this movie I, I, I almost want to kind of try an exercise where I try my best to actually come up with defenses for this movie because I don't I can't even comprehend how you do it it is, it is so bad in every conceivable way I think um, the, the, the thing that I would want to focus in more on which I think is, is, is the most important thing in terms of ensuring that something um, thrives uh, as a as a creation is what is it about this that people would want to talk about positively and with passion? What is it about Rebel Moon that would inspire anybody to just like you know come out and say like oh yeah th this was a thing that was really cool and let me explain why this was cool for this reason this reason this reason and this reason and to almost like do it with um a degree of spontaneity in the same way that people will just casually refer to out moments from star wars that are really memorable and cool uh or moments in marvel movies not the cringe ones but i mean even then people still could do it for things like multiverse of madness you know they'd be like well that shot was cool oh that was cool this performance was really good e even in like a really really bad film like that they, they could still like latch onto certain things but like, what is there in this that would inspire anybody to be interested in talking about it instead of just watching it and ne never thinking about it again? I've seen uh, accounts that get posted every once in a while on Discord and stuff that Snyder fans being like, ignore the hate. This film is like, just, it's fucking amazing and it's being loved yeah. and it's getting engaged with. And, you know, <laughs> Rebel Moon is a phenomenon. It's like, no, it's okay. Not. You that can say like that as much as you want, but like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> People have got his mask on, he's crying, and yeah. he's got that opium in, in his lungs, but it ain't working. No, this fits like just like a jumbled mess I of just... everything that he's ever seen in any movies. And it's like, I'm going to put this here and here and here. Yeah, but it's like, why are you putting this here? Uh, shut up, well, look, it's slow-mo. It reminds like, me okay. a bit of uh, Sucker Punch in the sense that that was also a film that, uh, with a thin contextualization, just had him throwing in, like, pretty random uh, visuals and, like, uh, iconography, right? Where he'd, like, jump between, oh, look, they're, like, fighting robots with swords and 
Oh, that's like mm. kind of a steampunk World War One thing going on. Or look, they're fighting a dragon. It's it's, it's kind of like just when he does something original. The last time he did that, it was just yeah, throwing a whole bunch of stuff into a yeah. blender. And this feels like that taken to an extreme because this is in a place where like nobody was willing to say no. This is like what happens when nobody is willing to say maybe that's not a good idea. Instead, he's given all the money and all the resources he could need, and nobody pushing back against any of his ideas. Then they're like, this is what you get. Yeah. Get what it's, you it's, fucking it's, deserve. It's an embarrassing movie. Like, it's, it is embarrassing. Um, it's, it's like crazy levels of incompetence. It's one of these movies, you, you just watch it, and then you just stop once in a while, just pause it, and you're like, holy, f what, am I, what is happening? Yeah. Like, it is, is crazy this happened. It is absolutely nuts. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, this just feels like the product of a really sort of strange internet phenomenon that happened you know it's it's like this is what was downstream from it was yeah um, this is the, a, the a, symptom of hype this huge problem that never should have happened <laughs> but i mean can netflix even afford to like spend this much money on like i that that red notice film that was successful for them wasn't it the the one with dwayne johnson and, yeah, and ryan i don't Reynolds. know why because i mean like, netflix no are semi-famous for burning mm. money on projects i think this is just gonna yeah. be another one where they like like i said my assumption now is that they'll have renegotiations with Zack snyder in a couple of weeks or whatever and they'll be like this is unacceptable dude no one cares about this what have you made us I just, how can how can this money just get thrown around so Flippantly, though, for, like, films that have no cultural impact, it's it's really weird. But at the same time, it's like, well, I guess did they, they must have considered those films successful. But, I mean, this can't be. Like, how much money did they spend on this? It was like $160 million, right, for both parts together? That's insane. Yeah, that's <laughs> stupid. Yeah, I mean, we, we can't know, really, how successful um, part one was. And I guess we aren't yet going to know how successful part two is. But... The fact is, um, what's it called? Army of the Dead must have been successful enough. Well, it I say was. successful enough. It, yeah, it must have. It must have been extremely successful for them to be like, okay, Zach, here's 160 million dollars. Do your thing. Apparently, um, Army of the Dead got 75 million like uh, streaming views or whatever. That's the problem. Is like when you don't have just clear box office numbers, it gets annoying. Box yeah. office numbers. Are like I a feel really like we can all metric. reasonably agree on what we like. That's the best way because we have no actual useful numbers to get from them. Like, what was the? Because we can be honest about like we all recognize. I don't know if everyone here didn't like Bobby, but we can all recognize how fucking crazy successful that was. Even if we didn't have box office numbers, we can like see yeah. how much of an impact it had. And how many people yeah, saw it? About it. Uh, similarly, Army of the Dead, it's like it didn't even happen. It's crazy. It had like a couple yeah. of mentions here and there, but like it just disappeared. And so many people don't know about it who like Snyder's work. They're like, oh, yeah, I didn't see it's that one yet. Weird. It's like, you didn't see well, it? Just bearing in mind that the Snyder cut was less successful than Godzilla vs. Kong. It was less successful than Mortal Kombat. Those apparently did better on uh, HBO Max. It's like, man... How how what what are the numbers that they were looking at that made them think that this was a good idea? And it's like I guess it was just that apparently a lot of people saw Army of the Dead even if nobody was talking about it. But like um, you know we don't know how much the first movie got. This one has to be less. Well, it's it's this one will be break down like further. I mean I'm looking at some of the figures for it now, and so like the Rebel Moon Part One got 20, well whatever this means twenty three point nine million views in its first week i think that was um and then it, it adds another 34 million across the second week as well the problem with this like unlike you know with with cinema traditional box office where people have paid for a ticket you don't know how many of these people are clicking on it watching five minutes thinking this is boring and, and then, dumb yeah. and turning yeah. it off again mm -hmm. um from netflix's perspective i mean if Zack snyder has successfully convinced them and, and maybe it's not a complete lie that he has a really dedicated core audience then subscriber retention is also an important thing as, as long alongside sort of subscriber growth if he can reliably get lots of very silly people to go and watch his films um then that's doing its job but like i i was netflix spent something like is it seven billion i think on originals last year alone and I'm trying to name, like, off the top of my head, another Netflix original which has actually got the same name recognition as Rebel Moon does, which might be one of the reasons that they did sign up for a, a part two and a part three and four, five and six, mm -hmm. is that 
it's by comparison for all its shit it's actually still quite recognizable largely because it's shit but still recognizable well and because it's Zack like snyder it's it's rather than banking on whoever it was in in that uh, movie you guys mentioned a minute ago ryan reynolds and Rendo was it the rock wait what was it called yeah red, red notice it was yeah. called red notice yeah red notice, that, yeah and that was Ryan Reynolds and The Rock, or am I thinking Rock. of a different? Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot. Yeah. yeah, so so that Awful. is that is a movie that is being sold. I've not seen it, but it's being sold on the fact that it's The Rock and Ryan Reynolds. Rebel Moon is being sold on the fact that it's Zack Snyder. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, that is not anywhere near as well, recognizable. It's, a it's draining. Uh, like the that that star power is just fucking bleeding out all over the place. Yeah. Same for Rebel Moon as an IP. It's done. Like nobody's going to take this shit seriously anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there might have been a number of people who watched part one because it's like, well, we don't know anything about it. This is this is really being presented as the first thing he's done since DC. Let's take a look. And given the response to that film, I got to imagine that very a lot fewer people were willing to give the second one a shot. I mean, why would they? <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> the first one. No one will have watched two without having watched one, and the people who watched one and thought it was shit for the most part, unless you, well, unless you're people like us, I guess, <laughs> are not, are not, yeah. not going to watch part two. Part one is so, so unnecessary, uh, though. Like, you don't even need to see it now. Part two has got that stupid opening monologue. If you have a friend who says, yeah, they're just going to come and attack this village and this is our team. That's it. You pretty much... But I mean, again, that's like that's kind of like skipping to like the final hour of Seven Samurai. Well, the thing about it is, the reason you can skip the first one is because there's just so much bloat. There's no, it's not like watching the first one makes the second one that much more meaningful. In fact, it makes it less meaningful or like more con contradictory. It's not like a normal film where True, seeing the stuff yeah. that comes before is important. It's it's more so just like you're not missing out on anything. It's just as bad, if not worse. So it's like just just watch the second one. In fact, don't I, watch either of them. <laughs> you know, go watch anything else. As, yeah. I love that as a tagline for Rebel Moon. It's not like a normal film. You're not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's, normal. Looking at this by, by way of comparison, for, this is again for, for part one. So part one gets, gets those 23.9 million views in its first week. Um, that's actually ninth place of Netflix originals that year, I think. It's half the number got by something called Murder Mystery 2. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Also, okay. something, something uh, called The Sandler Mother. <clears throat> Okay, well, he somehow gets views. Uh, beaten by The Mother, Extraction 2, Leave the World Behind, Heart of Stone, You People, The Killer, Your Place, or Mine, and it's just shortly above The Pale Blue Iron, Out The Outlaws. I've, I've only even heard of some of those. So it's not actually that good by the standards of a Netflix original. It's just sort of solidly average. This is Rebel Moon Part 1 you're talking about there. Yeah. If, um, if they continue... That's pretty this, amazing. If we get, like, six... Actually, six Rebel Moon movies, it's just like, the oh bottom will fall out at some point, and... Uh, th 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 this is bad. This is just bad news for Zack. Not only is it a, a piece of art that he's released into the world, but financially speaking, for uh, everyone involved, this, this couldn't have been a good decision. It's just... It's inevitable that consequences will come for him. Oh, oh yeah, 100%. There's, there's, you, can't, you can't keep making films this bad that cost this much money forever. No. At some point... It has to stop. <laughs> you have to stop. At some point, that. Reason, you can't keep reason. getting away with it. Well, kind of. Yeah, mm. it's uh, it's an insane uh, waste of resources that could have been used to create other films. Yeah. You know how many how many films could Netflix have made that you know who knows how I mean surely they would have ended up being better than this with the amount of money that they uh they spent on this. I mean, roll the dice, and it's got to be better than this. Well, yeah, I'd rather watch the Adam Sandler movies are probably better, and they're probably yeah. better investments. I, I like I I don't know. I feel like streaming has made it way more confusing, like the nature of what it means, because it, it is crazy that like that film Red Notice was apparently the most successful film in Netflix ever, and it's like I feel like I've never heard anybody mention it. I did a forge like, on ever. it, one of the first ones I did. 
Well, I, uh, other than like the initial coverage for these, yeah, three, yeah. Other than Metal I'll Commander, be... it hasn't been mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> He's the only Metal, person Metal, on the that only or... person to talk about the most popular film apparently on Netflix yeah. in its entire. Well, it's like you know, Glass Onion. That was Netflix. It's like, well, obviously that was successful. We know why. It's because it got talked about a lot. Ugh, there was a lot of conversation on, yeah. about it. It obviously managed to be successful. Whereas here, well, like, the only thing people are talking about with Rebel Moon are the cringe things that Snyder said in interviews. I'd say in the case of Glass Onion, there's a couple of other things that it arguably has going for it that this doesn't. Um, because you've got, I guess, the Ryan Johnson factor. Like, Ryan Johnson does have people, you know, he's kind of like a Zack Snyder in that he has people who will just watch the stuff that he does because they like his films. Um, so he's got a little bit of, I guess, star power there. Um, mm -hmm. You've also got that it's coming off of whatever the first one, Knives Out, which um, was like a lot of people liked that movie. Um, so, you know, the part two, it's going to have a built-in audience, unlike Rebel Moon part two. Um, and, uh, Glass Onion has a lot of, like, big name actors in it. Yes. Uh, which Rebel Moon does not. Well, like, it, I mean, it has some, but not, not on the same level, I wouldn't and, say. And a huge fuck up from Zach that Ryan Johnson nailed was make sure at least several characters at several points in your movie say everything is supposed to be retarded. <laughs> then yeah, your fans know what the line is and they know how to defend the movie we're the third one of those on on the horizon don't we do we oh yeah i think so yeah oh god no stop it <laughs> coming. everyone loves them fantastic yeah. at least i mean those are those are i say those i i don't hate knives out but um i do whatever whatever the other one is <laughs> <laughs> fair enough <laughs> Um, what's the second one called? Glass Onion is Glass, bad yeah. in a totally different way to like Rebel Moon, I would say. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we um, we were happy to rate uh, Glass Onion as one of the worst it. films ever. Well, it's it's funny, but we we've talked about it, and I feel like we've been asked before. It's like, oh, which you know, if, if it was just like a hypothetical movie, let's say it's not like a film that exists, but the next movie that the filmmaker makes, which one would you rather watch? Slash, which one do you think would be better between Ryan Johnson and Snyder? And I feel like we usually default on Ryan Johnson because, yeah. like, at the very least, maybe he'll like stumble. It, like, they're they're different kinds of um bad storytellers. Um, yeah, like an idea it, done badly like, is uh, usually what you get with Ryan, but with Zach, it's edgy teenage it's like copycatting done an horribly. Idea at all. Exactly. Yeah, I'd go with Ryan Johnson as well because Ryan Johnson can direct a good scene and he can oh, arguably yeah, write a good Ryan scene. Ryan Johnson is uh, he's got an eye, which at this point I think it's safe to say Snyder really doesn't. Or, or if he did, he's lost it because his films have gotten uglier yeah. uh, as time's gone yeah. on. It's really weird. 300 with this weird nice camera thingies. In there. Yeah, whatever this obsession is with this weird lens. Like at least a Ryan Johnson film is probably going to look really good at the very least. But you do have to deal with the uh, unbearableness of like something like Glass Onion, which yeah, that might be one of. The... Oh, don't remind me of that film. That oh. image, by the way, of the uh, trapped god they've got. Its arms are like in little holding things. It's it's kneeling down. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And Cora's just like, sorry, got to blow you up. They just sorry put this. Face. It's like one of these things, oh, oh, this looks cool, let's just put this in here without thinking about what this means for the world building and what is happening. Yep. Yeah, so again, just to... my ass, he wouldn't even thought about this. Like, oh, this looks cool, let's put this here. And then also there's coal below it. And just, oh, God, this is so fucking dumb, dude. So, yeah, just to be clear for anyone in chat who, who missed this earlier or for anyone in chat who hasn't seen the film, all of the stuff that we're kind of mentioning about this thing being like an imprisoned... Uh, intergalactic energy god type thing that isn't actually in the film that requires no. external references but that is canonical in the rebel moon universe no, well any just... anything else you guys want to say about rebel moon part two the scar giver i think it made me sick too i don't know i'm just <laughs> tired <laughs> i'm oh, tired and sick me. leave me alone <laughs> I'm happy I don't need to look at this movie again for at least a while. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe number three and four and five and six is going to come out, and then we're going to watch them all in a row, and then we just jump off a bridge or something. I mean, maybe it's a blessing that um, Rebel Moon and um, Army of the Dead weren't released on the big screen, because that would have just hurt people's eyes even more. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was, it was a public service sort of health yeah. matter. You Netflix, know? Netflix gave Zack Snyder $160 million to keep him out of the cinemas. 
We need to save the people. <laughs> like we got to we got to release this on as small a screen as possible. Yeah, preferably watch it on your phone, not even on your monitor. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, awful films. Stay the fuck away. Good luck yeah. with the extended yeah, versions. Don't watch it. It's not worth it. Um. Well, the people have been. <laughs> Just looking at chat. Don't celebrate yet, Modal. You still have to watch Fallout. I'm not gonna watch Fallout. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess that gets us close to wrapping up. But before we go, Ooh. random film talk. What do you? Where Hello. do people find you? What are you up to these days? Are you making a video on the Scar Giver? I absolutely am. I've got two other videos that I've actually put on hold because of the Scar Giver, mm -hmm. but I kind of, I was able to predict it, so it hasn't really interrupted anything, whereas the first Rebel Moon definitely interrupted things. Um, yeah, so I think, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that my channel's linked in the description. Yes, it is. Yay, so click that if you like listening to me talk about stuff, I guess. Um, I'm doing a video on this um, abortion that we just watched. Um, and I also spent the last week working on, uh, I finally watched Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Um, and I, I, I felt things and I hate it. <gasps> so I'm making a surprise video on that, which is going to come after um, Rebel Moon Part 2. I don't because know, that film but, um, is just... EFAP famously were uh, hyper-controversial on that one because we thought it was utter dog shit. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I hate it. I, I despise it. Um, in particular, when you compare it to Fallout, which I basically, I completely agree with you guys. Fallout is fantastic. Yeah, I don't um, know what happened, unfortunately. <laughs> I have no idea. Nosedive. Um, and then after that, I'm currently two-thirds of the way through my Arcane series, which is a rather lengthy, in-depth praise of Arcane, nice. but also looking at certain bits of it that, because like obviously there are problems with it, mm -hmm. um, and working out how much of a problem those bits are. So... The most recent video on my channel is Arcane Part 2, which is a four and a half hour, uh, I guess, deep dive into Act 2 of Arcane. So if you want to listen to that, then it's on my channel. Gorgeous. Very cool. Well, um, appreciate you. Chad, he means, he means your... Fallout for, for, for Mission yeah, Impossible. Yeah, he means Fallout, the previous Mission Impossible film, not Fallout the show. <laughs> Why would he compare oh. Mission Impossible Sorry, Dead yes. Reckoning Part 1 to Fallout the TV show? <laughs> that would be yeah, I've, I've seen some confusion <laughs> in chat, so I, I thought I'd clarify. <laughs> yes, thank you for clarifying. I didn't even consider that. Yeah. Mm. What happens when you watch too much of a Zack Snyder film? It just makes you dumb. Everything melts. Yeah. Um, Little Platoon, how about you? What are you up to? Uh, things and stuff. Um, so, in theory, as soon as I get over whatever this flu thing is, yes, Rebel Moon script, but it's part one and part two all together. And I, I have trolled my own editor for the part one thing, because I've said, I got to the same Mantis's introduction, I said, I want you to now go and find me all of Mantis's subsequent dialogue scenes and put them back to back, not telling him that there aren't any of those. So he's now going to actually have to watch the film. Um, and only to be incredibly disappointed. So I, I haven't. Yeah, once my voice is better, I'll be recording the part two version of that. The June video is also still in progress. Velma two is out this week, and oh, just as God. a bit of light-hearted distraction. Oh, God. Don't remind um, people. They I might take me. a quick look at that one, but uh, we, uh, yeah, whether it will be covered, I don't know. But um, otherwise, yes, other there probably are other things. I've just forgotten what they are. Well, I mean, uh, sounds exciting. Anyway, we've got plenty on the way. Metal, what about you, sir? Well, I'm not doing anything more with this rebel dog shit. Um, th that was wow. more than I expected to do with it anyway. But uh, yeah, no, uh, tomorrow, Metal's Forge, we're going to be talking about uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. We, uh, obviously, Mark is uh, co-hosting now for anybody who doesn't know that yet. He's he's there every Sunday with me. There's going to be, there's Forges now every Sunday again. That That's that's canon now. That's canon. Mm. Um. Yeah, we're going to be talking about that, uh, about uh, the, 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 the gameplay and uh, the whole uh, microtransaction stuff that's been happening and the performance issues in the beginning, all that good stuff. It's going to be fun, 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 fun. Uh, obviously, Stella Blade is around the corner. I'm going to be streaming that when that's out. When that's out. Well, I'm going to stream it the weekend after because I'm actually not there when it releases. I'm not at home, Damn. which is sad for me. But I have three days off still when I'm back, so... Probably going to be some long strums uh, going on with that. 
Uh, and I'm getting very close to start editing the video I've been working on. I just have a little bit of audio stuff to do, and then I'm going to do visual things and stuff. So, yeah, doing all kinds of things. Things are happening, coming your way. Uh, that's 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 happening, yeah. Go go check it out. Go sub subscribe and hit the bell or whatever you do. I don't know. Beautiful. Uh -huh. Links to everyone's channels, including Nerdrotic, in the description, who uh, joined us there for the... First half of the adventure. Um, Bringy, anything you want to mention in any way, shape, or form? Uh, no, you know the deal. Just, just working. That's it. On the old uh, halos that will oh, be halo, reaching you yeah. guys' eyes soon enough. We've just had a couple of bumps mm -hmm. in the road in terms of how things are releasing. As you may know, everyone, uh, I was, or you may or may not know, I've been collecting some info, some clarifications, some stuff, some things here and there on uh, a certain Fallout show, and people are like, oh, because next week will be the Fallout EFAP episode? No, I don't plan to do anything with uh, with EFAP on the Fallout series. That's all I really need to say about that, though I will mention the plushie is still absolutely 100% available. My new one, the, the Cthulhu one. If you're interested, of course, you can then pick up the real BBC set. You get a little discount with that if you're interested. Um, oh yeah, you know, stuff is on the way. Plenty of things that you may or may not enjoy. Who knows? But hopefully this was fun for you because it was, it was mm. taxing to, to watch the film and to talk about it. But we do it for you guys, okay? We do it to entertain you. As will yeah, we yeah. be doing with everyone's future projects, as you could hear. So, um, yeah, you can find this on Makeship. I'll uh, I'll put a link in the re-upload so that you can actually get to it <laughs> instead of just seeing it <laughs> and being unable. Um, but, I mean, yeah, thank you all so much for watching. We shall catch you in the future, but for now, goodbye. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye. See you around. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.